Good morning viewers, uh, just about to start a full day of broadcasting. I have two cameras with me, so we should be able to juggle the battery drain okay. We're at the uh, London Conference for Climate Change, uh, Science and Geoethics at Conway Hall. Uh, this is going on today and tomorrow, uh, September the 8th and the 9th. I don't know if you can see what's on that screen. I might just actually zoom into the screen to stop the contrast problems when things are being presented. Uh, the room is fairly dark and uh, I, don't, I can't see what's on that screen at all on my monitor. So, um, so I might have to uh, zoom in a little bit. So the conference will be starting soon, so please spread the word. My dear friends, it is 10 to 9, and we start. Uh, well, come to the meeting. It's a real pleasure to have you all here. Thank you for coming. London Conference on Climate Change and Science in the Here and up under the name of New Dawn of Truth, because this is coined by our friend um, Christopher Monta, but it's very clever New Dawn of Truth, because I think most of us think that it's necessary to have a dawn of truth. Climate change, science, and geoethics. Back to science. Those guys wrote this. The problem is not the human invention in the climate, it's improper political invention in climate science. And I think most of us agree with We are scientists. We have a lot of hard stuff, material in our brains and in our hands, or whatever. And that is proper science, and that is, must be the thing we form uh, theories and proposals and claims in daily life. It's not the opposite way around. Has not decided. That's what we are trying to discuss. The first two days we will have hard facts. You have to accept it. It's hard facts, but it's coming. The last open discussion. Then we will discuss it, and in that I really call for respect, because then we have to have respect for opinions, because opinions may differ. That, that's why our geoethics, I suspect that the suitable learned community of geoethics, that's what we are supposed to represent, will enhance the needed global effort of sustained human existence now. So it is also larger parts involved in, in, in what we what happens now. Yeah. Uh, the first program, you see, it, it's quite dense. This is natural drivers and climate occurrence. This is what we are talking about today. Different subjects and these are the very excellent what this one? The those the channels. And uh, topic after topic, and then we. Uh, uh, sorry. Then uh, we end with a general discussion, and we will also come to threats and decide versus something which is not so real. That was the first day. The second day. No, that was not the second day. That is the second day. We went to, to the temperature plots. Plot. And there's a plot in the double E, and it's mm. consequence. <laughs> it's a very strong day also. So we're ending here with um, some very very fine talks, and then we have the open discussion. The open discussion which really is open, and uh, we should go through it. But of course here we have the difference between the claim model and the observed model and observed that's that's the problem when they don't fit. And we 
we have uh, also in the volume of, uh, of extended abstract uh, page or a part of common, uh, commentary notes. And they are very important contribution. You have this wonderful Easter Easterbrook going through all the things and add it all the way through and coming down to uh, even the possible Texas proposal. We will come to that at the end of the discussion. So we uh, proceed. We, are, we have a dense program, very dense program, to progress successfully built up. It was built up here, and we had one hour or more, and we lost it, so it became a bit problematic. But here we are. But of course, the speaker must keep the time. After 18 meters, the rope is cut. <coughs> the chef person must watch the time. We have an uh, egg boiler here, which is supposed to keep the time. Uh, question and comment must be to the point. But remember, we are here to discuss. It means that it's not just questions. Normally we say there must be questions. I, I question that. Because here we are allowed to have comments. Okay? Because we are in a game of some sort of sport. But this is intellectual sport. Okay. Uh, Time's so up. Time's up. <laughs> yeah, don't abide by the rule. And then, up to now, that has changed, I hope, through the morning. But up to now, we had all these people have contributed by donations or free registration fees or whatever, you want, plus possible additions to them. So we will we'll reverse, we will we'll update it uh, later. Those are only private scientist persons. It's not a company. Victoria C. Brook, you should remember this. All are very just personal. You cannot say that it's some hidden agenda behind it. Just good persons. Thank you very much for all the contribution because that's what have made it possible. So this meeting is your meeting. Thank you. Um, we have something which I call downstream as a mainstream. It's a follow the flow and of course contains a lot of garbage and dead fishes. Upstream is have to flow against it, it means bigger um, courage and especially knowledge in sciences, knowledge, you need to know what you're talking about. It is true that all the papers presented it will give an uh, upstream is here. And of course, this is where we call ourselves climate realists, certainly not climate deniers, it's only back in room which calls it deniers. This is a terrible term. All speakers will give their papers as uh, subject specialists. There's no hidden agenda in the organization. That's important. At the general of this game, we have a much more open debate. However, <coughs> okay. Where should I put it off? Okay. Well, something else. So, um, the conference is organized by the Independent Committee on Geoethics. And uh, uh, I have worked as secretary for all these things. Those who think that I, uh, uh, someone may have been found out in the Red Square Garden, it's not the case. I'm a scientist, I have worked very much. 51 uh, countries, I have this many. And read lots of books, and I was certainly a true and van I had my members. Oh, I should, where should I put it? <laughs> so, and all these speakers, they are excellent people. Just listen to them. You will understand what facts and facts and models are something completely different. The show is on. Thank you. Gentlemen, you're all very welcome to the opening session of the conference. Before we begin that, 
just to say many thanks to Nicholas Murner, who has organized this whole conference pretty much single-handed because I was ill. Can we give him a very warm round of applause? The first session this morning on today's theme, which is the influence of the sun and the major planets on the Earth's climate, uh, will be, in fact, Neil Saxon Warner himself. Uh, he is going to do an introduction to planetary, solar, terrestrial interactions. So we're going to wire him up with the microphone again. And this time I should be rather more severe with him on his timekeeping. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I forget that I was the first speaker. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, I will give a rapid introduction to terrestrial uh, planetary solar terrestrial interaction. We have two books out in the lobby where, uh, for inspection, which, which are covering this subject. And then uh, you have some here. Solar wind goes back to many years when I worked with it. Ah, and that is uh, the idea. So planetary deep on the sun and out comes luminosity and solar wind and it affects the double planet, <coughs> the Earth and the, uh, the Moon and the, the two together. Of course you can look on what is going on in the sun as a black box, but whatever you do, that's why dynamo, the tidal dynamo or neutral ripple, they need a motor. And I think this lies in the center wheel motions, which I will visit in the next picture. If this is the sun's center and this is the sun's surface and this is the taco climb, and this place, the sun, the center of the sun, moves with the sector with respect to the barycenter, even up to 2.169 of the radius. So all the barycenters of the various planets, they are located here. And what they will be doing under this run is they will be jumping around here and out at the surface. And that is really the eccentric wheel motions. So it will be a constant moving around it. It's as simple as in the kitchen uh, when you have a, uh, um, the working machine. It's the one that turns around and, and it's, and it's something that it makes the thing change. So we have to remember this is very, very simple. I think it plays a, an important role. This diagram goes very far back in time, it's 84. Planetary motion on the Sun and the Earth and the earth moon distance, this distance here, out comes luminosity and solar wind goes in <coughs> and affect weather and climate. But here I have built up this much, much more. It was a long time ago. But it's interesting that such a long time ago, uh, picture can still be valid. So here it's solar variability. Planetary beta course on the solar, on the planet, and on the Earth moon scene. But it, the, here it generates luminosity and solar wind. Solar wind is very, very important for the planet and for the Earth moon system, and all these variables here. And out comes certain things affecting the terrestrial climate. So this way is exceptionally important from my point of view. Um, but it's important that the planet will be close to the sun, also the earth moon system. So here, if we see something in the earth, this is temperature and climate, it can be the luminosity. But if we see magnetically these things, it has to go. It's obvious that it has to go by solar wind action. And also the same with earth moon system. No, no times, earth rotation also. It's very, yes, important in the 60 years cycle and the other cycle. And uh, our friend Nicolas Capetta has a wonderful paper on, on, on um, uh, the two, uh, 2400 cyclicity, which is also going inside. It's interesting that Paris Strandberg concludes that the Enso 
is also in this business. Uh, the 60 years cycle is interesting from all these points and when it goes for the geomagnetics and so on, it comes via the solar wind, it has to. But Hansen, in the book out in the uh, in display, he showed that the North Atlantic Circle is very much in the loner type. Hence, we can be absolutely sure that it's this system which is operating. In the Enzo event, it is a far, it's very, very interesting that the uh, length of the day, Lod, the solid earth lost, lost here when this bubble of of strong water from here started to move in the wrong direction. Certainly the higher sea level and when they hit the American coast <coughs> a year later, yeah, at the same time, Lod was transferred back. So something is there and we will hear much more about it by uh, Sunday. So the main thing is really variation. It's, it's the irradiation. Everybody has been speaking about that, so the problem that that we have the solar wind which affects the magnetic shielding and that affects th this and the picture which I showed before, all this complication and it goes to time. And of course the cloud formation, even the production of uh, C14 and beryllium. But of course, watch, watch out because something like uh, C14, it is both by the shielding, uh, the geodynamo, and by the ocean mixing. So it has three different driving functions. And not until we have sort of sorted it out, we know uh, this is to say real solar signal. And this is back to this diagram, which we are going down here. And this ocean circulation, which I have been driving very much, and you have this in, in CV means uh, co uh, <coughs> conference body. And uh, you have this uh, wind, and that is called the sea or the jet stream, also, in, uh, which is, and uh, is, uh, of course, Svensson, and the general idea of This is the, unfortunately, it's very out of shape, but it is uh, Pierce, Pierce Corbin's very, very excellent diagram, which is very close to what I say, the jet stream and the, how it went. And, those things generate CO2 variations. Wow! And it's certainly not the wrong, not this way. So this is very much what we are discussing. This way, not that way. This is geology, geophysics, physics. This one is logics. It has nothing to do with this is a mistake. Uh, this is a diagram by a uh, man who uh, had uh, uh, flooding and droughts. I will just have it for <coughs> one thing. Because if you look at it, this is the recovery after the little ice age. Here is very full and right. For the rest, it's just stable. No changes. It's just a variability. But these changes happen to coincide with the rapid change we have it slowing down in the length of the day, and this is a rapid speeding up. So, this is what I'm talking about. Uh, rotation means a lot. Uh, this is the rotation uh, of the Earth, and how it changed in cold, warm temperature and sea level in the North Sea. And uh, uh, that's, of course, a 60 year cycle about and very close to the PDO 56 years uh, cyclicity. Um, if we go to the Gulf Stream, we have the solar maximum deceleration and the stream is going up. It's like two, two streams. Yeah. When it's solar maximum, the northern, is, the northern is expanding and the southern is decreasing. And when it's solar minima, this one withdraw and the other expands. So uh, you get Cooling. And the interesting thing is, of course, we are uh, facing such an evidence. Such. Okay. If you have it on the longer term, you have all the times when we saw it, we have this all the time. 
And of course here they are, they are approaching this one. And that's the differences between solar maxima, solar minima, and we are heading for this, this one. <coughs> and this is how it looks. Uh, emission and all these changes which we see. Thank you very much. Setting the scene by outlining the relationships between what happens down here on the back and what happens out there in the wider solar system. We now come to Roger Tattersall and Richard Salvador, who are going to talk about does solar system orbital motion and resonance synchronize solar variation? Come on in, Roger. Welcome. Good morning, everybody. Great to see you. It's great that we be here today. Uh, I'm just loading up my presentation. It's just being loaded up on the computer. Unfortunately, we had to walk from Oxford Circus because somebody was on the line at Tottenham Court Road. <laughs> Running a little late this morning. But uh, I'm wanting to talk today about the, uh, the possibility that many things are synchronized in the solar system and the reason why they're synchronized is because there are feedback loops operating throughout the solar system by orbital resonance which means that all the small differences, the solar variation, the variation in length of day that Nicholas has just been talking about actually add up to, are additive and add up to the climate change that we see here on Earth. So although um, the IPCC maintains that solar variation has a very small effect on climate change, uh, actually in addition to these other synchronous changes um, like length of day, uh, we, can we can actually get a force that's strong enough to be making a difference to the Earth's climate. So this is sort of the basis of what we call the uh, solar planetary theory, which put the door press. I think you should be so, so, um, so, what is the solar planetary theory? Well, it's this idea that the Earth is affected by the whole solar system, <clears throat> not just by a trace gas in our atmosphere that changes from 0.3% to 0.4% of our atmosphere. Um, so, on the long term, uh, we're looking at things like long term changes in the solar wind, which might affect uh, the mass of our atmosphere by blowing part of it off the top as more is being generated from underneath through volcanic action. Uh, orbital changes, so for instance the Earth, the shape of the Earth's orbit changes on a 100,000 year cycle uh, and we get every 100,000 years, for the last million or so we've had these glacial and interglacial uh, cycles. And changes <coughs> in Earth's length of day uh, on the long term as well will make a difference. Uh, in the medium term uh, we've got lunar cycles up to around identified so far up to around 1800 years and uh, these sort of seem to coincide with, with long-term um, climate cycles observed in the paleo records. Um, solar variation again, LED changes again. In the short term those lunar tidal cycles act on 18.6 year cycles and 74 year cycles in the northern Atlantic. Um, we also have an element of, of what's known as chaos. Personally, I think that chaos really just stands for things that we haven't worked out how they work yet. Um, because the ultimate idea here is that feedbacks operate between the planets and the sun. And so this is why we get synchronicity in between the motion of the planets and the variation of the sun, which we've identified in various ways, which I'll show a couple of diagrams of in a minute. Um, there's, there, is, there are very obvious signs on the Earth of, of these cyclic events. So, for instance, on the northern shores of uh, Siberia, around Hudson Bay, where the land has been rising after the weight of the glacial ice has been uh, removed from them uh, after the end of the last ice age. LOD. LOD is changing the length of day. 
and um, the, the, um, these rising beaches have ridges on them that correspond to um, major weather pattern changes every 45 years. And every fourth one, i.e. every 180 years, there's a bigger beach ridge. And there is, there is no good explanation for these purely in terms of Earth's internal changes or changes in trace gases in the atmosphere. It's very likely <coughs> they have a celestial origin. And this celestial origin is, is the power of tidal action from the moon. The moon's orbit itself has been shaped over billions of years by uh, the motion of the other nearby planets, particularly Venus and Jupiter, which both within an order of magnitude have the, the same gravitational effect on Earth. So, the identified patterns that, that by, identified by people like Vries and Gleisberg and, and other cycles, they, they match um, these planetary cycles that we have identified with our research. So, back in 2008, I came across a really good puzzle, which was that I found that changes in Earth's length of day, which are in blue here, uh, those are the annual average changes, uh, match very well the, the green curve, which uh, represents the change of position of the centre of mass of the solar system with respect to the solar equatorial plane in the z-axis, i.e. up and down. And I, I wondered, you know, how, how could it be possible that the, the changing positions of, of these planets uh, could be affecting the rate that Earth spins at? And the match is, is invitingly good. And so, you know, I had a good think about this. And what I've since discovered is, is that because the large outer gas giant planets like Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune spend many years at a time either above or below the Earth's plane of orbit, there is actually a, an effect, a, a gyroscopic precessionary effect on the Earth through a quadrupole moment. And this affects the rate that the Earth spins at. So, as Nicholas discussed, the uh, shifting of the, of the uh, oceans of the Earth, either near, nearer the equator, causes the Earth to slow down, further away from the equator, the Earth will speed up a little bit, just like an ice skater throwing, throwing her arms out will slow her down and pulling them in, she'll spin faster. So these things are synchronized, the changes in the winds and the tides, the changes in the positions of the planets, uh, and the change in solar variability, because if you look at the dating here, 1840 to 2010, we know that the, the sun was quite strong in the late 1800s, and it, it dipped around 1900, it got strong again in the middle of the century, in the 1940s, uh, and then we had a big solar slowdown in the 1970s, and then of course it got strong again at the end of the century. So this, these curves also map solar variability, uh, and indeed the same is true for the Earth's surface temperature, where we had a fall in the temperature to around 1900, a rise in, to the 40s, a fall to the 70s, and a rise to the end of the century. So this shows that all these things are synchronized. Now we extended this with a simple model which uses just uh, the orbits of four planets, which are Venus, Earth, Jupiter, and Uranus. And uh, the, the harmonic resonances acting as modulators on, on that. And then a simple numerical model, which is in yellow, and the output of the model's in yellow. And you can see that it matches the changes uh, in the blue curve, which is uh, the temporillium isotope, which is used as a proxy for solar activity, um, you can see that, in fact, the model matches the data quite well, over 4,000 years. And that when, the, um, when you're near the top of the, the curve, uh, you, you get the warm periods. Roman warm period, medieval warm period, the modern warm period at the end. And, and when we're down at the bottom, you get the cold episodes, like the Dark Ages and the Little Ice Age. So there clearly is a long-term relationship between uh, solar variability and the, the temperature of the, of, of the surface of our planet. So working with the same parameters and the same uh, orbital frequencies, we, we then made a similar model using, <coughs> using again the orbital periods of Jupiter and Saturn uh, 
uh, and uh, also looking at some lunar uh, variation. And we made a predictive model um, that the end, uh, at the end of last year, um, the, in blue we have our prediction for changes in the Earth's length of day. Uh, and then in the purple, that was the, the actual LOD data that we already had through December last year. And then in green is, is sort of from when we made the prediction, uh, we've seen um, what would happen to our model in relation to the real data. And I think as you can see, it's, it's actually done pretty well. There's been a small diversion here, another one here, and at the moment there's just a swing. The, the model is, is too far up here, the, the actual data is down here. But the timings are, are still correct, and we do expect that this that this green line, the actual data, will rejoin our model in the coming months. And if you visit my website, you can see the updates on this every two months uh, to see how well we do with this model. But again, this shows that it is the, the major planets and their shaping of the moon's orbit over billions of years that are actually um, producing changes in Earth's length of day. And those concurrently are producing changes in the way that the tides operate because of the upwelling that's caused by the change in the Earth's length of day. If you slow down the solid Earth, the ocean carries on going at the speed it was and it piles up against Africa or it piles up against South America, which causes an upwelling of deep ocean water, cold water, which then spreads out across the surface as the Earth's gravity pulls the geoid back to its regular shape. So we can see how these might interact with the lunar tides um, changing the situation of, of where the water's positioned, whether you're getting a bulge at the equator or towards the poles, thus changing the speed that you're spinning at. And recently, very, this is very recent work from, uh, from Rick Salvador. I wish he could join us, but he's, he's over in Canada and he can't make it, so I'm, I'm presenting his graphs here. But, um, here, here we have in, in blue the, uh, the El Nino index, uh, the, the changes in the um, successive El Ninos and La Ninas swinging up and down and our model in yellow using again the same planetary <coughs> parameters and you can see that we've achieved uh, a very good match here. Now I'm not going to make too many claims for this at the moment because you know we, we have had to be quite careful about the numbers that we've used and, and, uh, and tweak a couple of parameters so we're going to carry on developing this work uh, in the hope that we can produce a single model which will show, which will explain all of the solar variation, the changes in Earth's length of day, and these changes in the El Nino Southern Oscillation. Uh, because then we think that if we can have a single model that, that will cover all of those three, then we're showing very strong evidence that indeed uh, changes in the Earth's climate and, and changes in the interannual variability uh, are driven by the entire solar system. Uh, not by a trace gas in the atmosphere changing its concentration by 0.1% or so. I've lost it. Okay, so uh, I think it was, uh, oh, here we go. This is our uh, prediction for solar variation over the coming century. Um, you can see in blue the, the actual um, sunspot numbers. Uh, or TSI uh, values since 1987 um, through into um, the cycle where we are now, cycle 24, which is considerably smaller than the previous two. And we predict that we're going to get a very deep solar minimum lasting three cycles at least, uh, and only a, a fairly shallow recovery um, to, to the middle of the century. Uh, and overall, the amount of input of energy into the Earth's oceans that this is going to produce isn't going to be enough to maintain the ocean heat content. So we do expect to see a downturn in surface temperatures um, becoming more marked by the middle of the 2020s. Um, so what this shows us really is that the current paradigm which just looks at the Earth and its atmosphere and the oceans uh, in, in isolation from the rest of the solar system in which we're embedded is completely inadequate to understanding climate change. And we really need to uh, lift our eyes up above the, those low horizons and look to the, uh, to the open skies and the, the enormity of the uh, system that surrounds us in order to gain a better understanding.
Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Venus, Earth, 
Moon, Mars, Titan, which is a, uh, a satellite of Saturn, and Triton, a satellite of Neptune. In terms of conditions, you can see that the day span I range from, in terms of solar radiation reaching the, the uh, each of the different planets, spanning the range from about 2600 watts per square meter down to 1.5 watts per square meter. In terms of albedo, the variation is from about uh, 0.14 for the Moon to about 0.90 for Venus. The atmospheric composition and the total pressure is equally stunningly uh, wide in terms of variation. So we have uh, a body like the Moon that has no greenhouse gases to, to Venus that has over 96% of greenhouse gases and so forth. So this is a really a broad uh, uh, you know, uh, environment that represent a very broad range of conditions. Uh, so our analysis was based on a technique called dimensional analysis, which has been used in engineering in the past as a classical method. The technique basically uh, means uh, what, what it implies that uh, the, the derivation of physical meaningful relationships uh, from empirical data without a reference to any theory. That's the power of it. In the old days, when in fluid mechanics and other sciences where a process was not known well, we have a bunch of data and make uh, sense of them. You actually apply this method to, to see if there is any relationship that are meaningful that you can use. By the way, everything that we call now fundamental science and theoretical science, uh, things like the Planck constant, the, the, the ideal gas constant, the gravitational constant, the old days of measurements and fitting data. So the, the, the information that's now in our theoretical science, it came originally from empirical measurements. So we are applying this approach, but on a planetary scale, not in a laboratory as was done in the past, in the beginning of the 20th century, when the foundations of physics were placed. So the, the dimensional analysis, uh, uh, the key feature of the dimensional analysis is that uh, uh, it works by reducing the units that we use for variables that we're investigating, reducing them to a common set of uh, fundamental dimensions. Majority of the uh, the units of junk of the variables and physics and parameters, uh, they can be reduced to four fundamental fundamental dimensions. But those are absolute temperature, uh, identified here with theta, mass, m, l, length, and t, time. And for example, what I mean by that, uh, speed, for example, is measured in, uh, you can measure the metal in meter per second, per, per second, you, know, you can measure miles per hour, but fundamentally, speed is a length by unit time, or length divided by time. In a similar fashion, uh, the, for example, here the solar radiation is measured in watts per square meter. When you do uh, the decomposition to fundamental dimensions, you actually end up with the watts per, per square meter equals mass divided by time cubed. Something that is counterintuitive and you know, a lot of people don't realize that. And so, but the same way, with the same token, you can, you, can, uh, you can see here relationships between variables that are otherwise not obvious. For example, the uh, uh, flux, energy flux here, uh, being with those units of mass per, uh, per, per time cubed, uh, this, you, you obtain this unit by multiplying the pressure times the speed. So if you see the pressure has units of mass divided by length, divided by, by time uh, squared, if you multiply this by uh, length by time, you actually get this unit. So basically, by doing dimensional analysis, you realize that the watts per square meter is the pressure times the speed of the moving particles. So this is a list of variables that we have worked with. And we have here yeah, temperature, you have the solar radiation reaching to the planet, uh, to, the, to, to the top of the atmosphere of the planet. We have something called reference temperature, which uh, in our case is the temperature of the planet without atmosphere. So any planet that we study that has atmosphere, we also calculate the temperature for that planet without the atmosphere. We will get to that in a little bit later. Then we have uh, the pressure and density, not only total pressure and density of the atmosphere, but also partial pressure and partial density of greenhouse gases. So the result from the dimensional analysis was uh, 12 models, uh, 
once we got the non dimensional number to the, to just the dimensional analysis, we have to find a relationship. So here those two models have been explored with a, with a curve that is a, a common equation but has different shape because the dimensions are different. And you cannot see very well here, but you have, uh, on the y-axis, you have always a temperature ratio, which is the ratio of the planet to the, to the, to the temperature uh, of the planet without atmosphere. And then on the, on the x-axis, you have different non-dimensional numbers that include the density, uh, the greenhouse gases, the, the partial pressure of greenhouse gases, the absolute density, the absolute partial pressure, the absolute uh, pressure of the atmosphere. And so out of all these models, the only one that actually uh, produced a very tight relationship is this number 12. And this is the, the relationship between the, uh, this temperature ratio, which we call it the relative temperature, you can call it, or because it's a ratio of temperature, <coughs> temperature with no atmosphere, it basically quantifies the thermal effect of the atmosphere, so we call it atmospheric thermal enhancement. This is another word for the greenhouse effect, which we think is more accurate than the, the current word, the, the current term that's been used. So this is a low log scale, and it, I can see the correlation is almost one. The error is very small. And by the way, this model is about 20 times more accurate than the second best model, which happened to be number one up here behind. So there is a big difference between this model, this fit, and all the other uh, options. <coughs> Here we have the curve uh, that is after the ante log, and we have the actual equation. And here we see the uh, atmospheric thermal effect, which is on the y-axis, given with the temperature ratio, as a function of total pressure. And you see that all the planets that line up actually very, very, in a very nice way. The only little exception is Titan, it's very close to the curve. Uh, but the temperature of Titan was uncertain, so we have excluded actually Titan from the regression. On the bottom, you see the equation. Uh, uh, the, 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 the P7A is the equivalent of the temperature without the atmosphere. We have a handout for that. Uh, and uh, um, uh, you can read about that more. It was uh, based on work uh, published in 2014 by Wolf and Relais uh, in uh, Springer Plus. Uh, so, this is a whole topic by itself. We can talk about how this is done, uh, but we don't have a time right now. And maybe we have a discussion. If people are interested, I'll be happy to elaborate further. Next. Okay. So, here we're showing the absolute accuracy of the, of the model. And uh, uh, as, you said, as you can see, the, for all the planets but Titan, uh, the accuracy of the curve that produces the current observed temperature is less than 0.17 degrees. I mean, this is engineering accuracy. This is not ecological or climatological accuracy. We're talking about something else here. Uh, So, uh, in order to test that this relationship actually is, is viable, there is a thing called statistical robustness. And that means that if you change the number of parameters or the number of, uh, of data points, or you have a new data set and you derive uh, another regression line, you can compare it to the original one and see uh, how far uh, it is from the original one. So, here, this, this is exactly what we have done. Uh, the solid line is the uh, original equation that includes all the bodies. And the, uh, the dash line is the new regression equation that uh, has uh, where we have removed the earth and, and Titan from the uh, set of, uh, of data that is, using, is used to, to create the regression. And the idea was how close the new regression line can predict the temperature of Earth to Titan. And as you see here, the, uh, they are very close to, to the line. In fact, the new line to predict the temperature worked with an accuracy of 99.6%, which is within one degree. Now again, to repeat that, uh, uh, the, uh, the initial <coughs> line was derived by having uh, only 
Venus, uh, uh, Moon, Mars, Triton, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Mars and, and Triton in the regression line. But, so Titan and Earth were excluded. And yet, having those worlds that have nothing to do with Earth, very different, right? Uh, the Earth's temperature was predicted by this line, but by this curve, with an accuracy of 99.6%. So that tells you that Earth is a part of a cosmic continuum that is described by this, by this curve. Now, I, I didn't mention, but we're talking here about long-term average temperatures. A long-term meaning at least 30 years average. We're not talking about specific year or specific decade. We're talking long-term equilibrium average temperature. So you can, you can look at this curve and you can think about this like the, back, the backbone or the baseline of what determines climate. Because temperature is a direct, has a direct relationship with kinetic energy which determines everything. So this is a, the temperature ratio we have here, this is the ratio of energies. So then the question is, what, uh, uh, how we can explain this in terms of physical terms, this relationship? Is this an accident? Is this a statistical fluke? Or what is it? So, uh, you know, if you go back to the, uh, to the basics of the foundation of uh, uh, physics, or in specific internal dynamics, we find out that temperature is proportional to the internal kinetic energy. This is a linear system. We have a handout here for that one. Number two, people don't want to look at that. Uh, second, the, the energy, the kinetic energy, by definition, is a force applied over the distance, which is Joule, one joule equals Newton times, times the distance to meters. Thirdly, uh, pressure itself is a force per unit area, so that the product of pressure times volume, this comes from the gas law, equals energy. This is something that we have all to, all to be reminded about because in climate science it's quite often forgotten that uh, P times V is the kinetic energy of the atmosphere. Uh, and then, the, the three points above, uh, they, uh, they give us a conclusion that uh, the energy, the kinetic energy and temperature cannot exist without a force. That's a physical fact. Meaning that uh, in any system where there's kinetic energy and temperature, you find some form of pressure. What do I mean? People say, what, what about the radiation? Well, from the dimensional analysis, as, we, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the energy flux, which is watts per square meter, this is the first linear flux, radiation included, is the pressure times the speed of the moving particles. So, how many of you knew that uh, radiative flux uh, equals uh, photon pressure times the speed of light? That the light has pressure? Anybody know about that? No. <laughs> so, uh, this is known to uh, NASA. Uh, the satellites they send in orbit, if they don't do a correction for that, uh, for, the, for the effect of, of light as a pressure on the satellite, they, they drift off orbit. So here's the equation that any radiative flux is total pressure times the speed of light. Since the speed of light is constant in any medium, that means that changing the uh, intensity of radiation within a given medium, we're talking about changing the uh, fluctuating the, uh, the pressure of photons, essentially. So that gives, them, uh, that gives them an opportunity here to express a very well-known law, the Stefan Boltzmann law, to express it in terms of, of photon pressure. How you do that? And on the, on the right-hand side, you see the temperature given as a radiation divided by the Stefan Boltzmann constant, uh, and the fourth root of that. And then if you divide both sides of this equation by, by, something, uh, by some constants, like, for example, the the temperature of this space, which happened to be, this is irreducible temperature of space, which just happened to be about 2.7 Kelvin. Uh, uh, on, on the temperature end, you divide this by, by T sub C, and on the radiation end, you divide this the radiation uh, by the uh, equivalent of the uh, causative agent, agent of this cosmic temperature, which is the cosmic microwave background radiation, which happened to be a very small number. So you get this expression, the temperature ratio equals the fourth root of a radiation ratio. Well, further, if we express the radiation in terms of uh, photon pressure, come on, you get uh, uh, an expression that gives you the temperature ratio as a, as a, as a function of the, pre of, of, of the ratio of pressures. Now, what is the shape of this relationship? You know, if we can plot this, and here is the shape of this relationship. This is a new form, a new way of expressing the Stefan Boltzmann law. Okay. Well, how, how this compares with uh, 
of the relationship that we have just derived. Oops, I worked with that. Um, you can see that the shapes of those curves are very similar. They belong to different systems, so therefore the magnitude of the x and y axis are quite different. But the shape is very similar, and the other commonality is that in both cases we have a temperature ratio related to a pressure rate ratio. We have a third system that's called uh, adiabatic heating, or the Poisson formula, that gives us the rate of change of temperature with pressure alone. And, uh, and here we have the third curve, which is eerily similar to the other two curves. So here we have a, a very strong quality of resemblance uh, between uh, all the curves, right? So, so that tells you that uh, uh, there is something physical about this relationship at the very end that, that we have derived from the planet, but it's not a, uh, a random event. So the, the conclusion from this is that this relationship that we just derived, uh, uh, it has a, ma a macro level physical reality. Now, we have went through a number of characteristics of this curve, number one being the high accuracy we saw, number two is the very broad range of validity, number three is the statistical robustness, and number four it is physically meaningful. So therefore, uh, as a conclusion, we can, we can say that this relationship uh, appears to describe a micro-level thermodynamic feature of the planetary atmospheres heretofore unknown to science. What is the implication of that relationship? The implication is that the uh, uh, physical nature of the, the so-called greenhouse effect is actually a pressure-induced thermal enhancement, which is independent of atmospheric composition. Because we have the atmospheric composition of partial pressure and so forth in the, our analysis and did not produce any meaningful relationship. Now, we, you have to remember this is across a broad range of conditions, much broader than the occurs on Earth, and we're talking about a long term equilibrium temperature. So, uh, to finish with the question that we started with, what is the, uh, what the uh, diesel engine and Earth's climate system have in common? You can figure it out. Well, the answer is that both systems by the internal temperature <coughs> the system of the system took through gas compression. So that being a related phenomenon. It is not a related falling phenomena, it is actually a, a phenomenon caused by pressure. It's a, a pressure induced thermal enhancement. But it's kind of hidden if, if you don't you don't see that until actually you do the analysis you know for the planets. And the way it started back in 1824 with Joseph Fourier, he just expressed the notion that it looks like the atmosphere works like a blanket. And it stops the cooling, or it slows down the cooling. In fact, it's not, there's no stopping and slowing down the cooling. It's just an enhancement of the energy that's coming from the sun, because the energy that's coming from the sun is also a result of photon pressure, you can say. And uh, the, uh, this energy being absorbed by the Earth has been enhanced by the pressure of the atmosphere on Earth, because it doesn't matter if it's a photon pressure or gas pressure, pressure always changes the temperature. So that's the fundamental new aspect. Thank you. Well within the time limits, and that has allowed us to have, in fact, uh, 10 to 20 minutes of discussion time. So who would like to raise any points? Yes. Uh, I'd just like to say something about the, the last paper. I, I think give the name. Yeah. Everyone, Hello. give the name. Yes, please uh, say who you are. Peter Gibb. Mark. <laughs> Have we got a microphone? <laughs> um, I'd like to say something about the last paper. Speak up as loud as you can. Yeah. 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 But you can do it with a dry lap spray. And making simple assumptions, you get to a very similar answer. That's correct. I think that the several people who have done this, Doug Cutman is quite 
of this on the internet. I don't know whether you've noticed his contribution. Coming back to um, some of the earlier papers, I'd make a comment about so, uh, okay. the solar wind. I think it's important to separate the solar wind aspect from the two. On the one hand, on the one hand, you've got the changes introduced by, um, as Niels Axel would say, uh, the, the gravitational impact of changes in the planetary system. And on the other hand, you've got the solar particles. Now, admittedly, the solar particles are driven by the magnetic change. But I think that you throw the baby out of the bathwater if you put the whole lot in the solar uh, wind part, because there's going to be an interaction of the solar magnetosphere with the Earth's magnetosphere, and you could actually get length of day changes because of interaction of the, 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 the dynamo in the Earth, quite apart from a number of other factors too. Dual heating is not being mentioned by anyone yet, I don't know that it will be mentioned during the course of the next uh, day or so. Well, there's an interesting point there. Just uh, to throw a, a bit of a Spanish <coughs> word, if I may, how would uh, Ned Nikolov, for instance, account for the measured effect of CO2 when in the laboratory you put it in various concentrations into air that previously doesn't have any, and there appears to be an interference with the radiation passes through, and furthermore, that interference is claimed to be understood even down to the quantum level as being <coughs> originating from one of the vibrational modes of the CO2 molecule. How do you account for that result uh, as well as your result? So this is an excellent question. This is an excellent question, and uh, I, I appreciate that uh, Lord Martin asked that question. Actually, this is a subject of a whole other talk. We do have an answer to that. Uh, so let me try to explain it real quick. Um, uh, the absorption of uh, infrared radiation by so-called greenhouse gases is undeniable. There is no question about that. They do absorb. However, uh, what has not been known for even the, the people that do climate modeling, I'm not aware of that, and I have just asked this question many people in the climate modeling community, is the fact that in the climate models, when they actually show in textbooks the so-called greenhouse effect and, 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 and try to explain this with radiation, if you have noticed they have a system of equations there that have only radiation, long wave short wave radiation, but nothing about convective heat exchange. Okay? So when you, uh, in reality, convective heat exchange and radiation and radiative exchange happen simultaneously. Right? So, but it's a nonlinear system, and the way it works, it's like the transfer of heat, it's like electricity, it goes along the path of least resistance. So what is uh, not known widely is that the convective uh, heat exchange is much more efficient, we're talking about orders of magnitude more efficient than the radiative exchange. Why? Because convection can occur ac across a simple temperature gradient, in case of water vapor, it doesn't even need a gradient as long as you have a gradient of concentration of water vapor. You know, the, the temperature gradient may be even negative, and you, you still have a transfer of heat. But radiation always requires at least a, a gradient in, of temperatures to the power of, third, of three or four, right? So it's a lot steeper. When you have a system where uh, the uh, uh, convective heat exchange and radiative heat exchange are coupled together mathematically and solved simultaneously, the radiative effect uh, it goes away because the convection takes over. In climate models, without any exceptions, all the models, they solve radiative uh, uh, transfer separately from convection. When the, uh, when the so-called heating rate is calculated from the radiative transfer module, there is no terms, convective terms in those equations. So they solve it and then they pass the result of that, add it to the rest of the model in form of a uh, heating rate. Okay. Well, if you have a nonlinear system and you decouple the components, right, then you, 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 uh, uh, the, you solve them individually and you, put them, you add them together, you don't have a solution to the whole system. It doesn't work like that. You have to solve the system simultaneously. And so basically by doing this decoupling, there is a raw mathematical solution number one. Number two, uh, additional heat is coming from this uh, rate of transfer module, 
which in essence violates the law of the uh, first law of thermodynamics because this extra energy is being added to the rest of the model out of the blue. So that's how things, uh, things happen. So basically, the, the, the answer to your question, Lord Markham, is that uh, you have the effect of uh, uh, greenhouse gases on temperature only when convective heat exchange is taken out of the system. When you add it, add it in, which is not being done in any other kind of model, and solar simultaneously, you don't see that effect. For the experiments. That is uh, a very interesting answer. Yes, yes, yes. We have one, two, three, four. So, so I just wanted to add something on top of Ned. I'm, I'm Carl Seller. Um, what Ned has shown up here, um, we're presenting, it, it's, it's outside. <laughs> I'll put it that way. It's on top of, um, I don't know how to say it. it you know, Roger talked about the, uh, the cycles. Okay, we're talking about an equilibrium. The, the, this is measured NASA data. This is an empirical relationship of the long-term temperature equilibrium. These measurements were taken over 30 years, so we're saying a 30 year. So this is kind of the result of an equilibrium. So the temperature that we calculate for Earth, and we did that using those four other bodies, not the Earth, <laughs> and we're able to calculate the temperature of the Earth within a, a degree centigrade from some stupid measurements made by NASA, okay, well, this, yeah, we're, to, we're calling this kind of like an equilibrium <coughs> way of calculating the temperature. Or this is the backbone or the average temperature of which everything else happens up and down. Now, Roger indicated that it's going to get colder. How many years, Roger? Or 50 years? Or 80 years? Okay. The implication of what, what Ned has done, and, I, uh, and uh, I've helped him, Ned's the brains behind this. The implication is that we're going to get less clouds, and it's not going to get colder, Roger, I'm sorry. Okay, yes, we're going to have those fluctuations, but we have a long-term uh, equilibrium mechanism heretofore unknown. That's wonderful. And, yeah. and, and incidentally, I'm going to put these uh, handouts to explain uh, energy and also explain our no atmosphere calculation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, it's Corbin from Weather Action, Long Range Forecasters. I'll be saying a lot more tomorrow, um, but I think the first thing to understand about this um, is that these experiments, or so-called experiments in the lab on CO2, are about rates of change. What they do is they put a CO2 rich gas and compare it with a low CO2 rich gas, and they notice the temperature rises faster than the CO2. But the temperature also goes down faster when you turn off the radiation. So what they're doing actually in these, it's, it's a country play uh, to children basically, and it's, it's an inaccurate representation of reality. Now, the Carl and uh, uh, Ned's uh, model is, I think, you know, absolutely correct. And it's, it's actually very simply based on the adiabatic lapse rate. If you start from that point of view, you can understand it completely. We're talking of the dry adiabatic. Uh, yeah, but of course there's going to be one with, with water in control. And that was actually, is actually the basis of, of, of modern meteorology. And they popped in the CO2 stuff in, in a totally uh, confusing way. Um, now, I do want to ask about something that Roger said, but if people are staying on this point, shall I ask? No, no, please move on to Roger. Okay. Um, yeah, Roger where you are, but uh, right, I'm going to uh, raise some more of these things tomorrow. First of all, the uh, length of day V8, v Venus, Earth and Jupiter, or I'll put it the other around, JEV and Uranus being crucially important, I agree with that completely, but question for you, why not Saturn, is it something to do as well, or, uh, uh, and why not Neptune, is it something to do with the position on the Z plane in, in your <coughs> observations? That's the first thing. And the second point is that you're, you put forward something which is very mechanical. I'm not against it because I think you know, it's, it's a superb uh, contribution. But the real connections we can see involve a lot of magnetism and electricity, especially when you're looking at short term things. And I'm going to be sticking something on the wall which will stun some of you. But I'd like you to comment on those two questions. 
Well, thanks for the, for the question, Piers. Uh, well, two <coughs> questions. Um, in, in fact, what we've discovered is that there's uh, a sort of fractal self-similarity <laughs> right throughout the solar system. And so I, I think that we could probably make similar models um, using any selection of planets from the solar system. We wanted to keep our model as simple as possible, so we kept it to just using four. Well, actual signal involved with Uranus and so forth turns up in geomagnetic Right, well, I mean, that's, that's uh, a happy coincidence. I mean, we, we are working, trying to keep things simple, so we're, we're looking and kind of thinking about this in terms of gravitation. Uh, I absolutely uh, agree with you that very likely there are, there's a magnetic, electromagnetic effects as well, and, and as mentioned by Peter Gill, uh, the, the possibility of a coupling between uh, the, the Sun and Earth's magnetosphere and, and, uh, and core dynamo, such that that might be altering length of day as well. Uh, I don't know the answer to these things. We don't fully understand the mechanisms. Uh, I always kind of keep an open mind on it and say, you know, all of the above until proven otherwise. Uh, so I encourage everybody to, to keep researching in whatever direction they think they're getting results and, and hopefully all this will come together uh, in the long run for all of us. Uh, now, sorry, just refreshing on your second question just momentarily. Just... Uh, well, the second question was about, I said, you, what you're putting forward is very uh, mechanistic. Yes. Uh, as opposed to involving uh, magnetic uh, okay. effects. And, so I kind of and mentioned that. was only two years as opposed to 11 years. In, oh, indeed. Indeed. indeed, yeah. Uh, I mean, we we can uh, model the, the magnetic cycle as well uh, using the, the planetary index, Jupiter, Earth, Venus. Uh, we can model the 22-year cycle without just as, just as easily as we can model the 11-year cycle. Mm. So, yeah. But I fully agree with you. Magnet yeah. Magnetics are bound to be involved. Kepler said so in 1604. He knew what he was talking about. Yeah. Thank you. Very much. And for the correlation. The correlation is somewhat of the answer where <coughs> some of us. My name is Peter Ward, and in answer to your question, uh, it's, I agree with Dead that the Earth loses heat primarily by convection, windshield. It's the weather that takes the heat away. The radiation contribution is minimal. Now, greenhouse gases do absorb <laughs> energy because there are more than three atoms in the greenhouse gases, there are more bonds. And the energy is, is well observed by spectral physicists to be absorbed in the bonds that hold the molecule together. This has nothing to do with atmospheric temperature. Atmospheric temperature is proportional to the kinetic energy of all the molecules of the gas. And the higher the velocity, the higher the temperature. So you have to convert this bond energy by smashing into other molecules into kinetic energy. And the mathematics just doesn't work out when you've only got 0.04% of the molecules actually absorbing some energy, and you're only absorbing very small parts of that energy. Now, I don't know how many of you realize it has never actually been shown experimentally that when you increase greenhouse gases, you, in, you make air hotter. The only experiment that's been done was by Nuna Engstrom in 1900. And he did both a field experiment in the Canary Islands and an experiment in the laboratory. And he said, look, the effect is very small. Now, in order to bring this point home, I issued to the climate community a challenge. I'm offering to pay $10,000 for my children's inheritance <laughs> to the first scientist that can demonstrate experimentally that the warming caused by greenhouse gases since 1970 was much greater than the warning caused by ozone depletion. There's a free brochure out on the tables called Proven. And what I'm basically saying is before we spend $10 trillion, wouldn't it be nice to actually show that there is a greenhouse effect? <laughs> uh, my name is Hans Gelbrin. And uh, I want to like to comment on uh, Roger Tatusau's and um, Salvador's um, model. And uh, I won't ask him anything because he speaks so much. But speak, I, speak, please. I will comment on it. And I appreciate your work. And you should go on. I, and I will tell why. Because um, one year ago at the conference in um, Prague, 
I presented evidence that um, the length of day, the Earth rotation rate, depends on primarily in at the um, monthly uh, period periodicities on where the moon is situated related to the uh, equator plane of Earth. This means that every time Earth moon is going over this plane, the Earth is slowing down. And you get a cyclicity of 14 days. This 14 days you can find in both solar cyclicity, a lot of different solar activity variables, and in the number of Earth climate cyclicity, <laughs> like pressure variation. And this is additional information to what Roger presented. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for two more questions, I think. Hi, my name is Hans Weyer. In one of the slides you said that Mars has a 95% um, concentration of CO2, but the average temperature is lower than Earth's. And then the CO2 is Venus. I think it was Mars that had 95% of, of carbon dioxide. Yeah. So where's the greenhouse effect in Mars? Shouldn't it be hotter than Earth? So, 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 so carbon dioxide isn't the main driver. So even the mainstream science acknowledges and they say that Mars has a very small greenhouse effect, so-called greenhouse effect, uh, simply because the pressure is very low and so the absorption, the uh, so-called, uh, the pressure broadening of the absorption bands is very small. So they, they, they uh, illustrate that like cracks through a fence, you know, the cracks are uh, uh, too wide so the, the radiation goes through, right, that, that's why you don't have what uh, we have discovered and what our relationship shows that Mars is a part of the continuum. It's right on the curve, and uh, the reason uh, the, the temperature on Mars is, uh, is so cold, well, there are two reasons. One thing is much further from the sun, which Mars receives only 57%. Uh, I mean, the radiation of Mars receives is 57% less than what Earth receives, right, on top of the atmosphere. That's number one. Number two, the pressure on Mars is uh, 100 or less of that on Earth. So that creates a very small thermal effect. Uh, in our calculations, the thermal effect of the atmosphere on Mars is only 19%. In other words, the, the, the atmosphere raises the temperature of the surface by 19% above what would be without atmosphere. And on, for comparison on Earth, it's a 46%. So, Mention Venus. Mention Venus. Venus. The Venus, uh, the temperature on Venus, uh, uh, the thermal <coughs> effect on, on Venus is a uh, uh, factor of 3.2 about. <laughs> One final question. One final question. Leonel. Leonel. This is just a curiosity. When you say, when you speak about long term, what do you mean? 30 years in this case. So have you done the, using 30 years, have you correlated with the temperature, with the measure of temperature and the, and the, what, what is the relationship with the measure? The 30 years return period and the, the this is a 30-year average temperature. Yeah, but can you show a, a diagram showing the the 30 years of return period with the temperature that was measured? The, oh, that was, oh, there is a fluctuations. Yeah, there are fluctuations. You, you are asking about how much of those fluctuations yeah. in the temperature? Well, mm -hmm. we, we have those pretty much only on Earth. We don't have it on our planet because we don't have continuous network. No, no, it's the Earth. Yeah. So the fluctuations, you know, they go a plus minus point, uh, I would say point like a, a three degrees or so. I mean, there's interannual fluctuation that is also between the decades, a little bit of trend here and there, right? So uh, if you look at the last 108, 130 years, about the total warming that we're talking about is about 0.8 degrees Celsius, right? That's the total warming. Now there's a question, what is the, 
there is some evidence that maybe uh, the temperature in the late 1800s was pretty much close to today. Through adjustments, it went down. So we're not quite sure. But in any case, this is we're talking small fluctuations <coughs> compared to the overall backbone or baseline that the, the pressure is determining as a temperature. Many thanks. And that is the end of the first session. Thank you all very much. Tea and coffee outside. Of a short break now. Please get back in your chairs. Thank you very much. Welcome back, viewers. You join us at the next session of the London Climate Change Conference, The Dawn of Truth. The session will um, start again in about 10 minutes. So far today we've heard that the, uh, the predicted temperature of the atmosphere again we correlated to the temperature of pretty much every other planet in the solar system just by mathematical relationship between all the various forces in play the sun, the planet rotations, things like that the pressure of the atmospheres Nothing whatsoever to do with CO2. This whole CO2 causes global warming is a massive scam. And more and more scientists are coming out with real hard evidence of that scam.
The time sequence that we would like to discuss, this is the global temperature of the global surface temperature of the Earth, and so I believe that most of you are aware of it. So what we see here is an increase of temperature uh, in, uh, of about one Celsius degree, a bit less than one Celsius degree since uh, 1850. This is the global warming. And uh, here you see the, uh, the output of the quantum models uh, of the IPCC, the Terra C and IP5, these are the models used the, uh, recently. And uh, uh, we would like to discuss about uh, the properties of this signal. Of course, uh, if you compare the two, you see that both the signals uh, produce some kind of warming, so the model more or less produces this warming, but the models fail to produce all oscillations that you see here. You see that there is no comparison whatsoever between the data and the models. So the problem is, are the oscillations important for understanding the climate change or not? One. Two, what is the origin of this oscillation? Okay? Because if the models do not reproduce the natural oscillation of the climate, it might happen that the models are missing something very, very important in the end for mm -hmm. the climate change. Okay? So, please change. Now, briefly, uh, what is the problem of climate change? I think that you have heard about this uh, 2 Celsius degree limit uh, by... Essentially, the, the problem is that if the temperature will warm more than 2 Celsius by 2010, uh, by uh, 2100, okay, so many regions of the Earth will have problems. Okay, so people say we need to keep the temperature below a, a warming of 2 Celsius. And to do this, uh, we need to reduce the greenhouse gases because the models uh, predict that uh, the temperature will go above the Q Celsius limit. Okay, so that is all what you are about. The problem is that if there are natural oscillations and, uh, and the temperature will, uh, be, uh, will remain below the two Celsius limit because of the natural oscillation of the system, then we may not need to, to reduce too much uh, the, our emissions. So the economic problems will be very different. Okay? So the problem of oscillation, understanding the oscillation within the system is very, very important. Please. Now, another issue, and now I finish this introduction, is that be careful when we talk about the global impacts of climate change, because not all regions of the Earth are affected in the same way. In North Europe, in general in Europe, and in particular in North Europe, a warming would be beneficial. Okay? Other regions of the Earth, like in India or in Peru, other regions like in Africa, the warming would be uh, dangerous. But, uh, so, when we talk about the danger of global warming, it depends on the region where we are. Okay? So that is another issue that we need to consider. It's not that everybody will suffer. There is some geographical uh, distribution of the uh, uh, problems. Okay, let's go ahead and let us understand how transfer models work. Transfer models essentially use a set of equations of the circulation plus a forcing, a set of forcing uh, that uh, are responsible of the change of the climate. Here you see many, many forcing uh, from solar, uh, CO2, mineral uh, volcanic, and so on. Solar <coughs> actually is very, very small, it is a yellow thing that is here. So the claim is that uh, um, the natural forcing, so volcano and the solar, is relatively small and the warming is entirely, nearly entirely produced by this uh, greenhouse effect uh, of, uh, that is believed to be anthropogenic. The problem with the plant is that uh, an important issue is how much sensitive is the climate to, it, uh, to the greenhouse gases. And uh, here you see several orders uh, with uh, the error bars of this estimate of the equilibrium climate sensitivity. You see that the model IPCC are here between 1.5 and 4.5, but uh, there is no agreement between the orders. So I believe that the uh, climate sensitivity is about 1 and 2, more or less 1 and 2. Uh, and uh, if with this kind of sensitivity to greenhouse gases, uh, there will be no big problem uh, with greenhouse gases.
quantità di essere difficile Bonus and other problems, so for example they fail in reconstructing the temperature during the Holocene, so this is the model, model prediction, these are the data, they fail in reconstructing the troposphere temperature, the models are here, the observations are here, they fail to reconstruct the temperature at the poles, so you see the temperature of, of, of the, so this is the ice uh, cover, uh, the sea ice cover, so the north pole went down, but the south pole went up, and uh, the, but the models predict in both cases a warming, so uh, it, they don't explain uh, the, the, uh, the increase of ice cover in the, in the, in the, in the south pole. Okay? So there are many problems. Uh, uh, and if we go back uh, during the last 1,000 years, so the, the models have other problems. So we know the temperature during the Middle Age was like this, then went down here and then went up again here. The models produce this kind of curve, this, this, uh, uh, this curve here. So it apparently reproduced this warming, but they don't reproduce the, the uh, medieval warming period. To get the medieval warming period, it is necessary to increase greatly the solar effect by three, four, five times. So, this, so the models are uh, significantly overestimating uh, the greenhouse gas uh, effect and uh, they are underestimating greatly the solar effect. So that is the only way to get uh, the medieval warming period. So this is a model, a monitor model uh, that I will talk to you, to you later. Please go ahead. Now let us discuss start to discuss about this oscillation because as I showed you in the first uh, slides, uh, the temperature actually goes up and down with a big oscillation, which is about a 60-year oscillation. So there was a warming between 1850 1880, then a cooling between 1880 uh, 1910, then a warming between 1910 and 1940, then a cooling, a little cooling between 1940 and uh, 1970, then a warming again between 1970 and 2000, and then the temperature went a little bit uh, more stable. Actually, so it appears that there is a 60 year oscillation in the data, and indeed, the 60 year oscillation in, is seen in several data. These are data uh, several centuries long. Uh, these are from the Indian moon zone, that we see a very nice 60 year oscillation. This is from a reconstruction of the Pacific Degree oscillation that goes to this. This is a reconstruction of the Atlantic Degree oscillation that goes like this, a 60 year oscillation. This is sea level rise where it's possible to see 60 year oscillation also here. And uh, okay, so there are these oscillations uh, that last for several centuries, please go ahead. So the problem is that uh, do we have an explanation of this oscillation? So uh, people say, okay, these oscillations are found in the ocean and so on, but we need to understand what is the origin of the oscillation. And this brought me to, to, uh, to study the, the planetary theory of climate and solar variation. This theory is indeed is quite old. It was introduced actually by Wolf more than 150 years ago. And here, Wolf is the guy who had essentially organized the sunspot record, and therefore he uh, get this 11 year solar cycle. And he uh, um, asked himself what is the origin of this 11 year solar cycle. And he concluded that uh, the 11 year solar cycle could depend by the influence, combined the influence of four planets, Venus, Earth, Jupiter, and Saturn. So he uh, um, uh, had this intuition, okay, he did not demonstrate anything, but he had this intuition that the oscillation in the sun could be somehow influenced by the only oscillator that we have, uh, that we have uh, in the solar system, so by the, the planets that go around with the sun and create some kind of harmonic signals. Indeed, if we study the 11 year solar cycle, the, the data that I showed you before, we see that there is a peak in around 11 years, but then we have a side peak here and here. This is 11.86 here, this is the Jupiter orbital uh, period, 
This is 9.98 years, so this is essentially the springtime harmonic between Jupiter and Saturn. So we have this kind of three peaks, where these two peaks, side peak, represent essentially planets. And so it seems that the 11 solar cycle is modulated by these effects, by this Jupiter Saturn. It is also possible to create a model by Venus, Earth, and Jupiter, which actually produces is a tidal model, which actually actually produce a 11-year solar cycle. So this 11-year solar cycle, you see uh, the black are the 11-year solar cycle, and the red is the model between Venus, Earth, and Jupiter. So it's pretty much uh, pretty much reconstructed 11-year solar cycle. So there are like, many ways to get this 11-year solar cycle in some in some region. By using just the first model, the one that uses Jupiter, uh, uh, Jupiter, the three harmonics between Jupiter, Saturn, and then the 11 year solar harmonic, it is possible to demonstrate that uh, the combination of those three harmonics produce a very long millennial oscillation, which actually well uh, fits the millennial climate oscillation. The black line is the millennial climate oscillation. Okay? In addition, the same model produced this oscillation at about 100-150 years, and this oscillation, if you look carefully at the data, you see that the temperature went up in correspondence of this uh, predicted maxima uh, of solar activity, and so and you see that there is this condition. And this is a zoom of this record, the same model produced oscillation 60 years, this is 60 years, 60 years, 60 year, 60 year, okay? So these are the 60 year oscillation that we see in the data, in the temperature data. Okay, now we are approaching this minimum solar activity around 2030, as also Roger showed in the earlier phase. So that is one way to look at the genes. Now let us study the wobbling of the sun. The wobbling of the sun is very important because it uh, Summarize all oscillations of the planets, okay? Put with all oscillations of the planets. In particular, let us look at the distance or at the speed of this movement. <coughs> so, if we study the, uh, we do a spectral analysis, a continuous spectral analysis of the speed of the sun and a continuous spectral analysis of the global surface temperature, something very interesting happens. The 60 year cycle of the temperature, and we see a peak in the sphere of the sun. This is the 20 year cycle of the temperature, and we see a peak in the sphere of the sun. We see a, 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 about 14 years cycle in the temperature, we see this 14 years cycle of the speed of the sun. We see this is the sunspot range, these are the uh, 11.86 and, and the 10 years essentially uh, tides between two percentages. And this is the signature of the 11 year solar cycle that is between these two, but it, it is uh, modulated between two sides. Then we found the harmonic the here at 9 years, which is actually lunar, lunar harmonic. And then the, 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 the planetary harmonic reappears, the 7.4, and this is the harmonic here in the speed of the sun. We have this harmonic here that is here, we have this harmonic here, this harmonic here that is here, and so on. So, this picture shows you that there is a, a, a very strong coherence, spectral coherence between the speed of the sun that depends on the, on the planets of the solar system and the global surface temperature variation. So, it's possible to put them together with these harmonics. And this is a comparison between the IPCC model predictions okay, with my models. This green curve is uh, just the harmonic signal made of the 1,000 year simulation, 115 year simulation, 6 year simulation, 20 year simulation, uh, 10 years, 10, 12 year simulation, 9 year simulation. You see, this is the model, and, and so we have this kind of behavior. According to this prediction, uh, the the, uh, the model would produce uh, at the most, by using the same, the same uh, emissions, will produce uh, a temperature below the two degree, the two degree. So we are relatively safe, uh, safe respect to this situation. So natural oscillation method, I'm going to this. This is a zoom of the same model, you see better this oscillation that reproduce very detailed uh, oscillation of the temperature, go ahead please. And this is uh, my prediction in 2011. So, how is Capeta 2011 model performing? 
Uh, my model for 2011 was uh, uh, published when the data were here, okay, were here, and then I produced this prediction, okay, at the time, and these are the IPCC projection in green, okay, they went up in like this, <laughs> okay, so uh, you can, uh, you can, uh, uh, I don't want to answer this question because there might be some conflict of interest, so, uh, but it seems, okay, it seems that my model is performing much better than the IPCC projection. Now I would like to use another, another thing, and it is the last paper that will be published soon, so what about the longer cycle, okay? So we're talking about the up to 1,000 year cycle, but there is another important cycle. It is the 2,300 year cycle that is known as the ALSAT, ALSAT cycle. ALSAT concentration that is seen in C14 record, very strong. In this new paper, I show you that this uh, cycle can be actually obtained by planetary harmonics in a very strong way. This is the oscillation of the planetary harmonics uh, that I will discuss uh, well, now, but I don't too much time. But just one minute, I okay, finish one, two minutes. And what is this? This is a, these are a, a wobbling, a study of the wobbling of the sun, essentially. This is the power spectrum of the sun. You see this outside oscillation here. This curve are the theoretical stable resonances, orbital resonances generated by Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. You see this cycle here, that is the Alsat cycle. You see this set of cycles, this is the Joseph cycle. This is you see the cycle here, which is here, which has the Gleisberg cycle. You see the sixth year cycle here, that are here, here, and you see sixth year. That there are these, 20 year cycle, there are others. So, all these cycles here that you find here, that you find here, are found in the planet or uh, solar record. And these are the stable orbital resonances. So, what can we say in this way? Now, it's finished. Please. Uh, go ahead. Stop it. Yeah, conclusion. Okay. So, uh, we have uh, this conclusion is that the planet has uh, important oscillations. These oscillations are characterized by specific harmonics which are limited to planetary harmonics. And uh, the temperature will be kept below uh, to, to, to Celsius warming, uh, uh, so there might be just uh, some adaptation policy to, to, to apply. And then uh, the last conclusion is this one. So this is what I believe that is happening. So there is periodic move to the planet from solar system generating a set of stable resonances that uh, are well known by geophysicists and solar physicists because are found in plasma and solar data. And these are all mechanisms that uh, suggest what is happening. So this set of resonances produce oscillation in solar, a solar wind uh, uh, oscillation, and then, and then this then is uh, oscillation in cosmic ray, in dust, uh, in interplanetary dust density, and this is the climate change oscillation. The next paper is from Eric John Eric Solheim from Norway. He will be talking about sea ice margin, sun and the planets. The sea ice movement is also impacted by solar system.
and truly that it happens. And the people that are involved is an interesting group. You see them on first long talk, uh, Paul Pedersen. He's studying waves, he's a marine biologist. He's right now up in the Arctic and he's drilling in the ice to see what is under the ice that, that can feed the big waves. Because what he discovered a few years ago, that big waves have come back north of Svalbard. I'll tell you about that. And that they haven't been there since, since 1750 to 1800. They dis disappeared around 1800, partly because of hunting, but also because of the ice came back. And it took about 200 years before they came back in the 1990s. A big surprise for the scientists. And the second person, Ole Hummel, he studies glaciers and he's out with his students at the moment inside glaciers in, in Norway. And the last person is a cybernetic person. He can analyze the data. And, and in the slide, myself, we have just published a paper this week, in fact, it came online. The influence of solar system oscillations on the variability of the total solar radiance. <coughs> what we are looking for are stable periods, stationary periods in the sun that will last for centuries. And I'll tell you about that a little bit, how we need it, but first to the ice. This is the ice more or less today in the north, the Arctic cap, and where it is dark on this. Uh, here. It means that this is thin ice. So the ice is not very thick here in, uh, near the North Pole, but it is not what Al Gore said in his Nobel laureate <laughs> <laughs> lecture, that it should disappear by 2014, yeah. seven years. It's still that uh, But what I will talk about is the ice edge, which is about here. And the waves are seen right up here, North Pole Svalbard, and that's the point. Yeah, that's uh, just a few days ago, and you see now, this is the ice, it's the, the red curve here is what the, what the uh, status of the ice in the north at the moment, between about 5 million square kilometers. But you see in 2012 it was much less, and the average is about this uh, curve here for 10 years. But also the definition is that the ice edge, edge, or what they call ice, is where it is more than 50% ice. So it's not a, not a fixed limit, it's a, a drifting ice which continues about 15% of ice to find the, the ice edge. It looks more like that. This uh, open water, you have to have a kayak to get uh, through, or some, some boats, or push uh, ice uh, away to get into that area. Ice, I should. But this is the ice. Oh, sorry. This is in, uh, go back. <coughs> ice age as it looks in the winter time. This is taken in February. And what we see here is uh, ice is solid here, and on top of that ice is clear. So if the sun had been high, it's reflecting. But of course in February the sun is not very high, it's not reflected at all, it's just on the horizon. This is between Greenland and Svalbard. But where the ice disappears, it's open, you have convection and you get clouds. So that's a very strong evidence of your convection model that we talked about here. Because here, here the water will evaporate and, and get clouds very quickly. And that's also what the, what the Eskimo do. The Inuits, they look for clouds and they can find the ice edge when they're moving to hunt. But this uh, here is the story of the ice for the last thousand years in the north. We had a big sheet of ice around 1700. In fact, in 1881, it was seen from the north coast of Norway, the edge of the ice here. This is the winter ice, that's the maximum ice. And even here, a few times, Inuits were coming to Scotland by their kayaks. They were hunting at the ice edge, and you can find in museums in Scotland uh, the gear. And also, you can tell a good lecture about this graph. But it's very, and, uh, and the cold died out 
because it takes too cold in the waters and you have the frozen tanks and, and so on. And of course the, the Nordic settlements disappear in, in Greenland. But what really drives it is a current. Atlantic water coming up at the coast of Norway, coming to the west coast of Svalbard, and one uh, it also goes into the Barents Sea here. So everything is related to this uh, inflow of water. And uh, the whale hunting started already around 1600, or before 1600, it was called Wales, north of Svalbard, and it's called the Whale Bay, and it was Dutch. Seaman that, that started this, very good sailors, but they had to have experts from Spain, from the Basque countries, to help them. And here we have everything here we have the way, here we have the polar bear, here we have the people in boats, and, and, and the big vessels that sail up. Must be very intentions to go up there in, uh, with the sailing ships. But uh, so this is painted before 1700, he died in 1708, so it is uh, late 1600 sometime. And by looking at notes or ships going on from the waves, the sea hunters and so on, there was a person called uh, named William. He made a historic map of where the ice age had been during the centuries, starting in 1769, 1866 and so on. And you see, his interesting conclusion was that it was north of Svalbard, and this is the maximum this is the maximum, not the minimum. This is in April. And this came in the yearbook of Polar Institute in 99. But of course, this is not politically correct. So it was censored in the sense. Three years later, year later, a new version came like this. And now we can tell a story that this is. Uh, seven, uh, 1866, 1966, and 1999. Now, it's moving north. They have forgotten that it was up here, 1776. Uh, right. So, uh, this is what I show about this. Um, but it's also interesting to, to make average in, in that. Because how it moved from 1850 to 1899 is much more than it has moved later. This is 1900, 1949, and this is 1950 to 2000. So this is what they call the Barents Sea, and the edge here is the interesting part. You see, it doesn't happen much on, on this side because of the west uh, the current coming up on the west coast of Svalbard. So already here we have information, and this is how it looked uh, last year, April, and here is what it was in. In uh, August. So, this is uh, what naturally happens nowadays in, in, in a one year. And I put in some meridian here, 76 to 82 degrees north. That's where it has varied during these 400 years. And um, this is how it looks today. Um, from this, we can have one number per year, per year, it tells us the average ice age location between Svalbard and Joseph's land. <coughs> it, it, it looks like this, you see it goes up to 82 degrees sometimes, and it goes down to 75, 76 sometimes. And of course, they're missing around 1700, almost 20 years. <coughs> it could be bad weather, it could be war in Europe, this is a lot of history behind this, that people couldn't come north to hunt. But anyway, when I looked at this curve first time, it looked, of course, what the sunspots tell us, the solar activity curve. When I look at this, we have a minimum around 1800, the total minimum, we have a minimum around 1650, 1700, the modern minimum, and there is a minimum around 1900. And you see all these features in this curve. So there could be some relations with the sun. <laughs> so then we started to look at uh, also the, sun, the solar open solar irradiance and we have the same pattern with a minimum around 1800 and so on. So of course then we start to compare. And we have this work of Sun Connolly Connolly a couple of years ago, where they took temperatures of rural China, Arctic Circuit, 
through the United States and made a temperature curve for all these uh, areas and an average curve for the northern hemisphere. And it looks exactly like the solar water radiance curve, as you can see here. So this is a good reproduction of the solar irradiance curve. So, of course, then we can do the same with the, the correlation between the solar irradiance and the location of the ice age. And we see the bit here. We follow each other. But the interesting point if you use this as a model uh, relation here, you get an excess, which is, I think, uh, very interesting because there is a very, very modest increase of one degree latitude in 300 years. And what can, how can that experience then? Yes, because the solar seven days in 400 years, which means that uh, the sun is closest, the earth is close to the sun in the winter time, and that moves into the colder part of the winter, making the winter shorter and the spring earlier. But this could be seen here, I think. Well, that's one uh, guess, but uh, maybe this is the first time this year. Yeah. <coughs> what we have done is something from, <coughs> first we take a um, a wavelength, a special coil wavelength. Each of these lines here is a period. <coughs> you have to be very careful. Okay. Okay. To explain. This is different periods. And you see there is a maximum of 1700 and it goes down. There are many periods in here. And we do an autocorrelation analysis to see which of these periods are stationary. This means that they don't change the time. Because then maybe we can say something about the <coughs> future. And here the next slide is the result for this. <coughs> because this is what uh, Nicola told about that the sun moves around. We can do the same for the solar movements. Here is the uh, correlation analysis for the sun. And we see here it's a period of 160 years, 64. There's one period here about, in fact, I can read the periods here, 84 years. And these are the two planets. This is Neptune, this is Uranus, 54 years. And we see about one year, this is 29 about. This is Saturn. And also to it comes in. So we see, this is how the, the solar system moves. The solar system, the sun moves because of the planets. But we see the same things here when we look at the age of the ice, 84 years. That's from here. And there is also a, a 164 years, it's much weaker. It's there. So there is a relation between the sun, sun's movement, caused by the planets and where the ice is in the north. And we have found the, well, the same with the uh, with, uh, with open solar irradiance. There, the 84 year is very strong. So they are all present in very different circumstances. So there must be a connection between the sun, the planets, and the ice age, and the solar open irradiance. How it works is, uh, of course, what we can discuss. But uh, it's the same with the relation, and that can tell us something about the future. Here I made just the first attempt to take the period of Saturn, Uranus, and, and uh, Neptune, and put into this curve of the Earth, and you see it fits pretty well. This is uh, just provisional results. We will work more on this. And um, maybe we have a result uh, of telling you sometime later. But the interesting point now is something happens outside the coast of Europe, northern Atlantic in this region. It's already cooling. This is the content in, in Giga Joe per square meter or something. It had a maximum in 2006 and it's goes down, 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 down in this to 800 meters. So 
it was already cooling outside the house of Western Europe. And the interesting point is that cooling comes from the bottom of the sea. It becomes colder, colder, colder in the bottom. It's not on the top. How is it to get there? And this is a temperature curve of the same area starting in 2004. And it's really going down from 8.8 .8 degrees to 7.8 here, one degree, and this is at a trajectory from uh, 59 degrees north, going across here, Puerto Rico. So it has really cooled one degree, and that's more than the heating since uh, the minimum in the 1850s. So we have a very cold partial of water outside our coast, and maybe that means something for the future. That the cooling is already here. So that's my conclusions. The ice almost to Scotland in the ice age. Oil booming, Arctic seas because of the waves, 1580. This ice in April 1769 and in April 2015. Ice is moving 500 kilometers south, 1780 to 1800. And if it does that right now, it may be a problem for people drilling for oil in the parts. <laughs> and the minimum. And then we find the same stationary theories in the ice age and this And they do it all the way Thank you. Enso variability. Enso means El Nino, Southern Oscillation, a very important climate event which seems to be increasing or raising the tem mean temperature of, for this year. And we are yeah. all claiming that this is due to CO2. Lots of things to learn. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. um, yeah. Yeah.
So my judgment uh, is, is I haven't calculated, but, but I think that the uh, random weather noise is responsible maybe for 5-10% of ENSO variability. And uh, uh, electromagnetic influences from the sound of ENSO is maybe 25-30%. And the rest is from, the strongest is from this uh, lunar perigee impulses. Next, please. Mm -hmm. And then I calculate the mean 
value. Uh, and I have a random set of all the, all the neurons uh, pitch like this. So here I have an uh, answer for cost or answer equation based on the artificial net, neural network. To read this, the real answer value is stopped in uh, 2016. And then, uh, Darker blue value is all the way from 1980 up to 2022. Yeah, okay. Here I have um, uh, zoom out this area from 2014 and to 2022. And we can see here that the red line is what I calculated in the neural network. And the green is the real answer value. You can see that it's pick up the recent uh, alenium, but it ha haven't uh, pick up this, uh, all the strength. And right now we are um, in September, and, uh, and you can see that the downward trend has uh, stopped right now. And the, the, the forecast of the climate model they use now is that uh, we we in the week planning and we have bottom up and it's, it's going to up, going up. But uh, my calculation is that it will be a deep planning in maybe February, March. And then we're going up to uh, more a new value, high value in early 2018. Uh, but uh, because uh, the heat in the Western Pacific has been depleted. Of course, we lost El Nino. I don't think it's going to be that high. <coughs> you can see that overall, up to 2020, we will have relatively high value of cancer. Next, um, yeah, I said this here. So we will have high values in the coming years of cancer. Here I have uh, making similar predictions earlier, but uh, the test period is shorter. So I have one for 2012, 2015, and you can see that it is uh, uh, almost uh, the, the recent. Uh, Because of all these forces, it's 
Kiedy lunar egy pasz, which is has a strong variability and the look very chaotic. So what I have the correlation is both to from lunar pergi on also is the delta also the David value. Hello. Yeah. The, the next speaker uh, is uh, Ms. Inrani Roy from Exeter University, right from the UK. She'll be talking about the whole works. Solar cycles, quasi-binary oscillation, and so variability, and influence all of this influencing the earth's Now, 
see is shown by the haze work and grace work and the shifting of the polar jet and feral cell and hadley cell is shown by the work of hay and Now, the negative sign shows there is a decrease in strength and positive sign shows there is an increase in strength. This is the work of Gray. It showed there is a warming in the tropical lower stratospheric temperature. It is very significant. And this is the observational work from Hay. This is the model work. The top panel is for planetology and the bottom panel shows during 11 years solar, maximum to minimum, there is a weakening of the Hadley circulation and weakening of the feral cell, as well as there is a movement of the subtropical jet towards the pole. Now in the atmosphere, at least some have lost atmosphere, we have not included mid-latitude of Pacific. For mid-latitude of Pacific, what happens? There is an influence in the addition of Pacific high and there is an influence in the trade wind. The influence in the allusion to one specific high is shown by Christopher Hamid. H and G, the influence in the allusion low and trading part, it is shown by regression and C1, G1 by Jerry Lee. Why it is super speed we have used? It is this same influence but through different mechanisms. The CD here is through dynamical mechanism and the top one is through radiative forcing, radiative forcing in the ocean. And this is known as well-known top-down solar bottom-up mechanism, C1 and C, D1. This is the work of Christopher and Hamid. During solar maximum to minimum, how, the change, how there is a change in the intensity of sea level pressure around the ocean level. The solar maximum years are shown by the, the circle and minimum years are shown by triangle. There is a clear shift from solar maximum to minimum years in the intensity of the sea level pressure in the Similar for the positioning of the allusion low and Pacific high. There is a shift in the position during maximum years to minimum years of solar level years. Now this is the result of regression. Interestingly, the, there is a very strong positive signal around the place of allusion low, around the part of Pacific equator oscillation. It is very significant. Subsequently, there is another signal, though weak in magnitude, but it is very significant and it can be responsible by some indirect mechanism to inside the trade wind proper with ELSO. The mechanism is still not good, but here is a very significant signal in the tropical mid Pacific. This is the bottom up mechanism of wind, solar bottom up mechanism. What it suggests that during 11 year solar cycle, more solar radiation through clouds in mid latitude of Pacific. And it causes increased latent flux, increased moisture convergence, and that also causes strengthening of the trade wind. Now we covered how sun is influencing the tropical lower stratosphere and how from the tropical lower stratosphere it comes all down to the troposphere. But polar vortex, polar vortex plays a very important role. Without polar vortex, we can't think that there is a, the sun can have much influence. Polar vortex plays a very strong role. How it influences? The polar vortex and intensification of polar jet, it is, it can be described by use usual mechanism of thermal wind balance. I will discuss much about that. And the sun is through the intensification of jet, there is a strengthening of the Antarctic oscillation as well as Arctic oscillation. This is the work by Baldwin and our result of regression. Baldwin's work showed that northern angular mode around 40,000 hectopascal level and jet hectopascal level, they are very similar in nature. Now,
It comes via well-known Dior Jackson circulation. Who proposed it? Kodera and Kodera Squad 2002. It suggests so. How it happens? During summer hemisphere, there is more solar heating compared to the winter hemisphere. Now, because of the more heating, due to balancing, there is a thermal imbalance relationship. It causes the polar jet in the northern region. But what happens during solar eleven year cycle maximum? Eleven year cycle maximum, the UV at 205 nanometer increases six percent from minimum to maximum years. What it causes? More ozone heating in the upper stratosphere. It alters the temperature, and subsequently it causes a change in strength of polar vortex. And if there is any strong polar vortex, the planetary waves that are propagating from the troposphere are all the way to stratosphere. They can't propagate to strong polar jet. They deposit their momentum in the polar side of the jet. It causes weakening of the blood vessel circulation. And as there is a weakening, there is a warming in the tropical water stratosphere. We have covered all the part of the sun, how it influences the stratosphere and troposphere. Now we include the dollar cube. What happens when you include the cube? For cube, the polar angular moves changes the sun. The angular it was with sun only positive, but for cube it is negative. And it is suggested by the result of regression. But before regression, I will tell you background why we did this regression. This is a very popular work by Larry Chin and Gandhi around 1992. It is a very popular work and very interesting work. That indicates there is a connection between sun, cubio, and polar stratospheric temperature in the North Pole. What they did, they plot solar flux in the X direction and stratospheric, upper stratospheric polar temperature in the Y direction. The vertical line separates solar maximum years to solar minimum years, and horizontal line separates one polar temperature to cold polar temperature. Now, cubio waste studies are marked by square. And these studies are marked by triangle. As you see from this plot, this quadrant, all the cubios are westerly. Here all the cubios are easterly, here all the cubios are easterly, and here westerly again. Now, what it implies? That easterly, cubio, and solar minimum, there is warm stratospheric upper top stratospheric polar temperature warm. For westerly, solar maximum it is warm again, but when it is easterly, though solar maximum, it is cold, and again it is cold for solar minimum when the cube is westerly. Now, compared this result, we have also included the result of Goldwitz. What they say? They say the perturbation in the tropical, high tropical polar stratosphere, it comes all the way down to the troposphere and influences the atmosphere, influences the atmosphere of the troposphere. Influences the atmosphere of the troposphere on the upper polar stratosphere. Combining these two results, we have included subsolar times cubio in the regression and how it influences the sea level pressure we wanted to see. This is the regression plot for sea level pressure. There is a clear signal of negative angular mode. This is the negative Arctic oscillation and it is the negative Antarctic oscillation. What this signal shows, sun into cubio, it shows that active sun, westerly cubio, and less active sun, easterly cubio, both trigger negative and number of features. Now, with the ocean part, nothing is complete. Now, here is the ocean complete part in the basic pattern of the This is the global ocean columnar belt, and the <coughs> ocean water is shown by range. There is a clear connection between mid latitude of Pacific to tropics of the Pacific. And there is a this strength, this, this uh, portion here you can control the strength of the tropical Pacific. Now, this is the water circulation, normal water circulation. What happens during normal circulation? There is a trade wind signal in the tropics. During cold union, when there is a strengthening of the water circulation, this trade wind is strengthened. When it is strengthened, it has an influence on the equatorial thermocline. This thermocline, there is a stress in the thermocline and it is uplifting the thermocline. And when the thermocline is uplift, uplifted, the cold ocean water, ocean water, it comes up in the basin and it covers all the eastern part of the basin as shown here. It is called cold equator basin. Then it shows that there is a water circulation and cold equator basin. 
Karmapal Shifti. It is all, all relative. And during that event, the shallow ocean current in this tropical vicinity, and it is also related to North Pacific warming. Now, as we discussed before, this is a plot that near temperature and thermal flow, the slopes are very strongly attenuated. And the convergence of the ocean water in the tropical vicinity, this is also highly connected with the sea surface temperature in the tropical vicinity. Now, we have covered the atmospheric part here. We have covered the ocean part here. And how the atmosphere and ocean are connected? It is shown by great gradients. A and O2 are usual energy mechanism. What is usual energy mechanism? We discussed how water circulation tends to and how are related. S is shown by this work. What it shows? It shows that ENSO causes intensification of polar gel and it also influences of tropical jet. And R shows that ENSO is influencing polar gradients. Now, G2 is our result of equation. Now, an interesting point that there is a strong <coughs> decrease in strength of shallow meridional overturning circulation around tropical Pacific up to 1950. And this strength has, this was a, though, though there is a decrease, but there is a modest intensification since 1998. And during the same period, it is true for guapa circulation and happy circulation. There is a more weakening for the guapa circulation and it strengthened again after 1998. Now we show that sound and ENSO connection was different during the intervening period. Here is the plot ENSO December, January, February versus transport number. During the intervening period 1958 to 1997, this plot is for the rest of the period. And so the maximum years are marked by Red square. What we see that all the points where the sunspot number is above 80, it is cold even side of the ensue. But it is not the same during the intervening period 1958 to 1997. It is completely different. But it doesn't mean that active sun can influence sunspot sea surface temperature in tropical vicinity, though overwhelmed by strong innate ensue variability during no solar period. And another point is that this change in ocean and atmospheric circulation during climate change period is related to modified sun and sun behavior. Now in the whole work, we have also now included the part, this last few decades of last century, when it is called the so-called climate change period. And it is shown by red dotted line. Why, how it's changed? We have included UGW, that means weakening of the strength of heavy circulation, weakening of water circulation, weakening of shallow meridian and water, water overturning circulation. This is the work by these people. They have shown that there is weakening. And V1, V2, V1 and V2, the water strength, if it is reduced, then it affects the ENSO and thermocolloid shifting. It is the usual ENSO mechanism. And V1 is our result of, the result of regression. X and Z, X and Z means there is an influence in the trade wind and in the addition of the world. This is the interesting work. Why are we interested? Because as we discussed earlier, there is a very strong solar signal in the Pacific, in the part of northern Pacific, the part of Pacific decadal oscillation. It has weakened during the interval. <coughs> and the trade wind signal that was seen during earlier period, it is not seen in the later period. Now, there is also, during the intervening period, there is also warming in the tropical East Pacific. What is the, is the warming? And if we plot the solar 11 year cycle, there is a complete, there is 11 year matching, signal matching. But it is not true during the 
picture you have presented. And this is the summary of the whole work. That means we discussed the effect of sun in troposphere. The effect is different when QBO is included. And why true quantification of solar signal was so difficult. And finally, this is the paper. If someone is more interested to know more about the details, this is the paper. assume that there are lots and lots of questions, lots of issues have been discussed in this session. You are number one. <laughs> Peter Gill. I guess my question is for Per Strandsberg, very, very largely, is he about? Back, yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, the question is, um, you came to the conclusion that the NZ variability was about 70-30 gravitational as against magnetic. Um, I wondered whether you have any thoughts about the, the actual uh, mechanism for the magnetic bits, whether it's uh, magnetic and hydrodynamic driven or what. Just put some thoughts whether you've done anything on, on that. No, not really. I, 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 um, I optimized uh, the parameter of, of magnetic variables. Yeah, some people have suggested that it could be a magnetic hydrodynamic effect. I just wondered if you looked at it. Magnetic hydrodynamic. Magnetic hydrodynamic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. On, on, on the inside there. Yeah. Well, on the flow. On, on the flow within the answer. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I would just to look at it. Okay. That, 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 okay. Whatever you did, a wonderful show. <laughs> Thank you. And the ENSO has taken a big lap forward with your work. Um, hello, I'm Michael Purvis. I'm, I'm not a professional academic, so excuse um, if the question doesn't make sense. But it's for um, Dr. Scafetta, please. And um, I, I noticed that you had an alternative model uh, with interesting results, but I wasn't sure whether there was um, any physicality um, underlying it that's meant to explain why the model works so well. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. 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 yeah, actually I have uh, several papers where I propose a physical mechanism, so I believe that there, uh, we need to look at two kinds of mechanisms. One is uh, gravitational effects, uh, and the other one is uh, electromagnetic effects. So, about the gravitational effects, how can the planets influence the sun from a gravitational point of view? The critic uh, is that uh, the planets are too far, so the tides, uh, the gravitational tides, uh, seems to be too small. And this has been the classical uh, critique against this uh, hypothesis. However, I have a paper where I uh, show that uh, very likely the sun is working as a amplifier of the weak gravitational tide. The, the, the simple reason is that the sun is uh, an atomic bomb, okay? And uh, so, and uh, that is exploding continuously. The, what the gravity does uh, is essentially modulate uh, the uh, luminosity production and uh, there is an equation that relates the gravitational forcing with uh, the uh, uh, luminosity production. They say that uh, the, the for gravitational forcing will be amplified by one million times. Okay? Therefore, uh, the, therefore uh, the sun may be amplified the signal from a gravitational point of view. The electromagnetic point of view is also very important because the position of the planets, the planets have also big magnetosphere around, so that they will change the magnetic effect of the heliosphere and influence the solar wind. The solar wind will influence then the cosmic ray income and also the dust in the planetary dust. Then uh, cosmic ray and the planetary dust can form clouds and on the Earth and therefore climate change. So we have several papers on this issue. Thank you. Thank you.
Did I forget one? I didn't see you. I have a question to Indrita and it's an impressive amount of models and models variables like Enso, North Atlantic Oscillation, Southern Oscillation Index, Antarctic Oscillation, Arctic Oscillation. But I wonder if you have ever uh, uh, read anything about from Professor Marcel Leroux, who called the concept mobile polar high, enormous cool air masses that come from uh, Arctic or Antarctic, and sometimes um, cover, for example, half of South America. And these are real phenomena. Are they included in your models in any way? I'm trying to run. <laughs> yes, I have not included those work. Yes, I will look into those papers. Yes, interesting. Okay, Professor Jefferson. I think you will get your chance. <laughs> I'll assure you. My question and comments directed to ask Dr. Pescapetta. I believe in keeping things simple. You talked about uh, IPCC climate models, but the IPCC strict assessment stated that 111 out of 140 models that were regarded as relevant have been basically wrong in any state in this world. We have had uh, Sir John Houghton, Sir Chairman of the Big One, saying that solar variability is completely relevant except for molecular nuclear cycles and the nebulosity. Nobody bothers to explore the experience of editorial reviewers and IPCC assessments to discover how the whole process has been distorted. So can't we keep it simple and somehow other expose, and I've done all these things by the way for 20 years with IPCC, why can't we expose these fundamental weaknesses in the process? Uh, particularly, uh, say, if the IPCC itself said the 111 out of 140 climate models that they regard as relevant, in fact, it would be wrong already. Hmm. Nicholas? Yeah, I agree. So when we talk about the IPCC, it's, a, it's a great to understand that it's not just a, a scientific uh, group, it's a political group. The problem is that uh, in the 2000s, uh, there was this hobby stick uh, uh, graph uh, about the temperature during the, the uh, 1,000 years. And the hobby stick gave the impression that the climate models were correct. And then uh, all politics uh, had built on that uh, information. The problem is that now we know that the data of hobby stick is wrong, and therefore the models are wrong, everything is wrong, but the politics uh, is mm -hmm. now involved in economics, uh, and so money money is that important. Yeah. But besides within practice, <laughs> the discovery of what both Carpetta and Jan uh, um, show, I think that, that the, the solar influence is undoubtedly there. And that is one of the things which are at stake now. You cannot have the fit which you have if, if it's not solar real. And the thing you did, that is <coughs> just precisely to the evidence, I think. And uh, uh, therefore, this has taken an enormous step forward because now so many are showing seemingly completely different angles. So the sun is there. Then that the solar effect doesn't agree at all with IPC is another thing. And those things have to be discussed. But today we are exploring the sun. Is it there? And both of you showed beautifully, yes. And of course, where we Strandberg showing the step with Enzo. Thank you very much for that. So, sorry, yeah, I have to go back to the okay. central team. Um, that was an introduction, I thought. Thanks, thanks very much. Um, yeah, I've got two questions to on. First of all, to Indra, in, 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 I don't know how much of that, but anyway, in, in, in drone, I've got that one. Okay, um, you talked a lot about 11 years, but the main weather signal and temperatures in the world is 22 years. 
Now, I think what you're doing there is very important because um, you're basically extending the works of um, the Litzker and Van Loo. Now, whether actually we've done a lot of work on this, and this is completely unpublished, but we'll stick this graph up later um, on, the, on the wall, where well, if you measure the... For any data set, uh, you can have a bunch of correlation between rainfall and geomagnetic activity, okay? Uh, and, and you can put these on a, on a plot where you've got your 22-year hail cycle, the phase of that, and your QBO cycles. And if you divide all that data then, and this is for a single month of the year, which one's April, into El, El Nino on and El Nino off, you find very strong patterns appear. Uh, red meaning positive correlation and so forth. And furthermore, you find that these patterns are stronger in near the North Pole. There's Iceland and here's one for, for um, Greece. So it, it shows that there's a whole complicated connection involving magnetic effects in the polar sure. regions and so forth. Uh, yes, I did have another one to no, no, we, 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 we have one more there. Uh, yeah, we have done a recent work on solar geomagnetic index on sea level pressure. And what we found that QBO times solar geomagnetic effect that gives stronger signal that's than sunspot number times Q. And that is published paper 2016. It is giving stronger signal in the polar north pole. It is much stronger than what I showed here using the sunspot number. And geomagnetic index, it is a combination of sunspot, it is a same cycle like sunspot number and also it is solar high stream index, solar, solar speed. It is also to combine it together, geomagnetic A index is constructed. But sunspot number cycle, it shows more connection as we showed, indirect connection, though not direct, to El Nino. But in the polar area, the geomagnetic index is getting much stronger than sunspot number. So what do you say to Sternberg's very wonderful contribution? Well, that bears wait, 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 what did you say to him? Please, because he has no new material. Yeah, you can, you can give me the light. I'll go through this material. I have not. Because it is a general, you talked about South America, but I didn't consider the regional part. part. But with the, with the geomagnetic magnetic effect, we found regional influence around the Baltic Ocean, around the Europe, when it is lagged for two years. This is a published paper, 2016. Roy I published paper. There is a, if we take, take the lab for two years, then in the European region, for geomagnetic index, it is giving stronger relation than sunspot number. Some studies show that as or high, the sunspot is giving much stronger, but geomagnetic is not polar region, is giving much stronger yeah. than sunspot number. Perhaps some other time discussion. I think there are a couple more questions. But yes. <coughs> no, yeah. I have a question, please, maybe for Bert Hamburg. I'm no scientist. But could there be any uh, influence of the submarine volcanic activity in the Pacific Ocean? Petrusiampa, do you want to answer it? No. You are. We, we have another. We, and uh, of course, you would answer it. I know that. The submarine volcanism, which is the dominant volcanism on Earth, because it's under the water, does not have much of a direct effect on climate. Right. Part of what I'm going to talk about this afternoon is that it's the, it's the subaerial volcanoes that have a major effect on climate. Very good answer. <laughs> uh, Benny Kaiser from the Global Warming Policy Foundation. Um, obviously, the first part today was about solar activity and its uh, effect on the terrestrial climate. And we are now in a situation where um, we basically have two competing um, theories of climate change. Uh, one that is part of the kind of uh, mainstream consensus theory that it's mainly the warming is mainly driven by CO2. And then an alternative theory that suggests that the solar activity or inactivity is a much stronger uh, factor in climate change than generally believed. Now, 
my question is twofold. The first is, um, we've heard in the last couple of years a number of solar physicists suggesting that the uh, solar minimum, the, the uh, decline in solar activity, will have a noticeable uh, cooling effect, and there are predictions that uh, low temperature will come down rather than go up. And my question is twofold. The first is, when will we notice that? Will it be 10 years or 20 years? And the second is, if it doesn't happen, um, are the skeptics open <coughs> to change their mind and accept that the solar activity hasn't such a strong impact on the climate? Okay, that's uh, to several of us. I can just give you a few notes. The first one, it started already in 1997, according to Easterbrook. Mr. Book is a wonderful scientist, having experience in the field and doing it. Then several of us, not least the, uh, in uh, pattern recognition in um, physics, this, we, we said that yes, it will come in, in about 2013, uh, 40, 50, and today um, Scafetta gave improved data on that, improved data. Then in, the, in your conference, your conference uh, volume, you can see the, the map which uh, Jan-Erik Solheim and his group presented, where, where we can see the yellow is going up, the blue line is, so to say, the variability, just continued as a variability. And then the other is going down. What we today have shown, have given, is a very strong step forward in that sun solar variability from the planetary is a driving force. And your two to it is just out of the question that you can get such such uh, mm -hmm. result if it's not driving. It's perfect. Then what it means with respect to to the what we think overestimate from IPCC. That's another thing. That we are scientists here discussing our data, presenting it, and after discussion the last day, then with respect. It is Michael Jefferson and me, we say we, when we debate we have to do it with respect, because then it's different opinions. But it's a very, very vital difference, because these things are based on, in your case, observational things in the field. And he's a fantastic um, science study of the analysis. The other is models, and the model have generated statistics, and they go up like this. And that's the difference. Is anybody else which, that must be my answer. Not, answer the what was the other question? Well, maybe we have the answer, what is the question? <laughs> We are eating into our <laughs> <laughs> The question is simple. If the prediction is based on the theories and the data presented today, don't come true, do you change your mind? We change our mind. Yeah. 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 That's, a, that's, that's an interesting question. A scientist, I mean, a scientist is always prepared to change. Always. That is the criteria of a scientist. And that's why we are here, because we are already turning every little stone. I'm a geologist, I really literally turn the stones. Because you want to see if there is something hidden. And you are immediately ready to change. But the more we have turned our stones, the more solid it has become, this solar thing. When we did this, of course, we were out at the edge. Now it's much more... Uh, being, so it's a different. Then the other group, which is driven by, I think, maybe other uh, forces than scientific reality, or what they, what they have as their scientific reality. They are very stuck, and it's very hard to change, and they may be never do. And if they do, don't change, it's not very scientific. But look at Michael Jefferson, for example. He began in IPCC. He's, he always questions things. 
always good, and we will have it at the uh, last discussion, because this is science. The other thing, when you are closing your ingesting, this is how it is, and this, you start to punish people. We were not allowed to have this lecture in, uh, in uh, uh, University College of London, because it was controversial. What's controversial is the thing we have been saying. It's just normal science. It's normal science. But there you start to enter into two schools, two ways of saying it. So, uh, I don't, we are ready to change, but we have no reason to change, because the more we turn the stones, the more solid it becomes. And that's why we are here today. The other side, they, they, I don't know how they should, but we did discuss it the last day. Yeah. yeah. But here's the thing. The, I'll be brief. Um, yes. Personally, in scientific activity, I've changed my mind many, many times. And as a result, we are now able to predict, you know, the formation of tropical storms, the detailed timing of uplicks in geomagnetic activity, and their consequences to the weather, and the graph on the back. So, if the data shows it, I will certainly change my mind. But you know that democracy is in the canyon, not in the vote. By that, I mean we are dealing on the other side with fraudulent data. Namely, they're fiddling the data on a daily basis in order to, in order to pretend the present is warmer and the past is cooler. If we can use satellite data, yes. And if the calling we predict it doesn't happen, then we will have to say we were wrong and look for something else. But it's not CO2, because the CO2 story mm. itself has failed. And I repeat the challenge here that <laughs> Professor Sir Brian Hoskins must come forward with evidence of his plans. Okay, well, I'll say this. And, and just uh, to answer Benny, my answer to Benny is I, on, on my own research, my prediction is that the global temperature won't fall very much between now and 2050, but regionally we could see some very strong effects. So I think in Northern Europe we could see a very, some very, very cold winters and a big difference in climate as people live it in reality. The global average temperature might, might only go down 0.2 centigrade, but the reality of what people experience as climate in, in the north could be a very, very strong effect by, by 2050. Okay. I think at least we are approaching some solar minimum. It's a lot of all of us up to, up to the sun to the side. However, it's 10 minutes after time. This lunch now, the lunch is on your own. Please try, be, try to be back at 1 o'clock if you want to hear the really excellent news for the first paper and after. Okay, so we resume the session at one. Um, I'll start off probably broadcasting then. Thank you for watching. <coughs> Welcome back to the uh, Climate Change Conference. Afternoon session. Still has his own company, I understand. 
And if you talk about the deep ocean, what happens in the deep ocean, which is a very interesting yeah, place, very which we know very little very about. Simple. Please, Martin. Thank you very much. Well, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm actually born just over the river here in East Ali, uh, 1945. Okay, um, good afternoon. And uh, I'm going, my other title for this talk is Ignored 73%. Um, I'm talking about the second surface of the planet. And I'm going to be your Captain Nemo for 15 minutes. Because there, there's not many of them. Did you know, for example, that 25% uh, of the Earth's uh, heat vents through the seafloor along chimneys like this? These were modeled in 2009 by Pomo and um, we have only discovered and uh, seen a handful of them. Okay, the home planet. And they are trying to scare us. Let's <laughs> see what I wrote during lunch. Um, I've got, um, the alarmists are trying to scare us about ocean acidification, OA. So what is the true situation? We don't know. Because the true situation is hidden. And did you know what the average uh, water depth on the Mykeen is for the total planet? This is my boat, by the way, in Bonn, south of uh, Cape, south Cape of, uh, of Norway. What is the average depth of water on the Mykeen globally? It's 3.6 kilometers. Believe it or not, 3,600 meters. We come back to that soon. So the surface of the Earth, where we live, is wide. Changes constantly from Viking age till now. For the climate, the water is the joke, and you know that because of late and all that stuff. I've been for 38 years in a company called Starter, a very kind, nice company to work with, because I could more or less do my own research. And not being an academic, rather an engineer, I could publish without using my help. I wasn't in the academic system. So you can visit my site on ResearchGate and see what I've published. Um, this is my favorite, the ROV, remotely operated vehicle, because with that you can go and look at things on the sea and not. This is the Pisces 5 underwater vehicle, which is manned. I went down to 200 meters in that in 1985. And these are some of the survey ships that I've been using over those 38 years. This is what a sea looks like, a vent looks like on the seafloor. This is the second surface here, 77 meters deep in the North Sea, and you have a methane, a methane vent or a hydrocarbon vent. Methane, ethane, propane, butane is coming out of that naturally. And there are thousands of them on the continent. We call them cone vents because of the temperature levels, but they have pH along with them. So here we are on the, on the second surface. Just show we're back now. Um, inspecting a pipe. We have lots of pipe, pipes uh, to the UK, to the, to the continent with gas. This is my home, um, 77 days per year or something like that for 20 years. And this is my toy that I can use more or less freely if I like to. And this is what we do when we take samples at seeps. 
This is at 723 meters water depth. And guess what the temperature is of mid Norway at 723 meters? What is the temperature of the water? Minus 0 0.0 degrees centigrade. It's sub zero. So, what are we picking up? We are picking up methane derived orthogenic carbonate from this rock here. We have two ROVs in the, in, the, in the face at the same time. So, we're playing with two ROVs here. We're using one to go the other. Very rare occasion. And this is what the seed looks like without evolution. There are no bubbles coming through here. But you can see the discoloration of the seed floor due to an oxic environment. So when you have a seed, the, the water goes anoxic. And you get, then you, um, you get the bacterial mass, and you get um, tube worms growing to feed from the <coughs> ethane, ethane, propane, butane coming up. That's food for them. So you have um, these organisms which are chemosynthetic. And while we were there, we got another beast coming in from the right. What do you think this is? Is it a crab? Yeah. Uh, we thought it was crab. It's a giant pycnogamy. This side is, is a spider. Deep water spines. It's got eight legs. <laughs> That's a cool. um, okay, we have to go on. Um, where you find cold seeps, you find um, methane-derived orthogenic carbonate growing on the seafloor, carbonate rock. You find often ebullition, and you can take samples of the bubbles with, uh, if you have the right equipment to analyze the gases. You find reservoirs of, of shadow gas being pumped through the seafloor during the tidal cycle. So it's a dynamic system. Here you have wolf fish, red fish. This is in the UK sector of the North Sea, not far from the Fortress. Um, Erwin Suss published this in 2010. It shows you the uh, event of cold seeps that we know of. The, the red ones, and those that we infer. And they are located along the plate boundaries for the most part. Along many of these places we also have gas hydrates, uh, which form due to the seepage of methane from deeper down. Okay, what did the Vikings know? They knew about, they about the Kraken, Strange creatures, creatures uh, suddenly appearing up from nowhere. And they knew about the Midgard serpent. What was the Midgard serpent that went uh, uh, around the whole earth? Well, we can just guess. It's this. <laughs> and it's 55,000 kilometers long. What is it? It's a spreading ridge. Did you know that no part of the ocean floor is older than 250 million years? Why? Because it subducts below the continents. It dives down and gets lost into the mountain after so and so long. This is where all the vents are. And if you believe that there is one hot vent, every kilometers along the spreading axis, then there must be 55,000 vents, and each of them producing about one megawatt of heat. Wow. Did we know about that 20 years ago? No. When were the first vents, hot vents, seen by man? 1977. When was the first chemosynthetic organisms found? Two years later, because it took the biologists two years to get out there and look at what the geophysicists found on the seafloor. Why? Because the biologists were sitting with their legs up 
They had discovered everything on the planet that was worth seeing, and they had museums stacked full of the descriptions until the chemosynthetics came along. So that was last century's biggest discovery, the hot lens. Okay, this is a profile across, uh, for example, the Atlantic or the Pacific Ocean. Uh, the average depth is 3.6 kilometers, maximum depth is about 11.5 kilometers. The PCP here is where water stops boiling because of pressure. If you heat it up from below, uh, uh, beyond this uh, boundary, it goes super critical, which is a new phase. It's the fourth phase of water. It's not vapor, it's not liquid, something in between. It's got the density of 0.3, supercritical water. So, what is the temperature down here? It's 1200 degrees. The mantle is 1200 degrees. And look at the thickness of the oceanic crust, which is 60% of the Earth's surface. It's only 8 kilometers, and it varies between 0 kilometers at the spreading centers and 8, 9 kilometers. The continental crusts are up to 200 kilometers thick. They don't feel the heat from the internal, but the ocean does. When NOAA, in 2009, discovered this thing off Samoa, they said, wow, this is a curiosity. It's not. It's a basic fact. This is going on all over the place where you have heat coming up. So these are the hydrothermal systems. When you have a big uh, temperature gradient of 1000 degrees per kilometer, you have a forced convection. It has to be forced. Because you are boiling or you are supercritical, uh, you are turning the water supercritical. And up it goes. Has nowhere else to go. And then it has to pull in more. So you have this fantastic cycle going on. And you get uh, these structures which are called chimneys, hydrothermal chimneys. This one is called Godzilla, it's uh, 60 meters high. It's boiling on the top and it's super critical down here <coughs> because it's just crossing the boundary between um, where the water stops boiling. This one has supercritical water inside because you have a black smoker and you want to have all the particles coming out. As the supercritical water hits the ocean water, which has 2 degrees centigrade, it condenses into normal water and it uh, precipitates all the minerals it's carrying. This is a cross section of the earth. The inner core is solid, outer core is. Uh, more plastic, and you have a, a well, and we don't want to go into that. But this is the Pacific Ocean here. That's the oceanic crust. Here is Africa continent. Here is South America continent. This is subduction. This is subduction where you have collision between the plates. One goes underneath the other, and one goes over. <coughs> so this is the system we are talking about. And the ocean is above that, of course. Uh, the Red Sea, which is about 2,000 kilometers long between Arab Arabia and Africa, is perhaps the most anomalous sea in, in, in the world. Why? Because you have spreading going on in the center of it. You have hydrothermal systems going on, and they are producing salt because they are using seawater. And seawater consists of about 3%, up to 15% here, of salt. So every time it goes down to the supercritical, the salt precipitates. And it, it has to be stored, or it's pushed up. We are trying to figure this out, what's going on. So that's what I'm doing research on right now. It was discovered, um, sorry, it was discovered. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah. Look at the pH here. 
This is a 2,000 uh, meter in the Red Sea, pH 5.9. That's because we have a hydrothermal system going. <laughs> pH 5.7, pH 8.4 as you come into the normal Red Sea water. This was discovered in 1948 by the Swedish expedition Albatross. The chlorine we have here is 15%. The temperature is nearly 70 degrees centigrade. So the people taking the, the bucket up to the surface, they burnt their hands. They said, oh, this is hot. What is that water doing down there? We have figured it out now, uh, but uh, we have still a far way to go to understand it. So the Red Sea is over here. And these are mid-ocean rich, unconfirmed hydrothermal systems. These are the confirmed hydrothermal systems in red. Some of them are active, some of them are dead. There are thousands of them, and we have only seen a few. Oh, sorry. We didn't pursue that, yeah. Um, then we have the undersea volcanoes, which my next uh, colleague is, uh, uh, next people is talking about. This is uh, Bay of Plenty in uh, Northern Ireland, uh, New Zealand, the Perma Lake Ridge, which uh, uh, they are studying and drilling into. This is the Brothers Volcano with a, a plume above. And it's producing salt also. Sorry. Uh, this one. Yeah. Now, let's look at the, the carbonate compensation depth in the Pacific Ocean versus the Atlantic Ocean. The depths are different. And why is that? It's because of the hydrothermal systems, the ring of fire uh, that is going on in the, in the Pacific Ocean. Finally, 50 meters below surface, this is Scott, 2008. This is the ocean deserts of the earth where you don't where you hardly have any production in the surface and the pH is very low. This is the North Atlantic. So it's not as we are told. So here is your take home message. We know very little about variations in ocean alkalinity, locally, regionally, and globally. Therefore, ocean acidification is, well, I've got one equation. OA equals BS. <laughs> <laughs> Part of the problem of ocean acidification, the fact that the hydronium ion concentration says nothing about the negative ions and its source, because people uh, have often associated the uh, so called silication or reduced alkalinity with uh, carbon, or carbon dioxide. When, when it rains, what is the acid? What is, what is the pH of rainwater? 5.4. So when it rains, the surface of the ocean becomes okay. accidental.
And we will talk about subaerial and submarine <coughs> volcanic eruptions and climate variability. Thank you. What I'm going to say, I hope, is not so controversial. It's just based on observations. <laughs> Some of you may remember this event, 2010. A volcano, I could pronounce, so I call it E15, 15 letters afterwards. And it led to the wettest year of record in Slovakia since 1881 because of the cyclone tracks bringing rain clouds. Thank God, I'm a geologist. <coughs> I'm in my retirement. I have moved to the present day because it's the most exciting age. The satellite images since 1980s. You can Google and you can find if you look at the newspapers and you can find new islands created by some of the eruption. Thanks to Benny for reminding me about the blog. I didn't include it in my extended extract because I wanted it to be a surprise to the audience. I'm going to explain the blog as my summary eruption. But first of all, I'm going to give you a short introduction. I think I missed one slide, maybe. Yeah, I'm the first one. Yeah. Pull back. Pull back. Pull back. Pull back. Bring it away from the past. My plan is to give you a short introduction. <coughs> I was missing this slide. Then I'm going to use a case study of a subaerial eruption and then a case study of a submarine eruption, which later actually became subaerial. And then I'll draw up some main conclusions. Okay. So this is the introduction, but you've seen it already. We are in the information age. The main applications are shown here. Farming, climatic variability, it may even help model. Nothing can help more than <laughs> We are helping them with our observations. I think the observations, the satellite images, are available since 1980s. We have weather disasters, media reports, which are in abundance. And of course, we have a small group of people working on aviation safety. And these are the people actually tracking the eruption clouds short term after the eruption. For those of you who are not geologists, maybe, the BEI for explosive volcanic eruptions. But these are only for subaerial eruptions. The scale is from 0 to 8. And you can see Pinatubo, the biggest eruption in the past 50 years, has a scale of 6. And I have shown here about BEI 2. Usually, you can see regional impacts of weather, climate, already detectable. And I've been interested mainly in modern eruptions in the, since 1980. When the eruption occurs, I try to track the eruption cloud and then relate this to severe weather events. Press the second time. The reason why I'm interested in volcanoes originates from Hong Kong, where I was born. These three eruptions stood out in my mind even before my retirement. Echo in 1963, El Chichang in 1982, and Pinatubo in 1991. And the reason why is this. Echo turned out to be the driest year on record in Hong Kong. And El Chichang turned out to be the second wettest year on record in Hong Kong. Pinatubo erupted middle of June and it turned out to be the 11th driest in Hong Kong. I think there's a good relationship with volcanic eruption because Hong Kong sits at the margin of the biggest continent in the world. It's the wind shift. Onshore wind will bring rain. Offshore wind will bring drought. That's the reason. 
classification of volcanic eruptions into three types. I won't have time to read through the details, but I hope this PowerPoint will be available to anyone interested. Based on various people's studies, as well as my own, we've come up to this generalization for sub-area sub eruption on land, for submarine seafloor eruption, and of course there's another type, it's a mixture of one and two. Initially, they may be submarine eruptions, but once they appear above sea level as an island, you have some area of eruption. <coughs> complications there. My example of sub area eruption is a uh, chosen, it's actually been a two -ball. Unfortunately, uh, well, you can just see the bottom of this EI6. Most people have probably forgotten already the eruption occurred at a time when a typhoon was passing Luzon. Two days before the eruption, it started to be categorized as a typhoon. So where's black, this symbol. And at the day of the eruption, the typhoon reached this point just before hitting Luzon. And just after the eruption started, it dissipated into a tropical depression. Quite, in, quite interesting, I think. <coughs> so this is uh, NOAA, ADHR image. And my reason suggesting that 1991, even though the eruption was middle of June, was a global drought year. It's the water vapor transfer from the troposphere into the atmosphere because of the hot air and also the typhoon in <coughs> white. The Pinatubo eruption just started here, as in blue. This is the eruption cloud during the Pinatubo eruption. The next image, you can see that the cloud from the eruption becomes much bigger. It actually reaches a maximum of 55 kilometers. It's the battle of giants. The typhoon cloud was much lower. So enormous transfer of water vapor to create atmospheric rivers in the sky. Water vapor redistribution. This is actually a space shuttle image over South America. So there was a global temperature drop of about half a degree centigrade. So based on the aerosol study, especially sulfur dioxide, when it was oxidized into sulfuric acid, uh, each holding time of about 35 days. Okay, we'll move on to a summary eruption, which is more exciting. The ones I've studied are quite limited. Uh, El Hero in the Canary Islands, this is already published, and I've actually explained whether events around the North Atlantic Basin, some of you may have seen it. A more recent one is Hunger of Tonga, much shorter eruption, it only lasts just over a month, but the exciting one is the last one, which I'm going to talk about a bit more, the Shinoshima of Japan. It lasted almost two years. And I think we can explain the block using this eruption. <coughs> Some of you may have heard of it, off the North Pacific. It's the switching on of hot seawater causing ocean and air circulation <coughs> changes. So this is an image that I was able to find thanks to the information age. So the island in late November appeared already. So it must have been going on even before, except we have no records of it. And this is another image taken in December the 8th. So already you can see a separate island from the original Nishinoshima island, which is an old volcano. Well, we have all these images available from NOAA that we can play around with. Anyone can download this and look at images and <coughs> for the world's ocean. So it's quite exciting. 
can see the block, you can see Nishinoshima, which started to form an island in November. Already you can see the cooler water, which is in blue, the warmer waters goes to red, orange. And this is actually from, from Wiki side. This is the block. By January, it has already developed into a fair size. I think I've got a table here. This is my summary table. If I can quickly go through that. November 2013, the summary eruption created a new island. The initial block was 800 kilometers wide and 91 meters deep. In December, the island reached 5.6 kilometers square and reached a height of about 25 meters above sea level. And in February 2014, thanks to the Argos network, etc., temperature of the block was already 2.5 degrees Celsius above normal for this part of the world. So it's regional warming. And then by June 2014, the name block was coined by a Washington scientist and Australian scientist Nicholas Paul. And the size has already increased to more than double. 16,000 kilometers by 16,000 kilometers and 91 meters deep, still the same depth. And it spread to the coast of North America with patches on the last <coughs> year, Korea, California, and Mexico. In, by December 2014, the island that is now 2.3 kilometers <coughs> in diameter and 100, 110 meters above sea level. And it's known as the year without winter in the western North American coast. And the first mass bleaching event of Hawaii was ex used to explain. Uh, this is from a wiki page. And since January, during the period January to August 2015, we have episodic eruptions with lava flows still coming out from the volcano. And the block was thought to persist until early this year, which is quite interesting to the change over to the Ladina. Well, some supporting evidence, an image of sea surface temperature anomalies, 1st of September 2014, and I've inserted the ocean circulation diagram here to try to explain why we have warm water patches above normal in different parts of the North East Pacific coast. So this is uh, near to the Peruvian coast where normally you get the warm water associated with El, El Nino. A later image shows this actually develops slowly. The impact of the bog, I believe, is quite far-fetching. I'm quite a logical person. I don't, if you switch on hot water in the northern part of the Pacific, we basically have two large bathtubs in the world's ocean. One is the Pacific, which is the biggest. The Atlantic is a smaller bathtub. What will the hot water in the northern part of the Pacific do to the southern ocean? And I think you can see Based on the timing, September is autumn time in the Northern Hemisphere, while in the Southern Hemisphere, it is spring, going to summer. So what will the cooler water try to do? I think it will try to move northwards to neutralize this anomaly, I believe. Which seems a bit logical to me. The sea surface temperature anomalies during June 29th, after the wolf eruption on Galapagos, which is right in the middle of the El Nino warm water area. This is the lava flow here, the final straw helping the hot water to be even hotter because the lava entered the ocean for that simple reason. My conclusions, quite simple. Subaerial and submarine volcanic eruptions are underestimated 
natural causes of climatic variability. Volcanic eruptions may be the cause of air and ocean circulation changes, extreme weather events, and if you are brave enough, even polar sea ice changes. The release of volcanic aerosols, including water vapor into the atmosphere, is important in regional global climatic variability. Possible contributors to the strong 2015 El Nino include the Nishinoshima eruption, the Hunger eruption, and the Wolf eruption. These are just some of the contributors. I'm not claiming that I found everything. And finally, relevant to this conference, volcanic eruptions are a timely reminder of Earth system science geo ethics. Some acknowledgments there, and I'll finish with one last slide. Volcanic eruptions, a natural experiment to have for all. Thank you very much. Perhaps the most important was measuring the oxygen isotopes in the air bubbles 
they could get a proxy for temperature at the time that ice was formed. Another thing they measured was sulfate. And sulfate comes from several sources, but the biggest source is volcanoes. And so by measuring the amount of sulfate, you get a measure of volcanic activity. And what they found was, shown here, the black line is the proxy for temperature. The red line is volcanic sulfate per century. And you can see very clearly at the end of all this ice age, this is 25,000 years before the present, back about 12,000 years ago, there was major warming when we popped out of the ice age. And you notice that there was major volcanism that was continuous for about 2,000 years. And that turns out to be very important. It's the duration of the kind of volcanism I'm going to talk in a minute that leads to warming. There's ample evidence where this volcanism was at that time. It was in Iceland. This is the mountain called Herdebreke in uh, northeastern Iceland. And it's called uh, a tuya, or table mountain. The name means broad shoulders. And what made these broad shoulders was that when you have a basaltic lava eruption under ice, the basalt can't flow away like you see it do in Hawaii. It, has to, it gets chilled, so it has to build upward. So this is a mountain of basalt, of the kind of thing you're used to seeing in Hawaii, but it's built up vertically. And when you look at a whole bunch of these, uh, in Iceland, are these different two years on the lower right, you can see that uh, most of them that we see today were quite active between about 14,000 years ago and 12,000 years ago. So we can go into Iceland and put our fingers on the rocks that were being formed at the time we warmed out of the last ice age. Now what I didn't really enlarge upon when I was showing that was that the enigma that I saw in that was that every volcanologist and every climatologist knows volcanoes cool. It's absolutely understood. You ask any climatologist today, they'll tell you we know that better than anything else. And so I said, wait a minute. How can volcanoes both cool and warm? And this is pretty clear evidence that there was warming that caused warming. So the kind of volcanism we're talking about that was going on under the ice, <coughs> what we saw happen at Bardabunga in central Iceland in 2014. This is just lava flowing out of the ground. You can stand fairly nearby and watch, just as you can in Hawaii. But this volcano oozed basaltic lava over an area of 85 <coughs> kilometers. That's 20% of the size of London in six months. In Hawaii, it takes at least 17 years to erupt that amount of lava. This was the highest rate of basalt extrusion since 1783, the eruption of Laki. That was 233 years ago. So this was an exceptional event. Most of you probably never heard of it because it didn't interrupt airspace because it didn't explode. It appears to be have caused a very rapid warming that we've observed since this volcano erupted. And I can give a whole talk on that, but I'm not going to today. But that's why I argue 2016 is the hottest year on record. We went through the global warming hiatus where there was no real change in temperature from 1998 to 2013. But in 2014, as Bhagavad erupted, we've had a rate of increase of temperature that is almost 30 times as fast as the increase in temperature from 1970 to 1998. So other historic major effusive volcanic eruptions include Laki on the left in 1783. This is what it looks like today. There's my wife wandering in the in the, the basalt flows. And that erupted about 565 square kilometers. And then there was Elvia in 935, and it erupted 800 square kilometers in somewhere between three and eight years. And there was these eruptions back in 935 AD that led to the onset of the medieval warm period. Now, if we look at the extinctions going back over 300 million years, we see that the greatest extinction was during the time of Siberian basalts, or the Siberian traps, as they're called, in uh, Siberia, when basaltic magma oozed over the land, covering an area of 7 million square kilometers. As a result of this, 96% of marine species died, 70% of terrestrial vertebrates died, 
This was the biggest extinction in history. It is clearly related to uh, the basalts. It was the change from the Paleozoic to the Mesozoic. It was a huge climate change. There was ocean acidification. There was uh, actually ozone depletion, we think, from some of the fossils. Uh, it was a major event. When the Atlantic Ocean started opening up, the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province covered an area, again, of basalt, 11 million square kilometers. Major event. And then 66 million years ago, the time the dinosaurs and the Nile got into trouble, the Deccan basalts in India covered an area of 500,000 square kilometers. So the kind of event I'm talking about at Bartholomew is just a really small part of what we've seen in history. And what we've seen in history is minuscule compared to what we see in geologic history. And associated with all these events was major warming. So a major effusive volcanic eruption <coughs> extrude the salt lava over large areas. They do not explode much debris in the stratosphere, so they don't end up airplane flights. They last for months to hundreds of thousands of years. They deplete ozone, causing major global warming. And I won't have a lot of time to talk about that today, but that is part of the mechanism that's going on. And we can see the ozone depletion. And they acidify the oceans, causing major mass extinctions. The acidification we're talking about here is sulfuric acid, which is a lot more potent than carbonic acid. We don't drink sulfuric acid. <laughs> so they cause minor to extreme climate change. Okay, come on. Now I want to talk about a totally different kind of volcanism, but this is the one you're most familiar with. This is the explosive kind of volcanism. And this is Mount Pinatubo that we showed a picture of in 1991. These volcanoes explode over a very short time, a number of hours. There might be several explosions over several days, but that's it. They last, they may recur every 500 or 1,000 years. Some do, some don't. But the eruption is just a spurt. And it's a major spur. They form aerosols up in the stratosphere. The sulfur dioxide goes up and forms a sulfur acid aerosol. <coughs> it, the particles grow big enough to reflect and scatter sunlight. And so they lead to a net global cooling. And the effect of this cooling is pretty significant. It's about a half a degree centigrade for two to three years. The really big ones might be three or four years. But this modeling in the lower part of my slide, the upper part of that model shows modeling what the ocean temperature was, assuming the cooling that went on associated with Krakatoa. And what you can see is that for 100 years, we're still seeing the effect of the cooling of just a few years following the eruption. This modeling on the right is another way of looking at this, where you're modeling the amount of expansion of the ocean or contraction of the ocean as the temperature changes. We're talking about millimeters, which you're not going to measure, but, but this is just as you heat water, it expands. And so if you cool water, it contracts. And you can see the effect of Krakatoa uh, on the lower right uh, figure. And then uh, you can see that we began to recover, but then Agam came along in 1963, El Chichon in 1982, <coughs> and then Pinatubo in 1991. So this sequence of explosive volcanoes increment the world cooler and cooler. And when this kind of a sequence of five or ten big explosive volcanoes per century exists for millennia, that's how we get into an ice age. We cool the world down incrementally, very slowly. Now, following the Pinatubo eruption, there was a major depletion of ozone. This graph, the, the data points are the annual average ozone at Arosa, Switzerland. And the reason I chose that station is it was the first one that's still recorded from 1927 to now. And what you can see very simply from this is that Pinatubo led to the greatest ozone depletion ever observed. And then what's really peculiar is AFP in 2010, the one that interrupted European airspace, it was 100 times smaller than Pinatubo, but it led to similar ozone depletion. 
So we have lots of evidence that both explosive and effusive volcanoes actually deplete ozone, which changes the amount of solar energy that can reach the Earth. And that's a whole other story, which I won't go into today. So the effect of that Pinatubo was as much as three and a half degrees centigrade warming in December and January following the eruption. But after that, then the aerosols took over. They were covering the whole world, and we got net cooling from explosive eruptions. So what we have is a balance between the duration of effusive volcanism, the barlipunga kind of volcanism, and the frequency of explosive volcanism. If you've got high frequency explosive, you cool the world. If you've got long duration effusive basaltic, you warm the world. And what's amazing is we see in the record this balance going back and forth at amazingly high frequency. This is 120,000 years before the present, before the present. And basically it's the oxygen isotope proxy for temperature on the left with cooler being down. And what we see is that we're down in the ice age. And then there's sudden warming coming out of the ice age. And then we go back into cooling again. And over a period of millennia, uh, we can cool back down into a colder ice age again. But when I look at the actual data records, look layer by layer, I find that the warming in many cases occurred within a few years usually less than a decade. Now this is one ice core, but there are many ice cores in Greenland and elsewhere, and you see the same kind of thing. You see this very rapid warming, followed by slower cooling. There are 25 times in the last 120,000 years when this can be clearly seen in the data. These were known as Dansgaard Esker um, warmings. And so the average is about 5,000 years. But you can see it's not cyclical. It's very erratic. So there's sudden major warming within a few years, followed by cumulative cooling over centuries to millennia, where the warming and cooling occurs on average every 5,000 years, but the timing and the amount of warming are erratic. They are not in cycles. This has to be explained, most, it is most clearly explained by this balance between effusive volcanics causing warming and explosive volcanics causing cooling. So I want to talk about cycles a minute. The green line here is, again, this oxygen isotope proxy, and it's taken from deep sea cores. Uh, benthic sites, uh, 57 of them around the world, some of the best ones out there, and they averaged all the data together and they smoothed it a little bit. And you get this very clear picture that back here uh, is the last interglacial, the Emian interglacial. We went down into the ice age, we kind of stayed fairly one temperature for a while, we went down some more, and ultimately down here between 15 and 20,000 years ago, we got to the bottom of the ice age, and then we got what I showed you in my first slide, the sudden <coughs> coming out of the last ice age, and this is the Holocene here, and where we are. Looks like a pretty reasonable way of going. And if we, I should say also, the, the vertical black lines are known major explosive volcanoes that I tabulated in one of my papers. Now, I've added the black line, which is the Milankovitch cycles, the effect of insulate change in solar radiation reaching the Earth from Milankovitch cycles. And with a few beers or a couple of bottles of wine, we can make a lot of science out of this. You can see there's a fair similarity between what's going on here, but it doesn't all fit that well. But if we look at the real data of what's actually happening on the upper left, what we see is that the lower part of the, the coldest part of the ice age was not down there uh, at 10, 15 to 20 million years. This just doesn't want to work. But it was way back at 70,000 years ago. Um, and again, it's sharp warming, slow cooling. Sharp warming, slow cooling. Global warming happens suddenly and irregularly. So the closest thing to truth in science is good data. 
This is good data. It's clearly observed. The nice thing about oxygen isotopes is you measure a sample. And in a drill core, you can date that sample pretty darn precisely. Erratic sequences of rapid warming followed by slower cooling. <coughs> so to use uh, Nils's uh, uh, polite words, the new dawn of truth I propose is recognizing that a valid theory of climate change must explain these erratic sequences. They're there. We see them very clearly. So to go to somebody you worship, uh, Al Gore, he said, scientists have an independent obligation to respect and present the truth as they see it. Well, Al, the truth as I see it is that climate change throughout Earth history warms suddenly and cools slowly in erratic sequences that are not cyclic. And I haven't got the slightest explanation for how CO2 could cause that. <laughs> Our theory of climate change must explain these erratic sequences. Thank you very much.
So that, that's one thing. And um, moreover, I sent two uh, uh, speeches here, and uh, there became some confusion. And in the program here, I am supposed to speak about the dominant physical processes that cause climate change. And in the book here, I am supposed to speak about global warming and uh, global, global climate change. But anyway, I will try to uh, accomplish some mixture. Can you go back? And here, you see, here you see the uh, <coughs> map of Mars. And no, here. This map is, uh, very, is one of the most fantastic data gathering features, uh, actions every taking place. And if you look here, you see a lot of very old craters, impact craters. If you look here, you see deposition areas, sedimentation. If you look here, you have the greatest volcano in the solar system. It's said, it's not my opinion. It's 27 thousand meters high, three times the Mount Everest high. You have a few more here. Here you have the longest river valley in the solar system. It's about 3,000 kilometers long. In my mind, it's not a river valley. It's about six to seven kilometers deep at certain points. And uh, uh, I will... Uh, uh, oh, that's it. Okay. Yes, here I go back to the abstract which you can find in the book. Uh, nobody can deny that climate change is changing and has always changed. Uh, the impact of global of climate change is always regional, never uh, global. And this is important if you want to isolate physical mechanisms that are actually at work. Physics works at the moment you observe, not, not because of a certain average over 1,000 years or 100,000 years. But you can use averages to help in um, uh, uh, understanding the physical mechanism. So here I just show uh, the temperature reconstructed year temperature from Stockholm and you see here is the Stockholm temperature 1760 to 2000 here is from 1720 to 2000 and the anomalies here they are not 0 0.1 degree or something like that this yearly temperature are free or free about free temperature each direction and this, this is usually, they increase if you go polar. I live in Stockholm at 59 north and I experienced this. So what I, what I wanted to present or try to transfer, it is this short article is meant to highlight the concept global and its logical implications relating to climate and climate politics. Let's see how far I can go. Will you show me after 10? Okay. The concept of climate and global. Climate is a concept that is valid for people living in a certain region and whose lives might depend on the long-term variations and, and so on. Regional climate is well described by the Köppen classification system. For example, when I was um, in the, um, not Canada, on one of the Canary Islands, I 
had a swim during the morning and went up to the top of Teide and experienced a snowstorm. And that's different types of climate, you know, within uh, 40 kilometers above. So, the last eight ice ages might have had global consequences during the last million years, but there is a huge difference in region and climate. For example, along the equator, the temperature di difference during the summer was less than 2 degrees. During winter, it might have been 3 degrees at the equator. But at the Stockholm latitude, it was about 8 to 10 degrees. So climate, is not, climate change is not the same in every ge uh, geographical location. Now I want Well, this uh, climate optimum 4,000 to 8,000 years ago was 2 degrees warmer than now. We have to explain that too, in one way or another. Um, yes, this is, I had a, a computer crash before coming here, so this, this picture is actually better in your Conference. 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 Yeah. So here you see the uh, ice extent in the southern hemisphere, <coughs> and here you see the ice extent in the northern hemisphere. And I don't see the. You can see the contemporary of the year here, and mostly, I, I would say it is for sure that it has to be warmer in the water and probably in the air too if you get a less ice extent and vice versa. So if you want to have carbon dioxide as an input variable regardless if it goes straight up or straight down or whatever and the carbon dioxide concentration is about the same in both hemispheres how can you get opposite curves? This simple graph shows <laughs> that IPCC don't know what they are doing. Page 39. Yes. Uh, I, will, I will take some of the examples here because you can read it yourself. Uh, the year without the summer 1850, well known by the climatologist, there was a temperature depression over the North Atlantic, the US East Coast, and Central Europe, west of the Europe mountain range. The cool period developed successively and spanned about five years with the maximum impact 1815-1860. Just that year, the Tambora explosion happened. But the Tambora explosion couldn't cause this whole temperature depression. That's a past the future. Uh, I want to show this to uh, This is a... Uh, yes. Uh, in my mind, or I, maybe I have come so far, that if you want to understand the, what is causing mass motion in the ocean and in the atmosphere, it might be easier to look at the situation on Mars, because you have no water, and you probably have no volcanoes at all, and if you observe the wind situation and the wind motion, you will find, you might open your mind to other solution to what is causing uh, mass motion in atmosphere. And here we see how a global, almost global storm develops during two weeks on Mars. Here, 201. It starts in June, and this is about 7, 8 of July. And as you see, it starts from the southern part here, 
and goes to the noggin. I can, will also inform you that about 25% of the Martian atmosphere freezes to carbon dioxide ice during the winter. So the carbon dioxide ice that goes over to a gas has to move. So it's producing a lot of wind. But why is it producing heavy wind only about every 10th year? There is no answer to that question today. And here, uh, I am, this image is showing not a mobile high maybe, but an air mass which is moving from Australia, Darwin situation here somewhere, and you see how the dry air is capturing energy from the ocean surface, and how this uh, cloud stream develops. And uh, wind, the wind situation or an ocean, the wind can actually pick up energies which can reach 300 watt per square meter. It's more than the average sunshine at the equator mostly. So you can understand that if the wind, if there are winds, strong winds during an extended period over a large part of Earth, Earth has to cool. And uh, uh, the next piece of information in, about this is that during uh, the ice ages, the uh, amount of sediments uh, from, for example, ice, salt, salt uh, ice, and um, other types of sediments in Antarctica is 10 times more than it is today. So the wind situation, the global wind situation during ice ages is far stronger than it is today. Uh, a climate model is always a simplification. The question is in what limited way it might be useful or if useful at all. We, the, uh, I, I, this is not so much. I mean, every model about climate, the aim of it is prediction. And there is not very much use. Five times. I will, I will just go on. Uh, just a short passage. Swedish climate poli politics was actually run by people included in the Swedish uh, Academy of Sciences. And here I'm writing about uh, uh, articles they wrote in an uh, issue of uh, uh, ambient. ambient, which is really, well, especially <coughs> is, uh, I, I will go on. Oh, I, I will actually go, maybe I will go back. Here we will look at Olympic mounts and facts support the opinion that the Olympic Mount is a heap of dust. I mean, we know that there are winds on Mars, and we also know that there are excavations of old uh, um, impact craters. There, nobody has shown that there is volcanism on Mars. In fact, everywhere where you do find, you, you find sedimentary rocks, mostly. Uh, the escarpments produce, promote an interpretation of low altitude erosion. If you look here, you see these are five to six, seven kilometer high. Here too, but it's smoother here and here. And here, beside it, you find mountains that are three to five kilometer high, and probably is an eroded Olympic mass earlier. It's easy to check on that. Uh, 
all high mountains on Mars are situated close to the equatorial area, where the sunshine drives the wind upwinds along slopes. The caldera of the Olympic Mount can hardly be created by volcanic processes. If you look here, you have 3,000 meters deep here, 4,000 there, and so on. These are, uh, and this is 800 kilometers, this is 80 kilometers. Uh, 80 kilometers, uh, the features inside cannot be produced by volcanic mechanisms. In my opinion, climate change depends on mass motion induced by factors that we still cannot understand, read <coughs> planetary dynamics. Climate change on Mars is easier to understand than climate change on Earth, where water and volcanism to a large extent has decided the surface feature. So it's not the case on Mars. Finally, I told three speeches to O1 in, at the geologic, geological meeting in Nice. Nobody cared about this information then. But now I give this information to you so you can have an open mind and investigate all this yourself. Thank you very much. I'm Alex Pope. I worked at NASA from 63 to 07. I retired in 07 and I <coughs> went to a climate lecture by Tom Wise, who was one of the speakers from Mars in 08, and I've been studying climate for eight years. Alex, stand closer to the mic. There you go. Yeah. Speak into that microphone. Into that one. That's it. Okay. Yeah, I think it's I've studied climate for eight years, and I'm going to tell you. Uh, some of what I've learned. Okay, in this presentation I'm going to tell you why ice on land and ice extent are the most important uh, parameters that regulate temperature. Change. Too far. It's okay. What no, I didn't go too far. That's perfect. Uh, when I first read about this conference, uh, I read about these things that uh, influence climate, and uh, we were supposed to discuss each year. Well, I looked at all of those, and all of these things, most all of these things, have small influences on climate, and all of them need powerful feedbacks to help it. The biggest feedback that most of them use is ice extent. So I have ice extent as the most important parameter to regulate temperature, and I have ice volume on land as the most important parameter to 
to regulate the ice <laughs> stem. Change it. Oops. Too fast. Yeah, okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, this chart showed up on what's up with that. Anthony Watts' website is posted by Sturgis Cooper in 2014, and it has time periods that are uh, 500 million years on this left, 60 million to 10 million years, then uh, 5 million to 1 million, uh, 1 million back to 20,000 years ago, and the modern 10,000, 20,000 years. Uh, I don't talk about the turret on the left, so I'll turn it off, and I'm going to go with this chart down here. I'm doing something. Yeah. Don't use this machine. Only when I point to and up with the hand when you want to. Okay. Okay. He will change it. Okay. If you put your hand up. But as, use it as a pointer. Okay. Okay. All right. So 50 million years ago, there wasn't much ice extent or ice on land on Earth. It was a lot warmer than that. 20,000 years ago, there was a lot more ice on Earth, and it was a lot colder than that. In the modern 10,000 years, we've got a lot more ice than we had 50 million years ago, and a lot less ice than we had 20,000 years ago. No, you don't need to. Up your hand. Oh, just fine. Wait. Just wait. Okay. Uh, this ice extent, all of these cycles on this chart are ice cycles. Every peak is a warm time when it's snowing more, and every valley is a cold time when it's snowing less, and all of these cycles are ice cycles. It's, it snows more, it gets cold, it freezes the oceans, and then it stops snowing and it warms. So all of these are going on for the whole time. And all right, uh, if you plot the ice <coughs> accumulation rate, the ice cores have depth and they have the temperatures. And if you use that depth to calculate an ice accumulation rate, you get really strong correlations between temperature and ice accumulation rate. When it's warmer, it always snows more, and when it's colder, it always snows less. If you look at the uh, ice accumulation out here uh, millions of years ago, I mean thousands of years ago, that ice has been compressed and it has flowed out and it's, the peaks are smaller because the ice is not there any longer. Uh, if you look at the last 10,000 years, uh, the last 4,000 years, this ice accumulation rate looks like it's a lot more. That's because that ice has not been there long enough and it's not compacted yet. There's still air bubbles in it. Uh, if you look at uh, 4,000 years ago back to 12,000 years ago, that ice has been compacted, but it hadn't flowed out yet, so it's mostly still there. So, and you can see the correlation between the uh, ice accumulation and the temperature. If you look at the last uh, 130,000 years, you can see that out here the ice is starting to flow out, and the peaks are coming down a little bit compared to up here. Uh, when Earth warms, it thaws the polar oceans, and as it warms, ice accumulation rate increases. When Earth cools, ice accumulation decreases. And that's because the snowfall is the highest when it's the warmest because the most oceans are thawed. Uh, the snowfall rate is the lowest when it's cold because the polar oceans are frozen and the snowfall is less. So, oops. Okay, so when the temperature is increasing, it's because the ice extent is decreasing. When the temperature is decreasing, it's because the ice extent is increasing.
the warmest time is the time with the maximum ice extent. The coldest time is the time with the no, the coldest time is the time with the max ice extent. The warmest time is the time with the minimum ice extent. Somewhere on this curve, on this line going up, is the minimum ice volume because ice is depleting and flowing out. But at some point here, the snowfall rate catches up, and from there on up, uh, it snows more than <laughs> melts. So you've got minimum ice volume somewhere on this line, and you got maximum ice volume over there after the slope stowed for, for a lot of years. If you pick a time on this temperature line going up and on the line coming down, those temperatures are equal because I picked them. Uh, the accumulated snowfall accumulation rate on this side going up and that side coming down is about the same because this, the accumulation rate is a function of temperature. The, the melting of ice on both sides is about equal because the ice extent exposure is about the same and the temperature is about the same. So the melting is about the same. So basically you've got every cycle puts, every warm cycle puts ice on land and every cold cycle, cycle lets it deplete. And you get down here, and the ice cycle's got bigger for a million years. And then this last time, we came out into a new modern normal. Oops, back up. I missed, I missed an important point. Okay. People talk about all of the different things that influence temperature, the climate. And they, they talk about solar cycles. Milankovic cycles, uh, cosmic cycles, volcanoes, uh, and I'm saying that the uh, ice extent is the important cycle. Well, I, a few days ago I had a realization. This is a dynamic system that's vibrating, and you can see that the variance is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and all of a sudden it stops doing that. Uh, every one of these cycles took ice out of the ocean, water out of the ocean and put it on land. It put some on Antarctica and Greenland, the mountain glaciers where it didn't melt. It put some on uh, temper, temperature regions where it did melt. But every cycle took some of the water out of the ocean and didn't put it all back. When you get right down here 20,000 years ago and we warmed out the last major ice cycle, there wasn't enough water still in the ocean for another major ice cycle. So that's why we have this new normal. That's temperature, the dark blue is temperature from the ice cores in Antarctica, and the light blue is temperatures from ice cores in Greenland. And they're in the same bounds with the same variance for 10,000 years. That's the new normal. Uh, everybody talks about their own uh, causes for climate change, they resonated together. So everybody that says they have something that correlates with temperature, it did part of this. It all resonated together and the result is where we are now. Layton Stewart calls that, he, he has a book, Fire, Ice, and Paradise. This is his paradise. That's where we are now. Uh, when the oceans are warm, it snows more, and, it get, and the ice fills up and spreads out and makes it cold. When the oceans are cold, it freezes the, and it snows less, and the sun takes away ice every year and it gets warm. Uh, 2,000 years ago, there was a Roman war period, and then it got cold. 1,000 years ago, there was a medieval war period, and it got cold. We call that the Little Ice Age. It's warm now because it's supposed to be. It's a natural cycle, and we didn't cause it. And the CO2 just makes the green stuff grow better. <laughs> they got to steer us so they can tax and control us. Yeah. What should be up? Nicholas? Oh, sorry. Yes.
Yes, here. Yes, I have a question. Uh, Alex, I think we exchanged some emails a while ago. Step over here and see you're in the line. I'm Ned, so I think we exchanged some emails at some point. The question I have is, when I, look, I was looking at your graphs, uh, you showed the uh, rate of accumulation of ice and the temperature, and uh, it, just looking at it, it looks to me like the temperature, I haven't done any lead lag analysis, like with, with cross, uh, cross correlation to see. I've not done the lead lag stuff. So just visually I, looking at yeah. the temperature, it's changing it, it, did, it did look like there was some lead lag, so uh, go back. Uh, your slides. Your slides back. Anyway, uh, I have Yeah, exactly right. Here. So if you sit here, it, it, it helps the previous one. Go to the previous one. Yes. Go to the previous one. Next. Next one. No. Back. Back one more. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So if you look here, the, the range of the temperature, and just visually I can tell that the temperature is changing first, and then the ice accumulation is falling. So the temperature, the ice accumulation is, is lagging the temperature for some time. So if that's the case, how can the ice accumulation just go? Well, uh, I think I think that the, the snowfall rate and the temperature do not track each other exactly, and uh, they're probably in. I've not looked at the lag, and I'm not surprised if there's lag. But uh, and it could be errors in the yeah. what occurs in the real uh, Greenland ice. But I mean, is that the ones that which looks like a spike up? Oh. Warming is really a cooling, and the uh, it's this, this eight thousand to three hundred years uh, cooling event. Anyway, there, there probably is some lead lag. I mean, some lag in it, but uh, it's it's very small. Okay. Hey, Alex. Uh, my name is James Simon. I'm a student at the University of Edinburgh. Um, just a quick question about this. So I, I could understand if um, if you were saying that a higher temperature would then cause the change in ice because higher temperature could mean you know more clouds, therefore more snowfall. And I can see how it would work that way around. But how? What's the the, uh, the, the physics behind how how more ice would then? Uh, but when, when the oceans the are, when the oceans are warmer. It thaws the polar ocean sea ice that exposes polar ocean water to fierce winds and that sucks the water out of the ocean and it dumps it on land and it builds up the ice on land and it keeps doing that until it gets enough ice on land and it spreads out and makes it cold and the snow don't stop until it gets cold again. Okay, so uh, the effect on the albedo effect of, of the increased ice, so that isn't particularly significant because if, if the albedo was the main factor, then an increase in ice would decrease the temperature. Well, now, the, the opposite, when, 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 the, when it's snowing, it snows more even before the volume of ice starts increasing. It can snow, it snows more while the ice is still retreating, but it snows until it does advance, and it's when the ice advances is when it cools. It doesn't cool in, in lockstep with the ice volume. It cools later as the extent increases, but it does more than just cool. When you cover the oceans with ice, it radiates at a lower temperature, and when you increase the albedo, uh, you cool the earth. When you uh, have the ice extent further out into the oceans, it melts more and it does cooling with melting, so it affects it all of those ways. So the albedo is a big effect, the melting is a big effect, and the fact that you, you've got a, a surface that's ice instead of water or land makes a difference because the solar end has to equal the albedo out and the hour out. So if albedo goes up, hour has to go down. And you can get the hour down by covering it with an ice sheet and with melting.
Right. Um, just, I'd just like to make a. Well, yeah, thanks, Nicholas. I, I wanted to just make a comment about Peter Ward's presentation, which he's welcome to respond to if you'd like to. Um, in the presentation, he, he said that uh, the erratic nature of the, uh, the volcanism that, that he showed to us. Uh, meant that, uh, that there was nothing cyclic involved. And uh, I don't know whether he was here for my presentation this earlier this morning, where I showed um, the solar, the evolution of solar variation over the last 4,000 years, according to the temporillium isotope. Uh, and the model which we produced that fit that erratic looking curve very well. Um, but that model was produced um, not with one cycle, but with four cycles. And so I just wondered if, if he had any comment about that you could have four interacting cycles that would produce something that looks very erratic and non-cyclic, uh, and accept perhaps that there may well be cycles, then it's just that you have to work out what combination of cycles are actually involved that produce that erratic looking curve. Well, that's a good question, and I think the first thing we see when we look at data, the first thing we look for when we look at data is cycles. And we can do Fourier analysis, we can do a lot of other things. Part of what I was trying to emphasize is you've got to get down to the frequency of the cycles. Okay? I mean, in many ways, I'm talking about a cycle uh, when you're warming the Earth in, 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 in a few years. That's very high frequency. And I tried to show just using the insulation cycles as one example that they, you know, if you can see them, they probably have an effect. I mean, molecular cycles are, are reality. Whether they have a big effect or not, it's not clear, but they don't have an effect at the frequency level of what we're seeing climate change. Climate change is going on regularly. I mean, when you go through a sequence that's less than 5,000 years, and you do that every 5,000 years, then Unless you're going to talk about cycles that are less that have a frequency of our wavelength of less than 5,000 years, you know, it doesn't make much sense. And one of the reasons I emphasize it is many people in this room have one cycle or another that they're trying to attribute to the cause of climate change. The climate is just changing at a very high frequency rate. One, two, three. Uh, okay, thank you. So, David Bowen, Cardiff. Um, I'd like to ask Peter to comment on his last diagram where he showed the temperature record from the Eemian to the Holocene. Now, that record seems to me to be remarkably similar to that of Gerard Bond, who constructed his record from deep sea sediments in the North Atlantic. So I would like to ask you where would Heinrich events fit in all that? Heinrich events, for those of you who haven't heard of them, involve massive discharges of ice, principally from the Laurent Glacier, and unquestionably had a major effect on climate. And then, as an adjunct, perhaps, um, the Beryllium 10 record from, from Greenland may, may also be interesting <coughs> in the sense that it might have produced a solar signal which had some effect on the carbs of the ashes. Yeah, what I was showing with the Dansgaard Esker events, which are uh, often attributed to fresh water in the North Atlantic, the Heinrich events, it's not 100% clear to me. I, I've got intrigued with them and read quite a bit about them, uh, but I would be thought to give a mechanism at the moment. I mean, this is where suddenly there's a huge amount of ice coming down out of the North Atlantic. And uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, the data I showed were from the ice cores in Greenland. They're very similar to what Bond worked out um, for the Dansgaard Esker events. Uh, they're very similar to everybody. See, I mean, the, the, the basic data are clear. Um, just different ways of looking at it. But the short answer is, I don't understand. Yeah. Okay, we can say two things. One thing is for sure with some of these Dansgaard Esker 
Evans, but we can see in the whole of the ocean the thing proceeding and going back. So it's not just a curve. This, so we have the mechanism that ice and the icebergs are going back and forth. And what is triggering that is another thing. But it looks, but this is different. But what you have done, it doesn't need to, uh, all of those uh, rapid events need to be in what you have. But some of them, that's how we bring it together. But what is most very surprising for me is the curve. At about 10,000 years, it was high activity. Then you're in the whole of the Holocene, it was almost nothing. And then it, today, it was rising again. This nothing in the Holocene is mysterious, because in the Holocene, it, we have very strong uh, ups and downs in, in the climatic scene, even stronger than those of, of, of the present. So, this is important. So, some, okay. In my 2009 paper, I show the Holocene in some detail, and the evidence from ice core, from ice caves, from stalag types and stalagmites, from temperature, the evidence of sulfate from, the, from Greenland. And there's an amazing correlation between the solvent eruption warming, like the middle, like the uh, warming period, it's like the Roman warm period. Or the, so. Anyway, the, there's very good correlation, and then there's the explosive volcanoes correlation with it. And that's what got us down in the little ice age. And as you see this cycling going all through history, I mean, I left out a slide on that just because 18 minutes ago. It was not cycling in your case, because it was Evans. If we are talking about cycling, we are talking about Evans. Because I think you're right, correlation is not causation. No, that's right. Who was number two? No, we were number uh, uh, three. Someone here. Yes, you were. You were number two. Hello, my question is to Peter Ward. Uh, I'm, I'm telling that we are uh, during explosive volcanoes, there is a change in also in the stratospheric level. That means it has an implication in the polar vortex. And in paleo data and modern data, it showed that it triggered El Nino kind of situation. For a longer term record, it showed that El Nino is triggered when there is explosive volcanoes. And modeling study also supports that. And uh, if it is El Nino, it is it is, it is the duration wise it increases the El Nino, but it doesn't have that much effect on La Nina. And we know during El Nino there is a rise in temperature. During 1982, after the volcano, it is the strongest El Nino over the 150 years ago. And 1992, after that, the El Nino was the strongest in duration over the 150 years ago. And that 2016, you are telling that it is the warmest because you know 2014 Iceland may have triggered the 2015 El Nino, and it again becomes the warmest in 2016. Do you think that is, that may, might be the cause? Could I explain it properly, or may I just put in? Uh, but as it's El Nino, Strandberg, do you agree with what was said, being said now? Answer is, ah, uh, <laughs> wait. <laughs> I have an abstract submitted to the American Meteorological Society meeting next January in Seattle. And it's, I'm going to report on the work I've been doing recently, looking at all the, the uh, El Nino at the North Atlantic Oscillation, or all the oscillations in the ocean. And it's actually fascinating. And what I've been doing is plotting the different oscillation indexes, like the multivariate. Uh, index and so on, uh, on the same graph as ozone, on the same graph as temperature, and trying to look for the correlations. And there's a, there's a lot there that's interesting, but it's not real obvious. It doesn't stand out right away. But part of the issue I get very upset about is you keep hearing about El Nino causing climate change. I think that's putting the cart before the horse, mm -hmm. because what happens is when there's a pressure change in the atmosphere, for example, over South America, relative to, to the uh, Indonesian area, that's when you get El Nino or La Nina. And so it changes the winds, which end up changing the others. Now, when you start talking about ozone depletion, what's really important about ozone depletion is when you're changing the ozone, you're changing it worldwide. And the other thing is ozone doesn't last very long. It only lasts for about eight days. It varies depending on where you are. Sometimes it goes on sooner. Other 
but it's the creation and destruction of ozone that generates heat and then you have a local heat in a region and this has a major effect on the highs and lows of pressure Dobson was one of the first people to work on this back in the 1920s and even then he wrote about the fact that there was a clear relationship between regions of ozone depletion and regions of high ozone with highs and lows of weather fronts ozone depletion also strengthens the polar vortex which has a big effect on the Gulf Stream uh, which has a big effect on the distribution of energy uh, so there's a lot going on there and I think it's going to keep a lot of budding PhDs busy for quite a while the problem is we got to start looking at it but there is there's excellent ozone data now because of the Montreal Protocol they're monitoring it and they're producing a map of ozone every day in the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere and the changes are phenomenal and I think they're going to be very exciting as we begin to understand how they relate directly to weather. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Mother Panitha. I have some short comments on Alex Pope's excellent presentation on land ice. He may be aware that there is a snow lab data in Rutgers, which has shown that in the last few years, snow accumulation over northern hemisphere has in fact increased in the last five to six years. This was against the IPCC projection of 2007 climate change document, <coughs> which they categorically stated that in the next few decades, snow will be disappearing from the land area of the land. <laughs> thing that happens that immediately increases the snowfall. So after a volcano in, in polar regions, it should warm immediately partly because of the albedo change and then it should cool after that because of the more snowfall. Great. Great. It always is necessary that it fits with an observational data. And sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't at all. Yeah, it's important to realize that it's not the heat from volcanoes that are causing the climate change. It's the effect of volcanoes on the ozone layer yeah. and on broad regions. That's according to you, Mr. Well, that's uh, probably true. Uh, I just want to sort of make the point that this, when people put forward a sequence of cause and effect and cause and effect and so on, and then they start arguing, well, often there's like parallel causes and effect and overlapping causes and effect. And, and I think to, well, I know that if you want to predict something, you have to know those links as best you possibly can. You see, from the stuff on the back, if you look at it later on, it's obvious that Enzo is a solar magnetic process. But it doesn't mean that is the only thing causing Enzo's. Uh, I mean, the, the um, uh, lunar, uh, issues of, uh, of parenting and so forth are obviously or evidentially important as well. Um, so if we're, you know, we have to combine these things together, which makes them difficult. But I just want to say there's certainly one clear point that comes out, which is not known generally to you know, other people, 
outside of it, is that the idea that volcanoes are, are, are causing all the cooling is, is nonsense, because often we know now that volcanoes have occurred when it is already cooling, and then has various effects, the smoke of which is sometimes uh, more cooling. Um, so, okay, to try and understand things, we generally speaking find ourselves looking for matching cycles and so on. But I think one of the difficulties with this, uh, when we're getting out to these long periods, is that the cycles are extremely noisy. Um, you see, if you look at the Ice Age data, um, the last Ice Age was about 130,000 years ago. Now, taking just the uh, idea of modulations of the Earth's tilt and so forth, you can understand that because the obliquity of the Earth has got a, that's the tilt of the Earth, has got a periodicity of 43,000 years or so. And the precession of the Earth's axis, poles, has got uh, a 26,000 years uh, periodicity. So if the, if there's a mainly, if, if you're looking for a magnetic link with the sun, then you're going to think, well, okay, when did these things come together or how after them? And the answer is 3 times 42 is 129, or sorry, 3, three times 43 if you change 43 to make it easier. Um, no, it might not be exactly that. And 5 times 26 is 130. So, you know, every 130,000 years or so, you're likely to get some triggering effect, which is going to cause a lot of these volcano effects, maybe. So, well, my question to the people who control the many volcano things is, is that is there evidence of those types? Periodicities, 43,000 years, 26,000 years, and multiples there are by <coughs> combinations of 130,000 years. So those present in the yeah. volcano data. Either. <laughs> Certainly, if we take the temperature data and we can see some cycles, longer period, shorter period. I mean, one of the biggest problems we have with scientists is we see a result and we have to figure out of all those things out there what caused the result. So what we want to figure out first is what's the major cause, and it ain't CO2. Okay. No. Nope. And what I'm showing is there's a pretty good evidence that volcanoes are a major cause. You're not going to get to the longer frequency. I wouldn't be the first time. Milankovitch, what he's talking about, makes sense. It's probably happening. Some of the magnetic cycles, some of the solar cycles, all these things, they exist. The issue is, are they 5% of the problem, 1%, or 99%? And I would argue that volcanoes are the most important in determining climate, but all this other stuff happens to them. So my friends, we have a few minutes left. Uh, we had uh, Martin Hovland's talk, but we should have, expect to have very bad living condition in a pockmark, because it's steaming out terrible stuff. But there, you have corals and a wonderful uh, biological life. I'm surprised that nobody has asked about this because this is sort of the clue to all of this acidity uh, in, the, in the ocean. First of all, you cannot make acidity all over the ocean. Second, that in those holes, the, the, the biology really loves to be there. You have coral building up and a lot of uh, animals. Any questions to that? I, I was really shocked by the presentation of Martin. Yeah. Because this is something really new. I didn't know anything about that. I'm sorry about that. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, that the effects of what you presented is, uh, should be very big. And we don't know. We, we know very little about that. Here, here, those who make the interviews. Just make a problem. We've just um, heard uh, people more talk about explosive volcanoes. I mean, when you have subduction underneath South America, you have a line of explosive volcanoes. And what is in the stuff that goes up? It's seawater. Because that's what's going down, boiling or going super critical, and then feeding into the volcanoes along the Andes. And a lot of seawater, HCM, which is hydrochloric acid, is going into the structure. Yeah. And that goes back to very, very old 
chemical investigations in the deep sea floors, where you could see the precipitation of elements changing between ice ages uh, uh, and integration. But no physical explanation if there was not happening something in the base of, 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 of the ocean floor. That's for that absolute sure. Yes, sir. On that Sorry. point, uh, very quickly, uh, Martin Hobland might know the answer to this, but I'm not sure how well monitored these hundreds of thousands of subsea volcanoes and seamounts and vents are. Can you give us some idea of that? Yeah. Okay. I've had the opportunity of being part of the Ocean Brilliant program. I've been sitting in the uh, safety panel for 28 years. We had our last meeting in Houston a couple of months ago. We look into the drilling um, that the scientists are doing. So we know what they found. Nobody else knows. Nobody else cares. It's the ignored part of this uh, beautiful planet that we are living on. It's invisible. Have you heard this before? For us who are here and we call skeptics or even in the deniers, the, the, this is the thing we have to explore. Because it's all these wonderful things out there which fits in some sort of pattern. Someone mentioned the Montreal Protocol. And the interesting thing about this is that it's being used to some extent as a basis for what's going on about the nonsense of carbon dioxide. Now, since we've got an expert on it over here, I'd like to ask, since we stopped using CFCs, mm. what extent has it had on the impact in terms of changes of um, ozone concentration and the hole and all that sort of stuff? I mean, is it noticeable? Well, I was a couple of slides I left out to fit in 18 minutes. But what's really interesting to me is, you know, in the 1960s, chlorofluorocarbons were very popular because you could refrigerate with much, they were much safer than other refrigerants. Uh, they're so chemically inert, you could use them for spray can propellants, you use them for all kinds of things. And we sold a lot of them in the 60s. And then it was with the uh, discovery uh, in 1974 that these could get broken down in the stratosphere and then the discovery of the ozone hole in 85 and we realized, oh my gosh, you know, this could be what's going on. By that time the scientists were pretty sure that that's what was going on. And what's amazing is within two years, from 1985 to 1987, they negotiated the Montreal Protocol which mandated the cutting back of the manufacturing. That took effect January 1989. What's really interesting is the graph that I will show you is that the increase in chlorine in the atmosphere from chlorofluorocarbons stopped increasing in 1993. The increase in ozone depletion stopped increasing in 1995. And the increase in temperature stopped increasing in 1998. So I argue that manufacturing a lot of the CFCs caused the warming from 1970 to 1998. And while we were trying to solve the ozone hole, by mistake, we also prevented the warming. And a paper I gave at the AMS meeting this January, when Mario Molina was sitting there in the audience, was I thanked him, not only for solving this problem for us, but he prevented the world being another half a degree warmer now than it would have been had it not been for the Montreal Protocol. So that means that you believe in man-made interference with climate, <laughs> my yes. friend. Yes. <laughs> Yes, um, Rose Fairbridge, he wrote an article about um, uh, what it was in Hudson Bay, you could see beach ridges with 45 year period, very velocity, which was mentioned before. And um, it's just to go on it and you will see the pictures. It's because the land is racing. So you, it's an indicator of storminess, and that's actually a very good indicator for that we have a, some type of 45 year influence in storminess, in weather, in wind. Okay. And another thing, you get the cycles in sedimentary places, and the longest and most impressive one 
it was a dream core from East uh, United States, which uh, was about 150 cycles showing a per period of 111,000 years. And uh, it, it's, you can imagine that that might be the period of the uh, perhelium, a uh, sidereal period of perhelium position of the Earth. But I mean, there is no proof of it. But anyway, there exist periods which are not dependent at my point. Thank you very much. And of course, if we go to cycles, and so it's interesting that 800 million years ago in the bar uh, maturity in, in Australia, you still pick up those basic solar cycles, meaning that we have some sort of conservative in our solar system. Through this 45 year cycle, I was working in Brazil and counting beach reaches between two sea level tops. And then we counted, I counted hundred, about 100 beach reaches. And I was sure that it wouldn't be 45 years. But then when I divided, it was exactly 45 years as far as I predicted. Who was the next one? Yeah. I have a comment. I mentioned that I have studied three submarine eruptions. One is off the Canary Islands. The submarine volcano actually erupted in October 2011, and it stopped in March 2012. And I have also looked at sea surface temperature anomalies mapped of the Atlantic, and you can see the Southern Ocean, the cooler water, the sea ice did expand it. Well, the Arctic sea ice contracted. And similarly, with Tonga eruption, which is in the southern hemisphere, besides mass bleaching of the GBR, the northern and central parts, the southern part escaped, mainly because there were cyclones dumping a lot of heavy rain. The Australians didn't know about this. I have to go and talk to them to explain it to them. But they think the bleaching is global warming. Yes. And similarly, by looking at the southern hemisphere sea surface temperature anomalies maps, you can see the cooler water came. Nature's way of neutralizing anomalies of hot sea water over New Zealand around those areas. Thank you. We are going to continue. Just one more question, and then we have one hour discussion at the end. You can come back there and think of your nice, clever questions. Um, hello, my name is Martin Gainsborough. I work in farming in England. Um, can I ask the American gentleman uh, in the Geological Survey, other yeah, Yanks, Americans, um, like John Casey, who wrote uh, Dark Winter, talk about the connection between cold periods that he considers from the sun cycles being connected with um, periods of more volcanic activity. Um, what are your thoughts on that? What was the question? I asked whether uh, what some uh, people talk about cold. Okay, so it's the coming cooling period. We had a, a, yeah, we can take any direct comment, otherwise we take it in the discussion period. We have had it all up this morning. So, please, Professor Sarah, it's your turn, and I should moderate. Well, I can just introduce you. Uh, the Independent Committee on UX have a special project, the SIC project, and uh, uh, Leonello Sadma is going to present it. And then we discuss it, and then we have uh, coffee and tea, and then we come for a general discussion. Okay, good afternoon to everybody, and uh, I have to apologize first because my Roman English, I think is the worst English that uh, you can hear today in <laughs> Anyway, I hope you understand what I, what I want to say. If not, please uh, ask me uh, clarifications. So I'm going to make a proposal on a project that, in my opinion, 
should be our common project and for and uh, I will give the reason why it, this should be our common pro, uh, project. So the, you can see here this graph, this uh, slide came out after hours and hours, hours of discussion between our five people that were doing this. And you can, I, I will go now, you can see here how many... It is on 46, page yeah. 46. But I will, I will go through the, this, this uh, slide to, to tell you, to explain what is the meaning. Yeah? But one thing that you can see is the interrelation between many, many, many uh, phenomena. So, the, the only thing, we have to avoid to explain the phenomena only with one, with one uh, argument, but we need uh, to study the world system and the climate is a real, uh, complete, real uh, uh, integrated system. So the, the aim is simply to provide a structured catalog of uh, key phenomena in both, <coughs> presented in the form of boxes in the flow diagram, interconnection among the different phenomena, interconnection among these phenomena and anticipated outcomes. For each phenomenon, basic information is collected about data and about evaluation, including discussion of controversial issues. This is very important because we have to put inside not only our opinion but also our other opinion coming from other people. Okay. Also, phenomena of relatively small impact are represented in order to avoid criticism for neglecting something of special importance. The main purpose is to get rid of or at least reduce <coughs> oversimplification, distortion, suppression of information and other serious bugs present in the communication by IPCC and its support. So, this should be uh, something that we have to use against IPCC, IPCC just to show the complexity and to discuss each phenomena in the, in the proper detail. The content of sheep. Information can be assessed clicking on the label identifying each box. This is in case we will, uh, we will work on this later. Three types of boxes are present. The first one on the, is coarse type boxes that are red, rectangle on the left side. They indicate possible causes of climate change. A small red triangle in the upper left corner indicates that human activities are significantly affecting this phenomenon. Orange color indicates that the box depicts a source of energy. Now, I will show this. Well, so this is the, what I was saying. This is the human. Okay, this is the, the different phenomena involved in the climate change, in the climate, uh, climate understanding. Consequence type boxes, like red ellipses in the right slide, it is the phenomena usually considered as consequences induced by climate, climate change. This one. Okay? So these are these are the consequences. Then content type boxes in the central part where the writing in the writings indicate what is the content, CO2 particularly, etc. The color indicates what type of container matrix is involved. Light blue for atmosphere, dark blue for oceans green from plant for plants and brown for soil. Because soil is also very, very, very important for the concentration of the uh, yeah. okay. This is the, what I was, I was just saying. Now, the arrow, 
Errors in the connecting the dot sys correspond to the following conventions. A errors entering, entering the box indicate an action on the box. Errors leaving the box, of course, indicate an effect from the box. This is very simple. And you here you can see the arrow, the different type of uh, <coughs> red arrows indicate energy, variation in food production and forest, forest extension, CO2 from combustion of coal and hydrocarbons, particulate content in atmosphere, solar radiation. Brown arrows indicate CO2, green arrows indicate uh, methane and other greenhouse gases, different from CO2, blue arrows indicate water, black arrow indicates an interaction without transfer of energy or specific matter. The structure of sheet consists of several layers to make it flexible and modular. Through the technique of hypertext, information <coughs> the different layers are interconnected so that the overall tool can be fully navigated. Sheet is in form of a single hypertext file. Its implementation is expected to take place through window, while its use is expected to take place through Agrobus reader, to make it faster and independent for, of license constraints. Okay, so this is it. Now I go. I cannot explain because we need uh, uh, one day to explain each box. But I think the structure is a is a. <coughs> I think can, can be understood the main structure. Now, what is the the conclusion, request, and suggestion that I would like, I would like then to discuss to, to see if we can go forward or not? The issue first conclusion is the issue is very complicated. And the IPCC approach is a rough course and oversimplification. There are too many uncertainties even in this basic phenomenon, and to draw conclusion at this stage is unjustified. IPCC conclusion rely upon too many interpretation, correction, and arbitrary selection of experimental data. It's, it is not true that there is a general consensus on IPCC conclusion within the scientific community. Further investigation, in particular, in collecting experimental data are needed and IPCC procedures and governance should be revised. Now, what I'm going to propose. Let me check out. Okay. So this is what I would like to propose here is the following. First of all, general remarks on the scheme, the legal one, okay, and suggestion for its improvement through integration and modification. So we don't have to take this as a final stage. We can, we can modify. Suggestion to modify content the structure of layer two. Contribution to formulate one select section of layer three, more likely <coughs> Interrelated section according to specialization and preferences of single contributors. Contribution to the content of level four, layer four, by suggesting the inclusion of additional papers, having in mind that the purpose is not completeness, overwhelming task, but only support to the message given in the corresponding section. With this project, we would like, therefore, to show to the public, however we have to find a way, the complexity of the climate system and, therefore, the nonsense of the forecasting based on the very few parameters of the system, in particular CO2. If we will be able to complete this project, we could, these are just ideas, organize an ad hoc scientific conference on the ship results, Publish it in a form of a book or something else, and put the money coming from it today, our committee, account, <coughs> for our future activities. 
is it just two ideas that came up into me? And this is the I would like to now to have a discussion and uh, frankly speaking, I would like to know if we can go forward or not. Because if not, we forget about it. Take back the Yes, please, one, two, uh, who is running with a three? One, two, three. <coughs> Here first. Thanks. As I mentioned before, I think that um, just having the solar wind uh, is inadequate. I think that needs to be split into um, the magnetic effects of the sun and its interaction, uh, and not simply lump it all together. So solar wind consisting of particles and so on on the one end, because the effects are quite different, or can be quite different. Um, I'm wondering if some of the astrophysics phenomena should actually be on the left hand side of the rest, because as Niels has pointed out earlier on, I mean they're the drivers of the changes that happen in the sun in the first place. So there's sort of so sort of cause and effect things right at the very, very start. And I think probably if one addressed each of those boxes, although it's a very good start, I suspect that there's problems in each one that need to be addressed before we get into the real detail on the, on the right-hand side. Yeah, we can both uh, I think you are completely right. It's just that, take it as a beginning. Sure. It's, yeah, a beginning. it's just a beginning. And that yeah. was, that they are inviting it. I will not certainly go into the, that part and discuss it, but due to the conference, I was just locked up. All the things which happened, you wouldn't know all the things on the way there. You could do it by expanding that box yeah. on, and having this yeah, stuff yeah, on a separate page. Yeah. Yeah. But this is the beginning of yeah. seeing something which the Italian group so very well have taken that showing this, anyone seeing such a complexity cannot say, oh, it's simply CO2. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you cannot pull out something and say, oh, I know what it is. It's organic bread. You cannot do that because it's complexity. And we are geologists and physicists uh, and so on. And we always need to work in complex system. And like uh, um, John Eriks told me, they were taking everything together. Polar front, the biological, when we had seen old waves on the map long ago, and this very, very sophisticated uh, analytic treatment of probably uh, uh, in the stuff. So, this is how we have to work. So, this diagram, when we compare, it will not be this diagram, but no. it's the beginning. We and this not. is the presentation of this idea. So that was the first. We have a second? Yes. Second. And it was one more uh, before. No, no. Oh, over there. Before. One, two, three. <coughs> four. Four. Uh, one, two, three. Yes. I'm uh, François Gervais from uh, François Rabelais University in Tours, France. The Loire Valley. Uh, this is a very nice project. But I would say, I would suggest that the main uh, point first to know what is the amplitude of each uh, contribution yeah. to climate and also to insist on the uncertainty on each contribution. Yeah. Because of course, this is a list of what we it has to be addressed. But for example, for the case of the role of CO2 on climate, which is usually measured by the climate sensitivity, if you look at the literature on this question, you may see in peer review papers a factor at least of 10 between lowest climate sensitivity and highest that is published in peer review literature. So, I mean, the uncertainty 
He is uh, definitely, I, I would say, uh, a very important point about this kind of a project, which is definitely just. I think uh, perhaps I was not clear. For each box, for each box, we have to put inside all the literature data. Not only is it is too much. <laughs> oh, it's too much. The, the more significant, the, the, and this is answering your question, because we have to, to see, just clicking on the box, you can see, you can have an idea of what is the percent of this uh, uh, phenomena in the, in, the, in the world, in the world system. So the, this is just the beginning, and the, the structure is created. Now, if we want, we go forward and we feel we change everything, because we are open to change everything. Uh, we want that this become the our community project. So we are we don't have any copyright. We want the copyright to be uh, our secretary copyright. Do you okay. know where the global warming the global change project started? Global change project started. Most people say, oh no, no, it was two thousand years ago. Ego video. What can that for the Islam I have myself seen what it was a video for videos and we had a, a um, Firenze conference in Jordan. We had a special symposium in the honor in the, 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 of Ovid. And it was a two thousand years anniversary of global uh, change. Mm -hmm. So it has been going on and they had it uh, the third the, the beginner of, of uh, that thought in Ovid. So it's it's very very important, but it also we are now faced into a oversimplification. Do you know? And that is of course where it's going. That all this is driving all everything is coming out here. It's just to do this with an enormous amplification. You said the scale. We have to. Have escaped. You said talked about peer-reviewed articles, but what's that? Peer-reviewed doesn't mean that it's good. I am a specialist in sea level, for example. God, all this exaggeration which is coming up. You know that, Tom. You are the next. To, uh, it is terrible. So you cannot use it because it's not ideas. It's just against physics. So you have to discard those things. And so is is this that you have a two point. Seven degrees warming by 2100. But you discard all this. This is what it's about. It's an insult to all of us working in all these boxes. Because that's what the real problem is. Okay, um, I think Tom was the next one. No, you, you. Yes, you were. Yes, yes. Yes. You are, you are, you are asked the question whether we thought this is a good idea to uh, develop this model. And I think this is an excellent idea. And why? It's because I think that science have, has to come forward with some solid platform to argue with the media and to argue with the politicians. And time is short. I'm a Norwegian, I'm not a scientist, I'm an economist. And when I see the abundant spending of money for no purpose, as an economist, I think that is an enormous waste. I, make, I take one example and I take it from Norway. No, Norway is a country with abundant energy, both oil, gas, and hydroelectric uh, power. And the uh, state owns most of the hydroelectric power, and it is a surplus of power in Norway. But they have found out this sort of environmental friendly government that we are going to put up 11 billion NOx, so that's about 1 billion pounds sterling, to build a windmill park to produce electricity, electricity which we have no demand for in Norway. It's going to be exported to Europe at a subsidized price for the Norwegian uh, taxpayer and the electric consumer. 
And in order to export it to the continent, we have to uh, invest another 11 billion kroner or a billion pounds sterling to transport that current, which is in no demand in Norway. And when we ask, why do we do it? We do it because it is part of our contribution to Europe <laughs> to prevent global warming. <laughs> and this is and these decisions are almost now made. And I must ask, time is short here. So if this model could sort of be developed in a way so that we get a quite simplified, this is of course a complete, complicated community, but a simplified platform to convince the opinion and to convince the politicians that CO2 is not a major cause of global warming. Because that is perhaps the only agreement I've seen they have come forward with in this conference, that is that is not a major form mm. of global warming. But there could be other factors which causes global warming, and if that could be for put on a common simple platform in within not too long, I would be very happy. Thank you very much. Oh, I agree with the applause. Uh, that was very well said. Uh, first of all, this is a very complex chart, and yet, in fact, it is an oversimplification of the enormous complexity that we're dealing with. Yeah. I don't want anyone to have any illusions that this covers it all. It doesn't. It is very complex. The focus of CO2 that most people in the IPCC uh, bandy about is, you know, people say, you know, you have a canary in a coal mine and that's giving you the warning. Well, CO2 is one feather on that canary. The rest of this and another dimension further in gives you an idea of the real complexity involved. It's, it's a great start, but by my goodness, it is a tiny start to where we have to end up. And, and I'm, I'm very appreciative that you've put it together. Oh, a quick question, by the way. You said the yellow ones are uh, energy producing? <laughs> no, 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 on the left side, on the left side. On the left side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, A2 and A7 should probably be colored yellow too because we get energy from the hydrocarbons and uh, it would make the chart. This is just one little nitpick, but it's a, it's a great job, but it's only a start. Yes, okay. and in the booklet, or the book, conference book, you have uh, uh, email, email address. address where to communicate. Next was Hans. Uh, I agree with uh, <coughs> what, what, what our <coughs> Norwegian friends said here, but the purpose of this is limited, it's for fighting uh, IPCC or what governments who, who are proposing all this green stuff. Uh, then I want to say that the Swedish government uh, decided two days ago to put more than uh, one billion pounds into green uh, energy and such things. And at the same time, I will uh, tell them that I am buying Norwegian green electricity for the cheapest price I can get in Stockholm. So it's I, I, I pay part of it, I can tell you. <laughs> 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 okay. you, you have done it. One thing more. Um, uh, Peter uh, wants uh, that we isolate the dominating cause of what is causing climate change. And it's separated from IPCC. I agree with that. But that, this is a scientific project and it's not involved directly in this. And it should be done by uh, prominent or good scientists with open minds. I think those who are working here, first of all, it's an, an excellent group from Italy, but they are corresponding with the group of experts which are included in uh, uh, the UN committee. Yeah, this is the, uh, perhaps I was not well understood. We don't want any copyright for this. We want to bring this project here, then, 
if we find here people working with us, not with us, with the committee, okay, with the committee, then we go for work. If not, if, if these are only words, because then uh, we don't, you have to work a lot to, to, uh, to prove this, uh, as, uh, to, to prove this work. And then we need your help. And we thought that inside the committee, or inside this audience, we can find people that will follow, will, will join us. Will join us, not us, the, the, the five persons that start, but join us as a day. I, I see G to me. So pragmatically speaking, I would like to have a, if people is interested, there is an email, or you can email to uh, uh, Nicholas or to me, saying that I am, a, I am, a, I would like to participate. Then we will see if we have enough uh, forces uh, covering the many aspects. We go forward. If not. You go for work. Yeah, you go for work. It depends on the level. I strongly disagree with this approach. Disagree? I disagree. This is a really complicated thing, and even if it's done correctly, and even if it comes out with the right answer, you're not going to win in court when you go against the armies, because they got complicated stuff too, and the judges go side with them almost every time. What we've got to do is we've got to look at all the parameters that do regulate climate and find the one or the few that are the most important and and present something simple that, that shows the most important things and not something complicated that you can't win with even if it's wired right. Okay, you you do that, we do this because it's a different way. We need this project because this is the context. But it's very important that people talk about certain things. Here, for example, your albedo could be could enter here, it should enter here. As the yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is how it's being built up. Yes, I like to make no, a comment. No, it was. Uh, I take it one to two. Okay. I, I just want to make a short comment. Yeah. Because I, I listen to all the sides in this debate. Yep. Yeah. And I try to understand why people believe in uh, dangerous human forces, global warming. And uh, Money. most scientists who believe that, or, and the politicians, they, they cite climate models. Because they think that the, the, the more money and the more resources that are put into these models, the more credible they become. If we try to go around that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is the idea. Take the yellow shirt. Yeah, yeah. My name is Albert Klatzle from the Rural Society of Paraguay. I just have a specific comment to this graph out of this uh, picture. Uh, looking to the box uh, CO2 emissions due to respiration, I do not see um, a box of CO2 assimilation or photosynthesis. So I think we really should consider that both respiration and photosynthesis are in nature in a steady state equilibrium and do not influence CO2 content in the atmosphere unless we um, increase or reduce carbon stocks in ecosystems. Thank you. Oh, that's a huge thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but this itself we discussed this. I think we, we can go here. We, yeah. we can go. I, I will show you later because we discussed this with the product. Of course, everybody knows the photosynthesis. It's not D3 okay, covering it. Friends, uh, could we leave? Yes. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. No, no. Uh, I'm not a scientist, but I'm interested in asking a question. Um, what I'd like to know is the effect of um, the military on this, because there is a lot of nuclear testing, and there is uh, probably uh, going to be uh, an explosion <laughs> uh, sooner or later, a nuclear explosion. It, I mean, I know that I'm um, probably looking forward rather than backwards, but is there any place within this um, context? It's never a problem, because in uh, in the 1970s and early 80s, it was a nuclear winter mm -hmm. discussion. 
and that is very, very strong. And as, as a matter of fact, those who failed there, they became the global warm uh, uh, CO2. Which, yeah, I think that should be included. So we get, uh, you see, as soon as we start to pull it, it comes out simply, <coughs> like Alex said, it's very, very complicated. But that doesn't mean that we should give up. It's just to do something which is certainly better than, uh, hmm. than, than uh, the simplified thing. Can I just make a point? Yeah. I have some sympathy with our Iceman friend behind, in that this could grow like Topsy. Yeah. It may well be that by applying a Pareto approach to individual boxes, we could simplify it without losing the baby in the bathwater. Yeah. So, although I'm not suggesting this because it, it does in the sense of arguments against IPCC, the human contribution to uh, CO2, I would argue, is one that you could throw out because it's negligible in comparison to uh, natural increase in CO2 because of global warming for other reasons. But if you threw that particular one out, you'd also screw the yeah, yeah, yeah. But there are other reasons that you could say, well, in that particular box, it's this and this are the only really important. There's a whole part of others, but actually they're of negligible importance. So I think you can marry the two things together uh, using a Pareto approach. I think that was a wonderful uh, comment that also perfect closing comment, because this is exactly what they want to do. And because of what you are saying, that is why he is standing here, because he and that project needs your help and your input badly. And therefore, we have taken the time to allow it to be presented, and you can give your feelings on it. And but all people, and all of you have things to put into it. And dimension, and all of you doing so will improve it. But these Italians, they are remarkable. You have already <laughs> seen how, this, this is four dimensional in some way they have built it up in, in the computer. Thing. It, it goes all the ways. I, I remember that when you had the, the forensic conference, it's the first theological meeting where everything was computerized. And that's never before and never after has anything worked so well. And the food <laughs> and the wine. I was the organizer. I know. I know. So I think we, it is in very good hands. But this project needs your help. Please, colleagues and friends, help him and use the connection with him. Now we take a break for tea and then we rejoin in a final discussion. Really nice? Now, can you give me a kiss on the cheek? Yeah, well, no, she's mm -hmm. oh, Will you give me a kiss on the cheek? No. A mystical thing. A mystical thing. What is this? Piers, would you like to explain these for the viewers? Your um, diagrams? I will. Um, you recorded this now? This is broadcasting. Oh, all right. Well, when he's taking the picture. Yes, I'll okay. okay. Who are, we, who are we broadcasting to? Uh, I'm Martin Houston. Um, Richie Allen mentioned me. Oh, excellent, excellent. <laughs> You're the one who phoned up. Yes. So that's why I put Climate Challenge hashtag. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I'll retrospectively right. put it all to days. Well, you notice what this one says. Unified theory of climate. Mm. Now that, that is pretty pretentious. Mm. Is it me and my colleagues? It's a pretentious bastard. Pretentious. We're sponsored by... So, you want to know about yeah. Right, I'll stand here and explain. Um, I'm just closing the door. Make sure you get this. Yes. Okay. See, normally, when you talk about El Nino, it's, it's believed or that comes across as it's something happening in the Pacific Ocean 
warm air, war, sorry, warm water flowing across it uh, when it doesn't normally, and that that phenomena has an effect elsewhere. That is not the case at all. There's a worldwide phenomena by, by solar magnetic effects. Now, to understand this, we've got these plots, which are right related to those Lubitska van Loon plots, which that's just a name for people involved. But they divided up data into west and so forth. So we've extended this idea here. So and we're looking in here, we're looking at February. February's in Iceland. Now, any month, any February, is going to have a certain phase of the stratospheric wind, which goes in 28 months, and a certain phase, and a certain phase in 22 years. So, all the points on here. So, you've got your data for a month, you've got your uh, in this case, rainfall, and you've got your geomagnetic activity. Right? So, then you, you're going to have points all over here, which are only Februarys, um, and, and in these particular categories, and they're going to have rainfall and geomagnetic activity numbers with them. So, then you look around in these regions, and you think, so like, is there a correlation between the rainfall and geomagnetic activity? This is what you get just for the data as a whole. In some parts, you have the that's a negative correlation. But when you split the data up into El Nino on and El Nino off, you get very notable correlations. So it shows that the El Nino is somehow connected with the atmosphere uh, to um, geomagnetic activity. And the, if you do that, that's what you see in Iceland. If you do the same thing, in uh, Thess Thessalonica and Greece, you get uh, a much weaker guy. So it means that the El Nino phenomenon is something magnetic, which, well, we know it's magnetic because of the geomagnetic activity, but it comes via polar regions especially, which is why you've got a bigger signal in polar regions. And the same here, where we've got the same correlations, here, that's again in Iceland, and this one is in South West Asia. Separation are really big differences. Right? These are very high T values, just like T is 5, so it's 99.99% confident that these are real correlations. Okay. We've got acres of these, we've got shelves full of these, mm -hmm. we've got shelves full of books of these. So, so the, pop, the uh, solar event precedes the El Nino event, yeah. that's the point. Yeah, so you can now uh, you can actually predict when there's going to be a, an El Nino. Now, the role of the moon. Don't know. It's not in there, but we know from our other work that the moon is very important because we use that to make our own moon's prediction. There's other charts you can draw anyway of various lunar phases against its hell You can do loads of things. You can have three dimensional plots. If you can imagine them, they're So there you are. So, whatever is definitely the case that. The El Nino is a lot more than what goes on in the Pacific, or to be more precise, what happens in the Pacific is one part of a worldwide phenomena driven primarily by solar activity. Yes. You wouldn't think the sun would be capable of that, so so far away, isn't it? <laughs> Do you want to know about the next yes. one? Yes, yes, guys, well, All yes. Right. <laughs> um, this, we're very pleased with it. <laughs> Because we've developed a way of predicting when there's going to be extreme effects from the sun. Mm -hmm. Most active periods, and there was one this month, the first to the fourth of the month. In an half hour period, you expect to get more geomagnetic activity and mm -hmm. things happen on the sun and the sun. And the time here is brilliant. The first starts here, the fourth ends there. And you've got this higher geomagnetic activity consistently through there. You've got a faster solar wind, you've got a warmer solar wind, um, and you had a whole number of tropical storms forming, not just Hermes in, 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 in Florida, but it was typhoons forming. 
and the rate of formation was way ahead of standard more. Uh, you look at the details, there's the peaks of geomagnetic activity, which is the peak activity period. Hmm. Um, this bit near there, that's the fastest rate of fall of pressure as this storm develops. And this is the deepest storm just before it starts, uh, before the forcing push it here. And here, this is another of our rules, that during our fives and our fours, any tropical storm in the northern hemisphere will veer to the right of standard models. And that's happened. It veered so far they even put a special report about it. Because hmm. it meant that New York was not going to be in the danger that they had yes. threatened you. Hmm. So that's that one. Did you 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 yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Well, I can do the current graph. Oh, go on then. Once the Earth has still got some time, when are you going to start again? Yes. Yes. Yes, might as well. These are our hand-drawn pressure maps um, of what we expected or expecting to happen in Europe during this month. So that's what we thought about the first three days. But this time, uh, you notice, you see, it's got got some got warmer quite quickly. Now, yes, like we said, and uh, and dry as well in the southeast of England. So we're very pleased with that map. That is a accurate map and it was drawn up from data originally about uh, late August although it was based on earlier data as well mm. but we're pleased with that map. This one there is a low so we most of us think that's going to come in faster. We'll see what happens. We've got we're expecting quite a bit of blocking the transition. There's certainly a transition from these how that's going to turn out. Wait and see. Mm. Thank you very much. Right, I'll go back to the main conference. Papers by Crowell and Frakes 
they tell us where the tillites are. We, we know the glaciers occurred during 1, 2, 3, and 4. So the green data seems to be a pretty good approximation for temperature. Again, because it's done on every sample and we get a lot of samples, there's a lot of, a lot of information there. The blue curve is based on the sea level. It was initially called the Bay Curve or the Exxon Curve. And they're looking at sediments around the world and they determined what the sea level was. And sure enough, you can see that uh, when there was an increase in temperature, the sea level went up, which is what you'd expect. Uh, during ice ages, it tended to be low, either low relative to it was or whatever, but the sea level changed around there somewhat. Now, what I want to add to this is the carbon dioxide. Now, the first two data sets I showed you are very detailed, very well published, very strong back there. The carbon dioxide comes from modeling, but it, it's a very sincere effort to model the effects of sedimentation. How much CO2 is tied up in limestone? How much of it is out on the beach getting uh, absorbed by the ocean and so on? <coughs> it was done by Robert Berner. He's published about a dozen papers on this. Uh, he's at Yale University or was at Yale University. It's a very sincere effort to try to estimate CO2 going back to 600 million years ago. And <coughs> what we see is that back at the this peak on the left, that's 18 times the CO2 level, pre-industrial CO2 level. So there was a period of warming back there, but there also was a bunch of cooling going on. The next peak at 13 was during Ice Age, and that's 13 times the pre-industrial CO2 level. We're not talking about factor 2 here, factor 13. Similarly, you can see all the way through, CO2 does not fit the geologic data. On my website, whyclimatechanges.com, I have <coughs> pages showing this and many other diagrams of how throughout geologic time, you've got to wave your arms a lot and you still can't get CO2 to really fit the data. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, this I, I, I can't resist from having a comment on this report. Is this the right? The sea level curve. Yeah, the sea level curve. No, million years is the million years, yeah. Yeah. 600 million years, the beginning here of the Paleozoic period, and then the Mesozoic and the Cenozoic. Okay, to the, now, after a day, I get the light in my face, sorry. Yeah. Um, it is open for discussion of anything, or but primarily, of course, to what had been said during the morning. There was, uh, sorry, I was just going to summarize a little so people remember. There have been really quite hard facts with respect to uh, the question of uh, planetary driving of solar variability. Then what the solar variability in luminosity and in solar wind is doing with the Earth, that's another thing. But that it is driving is so strong evidence, uh, no, so strong indications. When it comes to what John Eric did and what uh, uh, Scafetta did, you know, it is impossible to have such a remarkable coincidence if it was not really right planetary. Uh, driving of the forces. So there, I think, you are nearly what you could call evidence of a planetary influence on the solar variability. Let me tell you what is happening inside the Earth. It has been, in, it is in the, in the uh, commentary book, there are several papers on that, and in the other book of mine, you know, by, it is Grand Pierre's paper, and um, it is the uh, uh, neutron repulsion, a little note on, and it is, of course, uh, Giovanni Gregori's idea of tidal. They are there, it's possible, and it's also Scafetta's, uh, uh, that it's really um, for, uh, nuclear for, forcing machinery there. Uh, personally, I think it is, it is not just the pulling and the magnetic things. The most exciting thing is that all these things are let, letting the very center of the very go around inside the Earth, outside, inside the Sun, and outside the Sun. 
those pulses, I think, the largest effect. And why I can say this? Because it's exactly the same thing with the Earth Moon system. Because the very center is 1,700 uh, kilometers down. And when it's turning around, it's like when you are, you are make, making bread in, a, in the kitchen. It's like one point that is going around. And of course, all the atoms are turning around. And they are, they are um, uh, uh, um, quartz. So this is an important function. Then we have this fantastic <coughs> thing by um, Ned Nicolaus showing and we had the synthesis of Roy, and um, what else did we have? Um, yes, uh, um, Roger, you did a very nice beginning there. And then the three last one, the, the thing on, 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 on volcanism, also this on volcanism, and uh, the albedo on the sea, and Jan uh, brings thing that if we cannot talk about global mean, it's really distribution all over the all over the world with somebody came from. Those things we should discuss. Somebody was number one. Yes. <clears throat> Some of us I been, think we uh, repeat the sorry, repeat the some of us have been attending these, or rather organising these sort of sceptical meetings for some time now. I'm just trying to remember, Piers, um, <laughs> when was the first one that uh, you organised? We had the Climate Fools Day in 2008. 2008. And um, Philip Foster has been organising lots of these things too. And I've been organising at the Institute of Physics until, of course, they've sabotaged my meetings and later the, the, the uh, Energy Institute. I think, I think actually the frustration that comes through on this is that I suspect that all of the people here are already more or less sceptical of the IPCC. <laughs> is there anyone that thinks IPCC stuff is great? <laughs> oh, yeah. Don't believe it. <laughs> Benny Pizer, uh, who actually works for the Global Warming Policy Foundation, the Lord of Lawson. I don't think he's actually a sport by the PCC after all. Uh, but we always invite the other side. And um, for unfortunately, they never turn up. Oh, yeah, they have. Or hardly ever. Hardly ever. Hardly ever. And actually, we, we also invite the press, and they hardly ever turn up. And the BBC. Well, actually, the BBC did turn up to Piers' first mm -hmm. one. Uh, Roger Harabin turned up. And how does it in Imperial College? Is that the discussion for this? Well, it's, it, it, it's coming to that. Thank you. We had it in Imperial College, and he sat as far back as he could. In fact, if he sat any further back, he'd have been outside the lecture theatre. He, he listened to it all, only asked one question, it was about ocean acidification, and he's continued to ask that, by the way. And that was that, and he hardly reported. Now, the frustration coming out, I've talked to a number of people in the, in the coffee breaks and so on here, and really what they're saying is, well, how do we get this message out? See, it's already, we convince ourselves and we can look into real mechanisms rather than CO2, uh, junk CO2. But how do we actually reach the public? How do we reach those scientists who are physicists and are not working in climate who accept what they're being told by their colleagues? Because that's the way a lot of science does progress. You know, you, you, build on the shows of others, and you have to accept that data. You, you don't go and recheck the, uh, the, the atomic value values for copper or whatever it is. You, you just take my K and and so on. So how do you get around this problem of getting the massive power? One of the methods we're, we're going to use here is this modeling thing. How, OK, but how are we going to get that message out? If, even if we had the model here now, what would we do next? So that, that's really the question. So what I'm saying is, we, we have all these good things, but behind it, at the end of the day, you need policy changes. Most of us in, in, that are outside science now, and I'm one of those that was a scientist and now outside science, we're interested in policy changes, changing in what people actually do, politicians in particular. How do we persuade them? Um, so apart from talking about these good papers, maybe we should talk about how we, we actually change the Paradigms for politicians. Okay. I have thought we should do that the last. Hello. Uh, I thought we should do that the last.
Okay. Today we are supposed to discuss the scientific part of the previous, but it's okay to discuss. Uh, we, we can't have anything. It's now for, uh, Professor Jefferson. He's sitting there. He had his hand up. And then, had you one, two? I have two, three. Okay. Remind me if I, because it's hard to. Um, Nicholas, um, stop me if, if, if you really follow on the last question. Yeah, do that. I, I mean, I've been involved with the IPCC for, well, since 1991. Um, mostly war groups, two and three, but I've had close dealings with John Houghton when he was chair of working group one, with uh, Berlin, uh, obviously, uh, in the days as well. One of the problems is that too many people who <coughs> were knowledgeable in this area and would like to have enhanced it, did not come forward to make contributions in any of the three working groups. All too often, they were scared off by people who had a fashionable view, then as they have now, and they didn't keep on trying to get in there. Now, I actually came up against a huge opposition from fossil fuel lobbies, particularly the Global Climate Coalition, during the 1990s, when I was Deputy Secretary General of the World Bank, because I tried to stick in the middle. And with member committees in 96 different countries, I regard that my duty, first and foremost, is to find out what's going on right across the board. And they didn't like that. Since then, because I've spent about 16, 17 years chairing the policy committee for the Renewable Energy and World well, Renewable Energy Network and Congresses, they didn't like what I had to say about placing wind energy developments, whether it's being wind speeds and so on and so on. Now, unless people you know, get involved in that, or at least try to get involved in both in terms of the three working groups, in terms of uh, expert reviewers, in terms of editorial reviewers, and that's another very sensitive issue, because if you cause trouble by insisting upon carrying out your remit, you get into further trouble and you don't get to the class again. So it's, it's a very complicated story. It's been going on for the best part of 25 years. If we have a sixth assessment, it may be even more difficult to climb on the bandwagon than it has been in the past. But I'm happy you know, to have a chat off, off the stage, sort of thing, about, about some of these difficulties. But balance and, and inside knowledge, and, and obviously, I mean, in my case, I have to edit a journal called Energy Policy. That's my background, but I have been interested in climate and climate change for over 60 years, so I do have a bit of knowledge about these things. And unfortunately, if you don't get stuck in there because you think it's the opposition has got control of it, then you're already lost. Thank you, Michael. It was really good, and I'm so happy that you are here. We met a year ago, and I really God. That is a wonderful person. He's clever, but he's also respectful. And uh, this is exactly what we that's and he inspired me to say when we come to the general discussion, we have to have respect. Yes. Because if we don't have respect, we don't go forward. And there is another group which certainly doesn't have respect. And I think that takes them down. So it was now I forgot everything. One, two, three. Yeah. One here. Wave a little so he knows who you are. Okay. Thank you. I should like to continue on that theme. I think that is a very good idea for how we can uh, change policy. I've got two further proposals. One is the, um, uh, the road that's been adopted by uh, Benny Visa and uh, Lord Lawson through the Global Warming Policy Foundation, which, if you like, is head on um, with the government, um, because this country, as with most countries, they don't have uh, what could pass as an energy policy that makes any sense. But there's something else we can all do individually, and I'd like to think I'm doing my, uh, my part, is we can get out there and engage everybody we meet in the street, um, in our schools. Our children who go to schools make a proposal. They would like to have a debate at the school, and you stand up and you make a proposal against uh, anthropogenic cl uh, climate change. There are still lots of things we can do individually because I particularly think this latter one is of interest. Young minds are where we have to focus. When you've got uh, tenure and it's based upon the fact that you published a paper 20 years ago saying that climate change is caused by carbon dioxide, you're not very susceptible to 
doesn't change. Whereas if you're in your teens and you're thinking and your mind is evolving, there are lots of things that we can teach you about logical analysis of data, uh, being open-minded, as you've said, Nils, about being respectful for other points of view. And this is part about how we can, each of us, make an individual impact on how this moves forward. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, th I mean, this is a great work we do. Thank you so much. I've done 50 radio shows in the last hundred years, in the last year. And it's very difficult to get on radio, but it turns out to be quite rewarding, and that is something we can do individually. But I will say, we do it individually, as you say. I do what I can do. I can put this show on. And we, we do it, and let all of you give me your fantastic data. And uh, but it's correct, you should do it in all the very But there's so many people here now who get uh, uh, you fuel the, the engines. Thank you. So uh, I'm Benoit Ibu from uh, Paris University. And uh, well, I, I would go back and come back to science. Uh, and uh, for me, well, it was an interesting day, but there was really a momentum. It was uh, the discussion, the short discussion between uh, Roger Tatesel and uh, Peter Ward. Uh, well, Roger said, well, endorsed the point of view of celestial mechanics, and well, you have cycles and, uh, to find out, and well, well, there are also the work of Nicolas Capita, and of course, Fourier analysis, etc. Then uh, we have the geologist, and uh, it's, it's kind of opposite way because we, we cannot, uh, we cannot uh, find out when uh, some volcano will erupt, and uh, well, you said, well, it's not, uh, it's not, uh, it's, there are no cycles. So, uh, and well, there are a kind of opposition, but in, in fact, it's not really an opposition. It's only uh, well, there is one way to, 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 to get a problem, and another one. Maybe they are complementary uh, one each other. And so, I'd say that for for volcanoes, uh, the right way is not the deterministic uh, way of uh, working, but the probability. I don't know the, the data, but uh, I'd say that uh, well, if you consider that you can, that there is a well. Okay. Roughly constant number of eruptions per unit of time, and that uh, when well, there is an eruption, well, any eruption is independent from each other, and you get some kind of a Poisson process, and you can have a probabilistic uh, approach of the point, and maybe, well, I don't know, maybe we could mix uh, Fourier analysis and the probabilistic approach to, well, to reduce uh, 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 well, the Okay, that's a very good comment. And um, of course, they touch upon different <coughs> schools. May I ask uh, schools in, in science? In geology, we of course, observation, like all our science is observation. And of course, we think a little also. But observation, if it, it's in fact, it's lost. Other, like metrology, is by tradition working very much with computers and, and statistics. Analysis is something which is so maybe it's not so strange that we go different ways. But for us, we insist on observation. We had that at the main geological meeting in Oslo in uh, 2008. There was much discussion here, and uh, the Danish Minister said it must be something wrong with your you geologists. You don't believe in climate in global warming. It would it be global warming? We know all these things going up and down, but not that it's driven entirely by uh, CO2. It, it must be something wrong with it. Probably you are dealing with millions of years and doesn't know anything about the resolution. But of course we have resolution. I talk about an earthquake that happened in the autumn of 10,430 years ago, and so on, because we have, have it very much lined up. But it goes to school, different things. So we have to think of that also when we analyze that with some sort of respect. Okay, yes. Um, my name is uh, William Bailey. Yeah. I've got a purely technical question for, uh, specifically for um, uh, Ned Nicolau. He mentions the deviation from the various planets, Venus, yeah. Earth, Moon, Mars, etc. Um, using and oh, yes. describes two, hello? Wait. two you, the use of two parameters, namely the top of atmosphere so, so, uh, so, solarity 
and the uh, pressure. What I don't understand is there's no mention of albedo in this. That um, it gives Earth as being compliance to this, but okay, Carl um, will answer it. Because Ned is not here, Carl will answer it. Thank you. And you're asking, uh, what about the albedo? Yeah. Well, we, uh, you know, albedo is a uh, kind of a non-dimensional number. Yeah. So we thought, well, it might fall out when we did our non-dimensional analysis. The, uh, the only place that albedo actually shows up in our analysis is in the uh, calculation of the no atmosphere temperature <coughs> for each individual uh, planet, or moon. Now here, one of the implications of our work is that albedo is more of a function of the mass of the atmosphere. In other words, it's the, it's the pressure and the mass of the atmosphere that is determining the albedo. So that if it gets too warm, you're going to get more clouds. Yes. If it gets too... <coughs> Okay, nobody can hear. Imagine, visualize a planet exactly the same as the Earth, but with no ocean and no water vapor in the atmosphere. I would have thought the albedo would be much greater, very little will be reflected, and the temperature would be much higher. Parameters for your model would be the same. Is that not true? Yeah, we, we actually have a planet. Uh, it's a moon, it's called Titan. Okay, it's, it's got exactly the same temperature to, um, uh, surface temperature to um, uh, no atmosphere temperature ratio. We call that the atmospheric thermal enhancement. Titan and Earth are exactly the same. If you go to Titan, you will see that Titan has uh, um, methane clouds. So the, the temperature in, in Titan is modulated by methane. It has a different albedo, but it has an albedo it needs at that distance from the sun. If we moved Earth to where Titan was, Earth would have, would no longer have uh, clouds, but Earth would have some other gas that would be modulated uh, by, the, by its atmosphere when it was in there. Does that make sense? Okay, my, no. okay, my friends, we leave that talk for the, you know, together, and then it's uh, Michael Kimber. Haha, uh -huh. no, no, it's Michael Limber. Okay, ladies first. Okay, uh, I have an inquiry about the PRUN system because IPCC, they are the main organizing, the, the, doing the peer reviewing. Most of the people they are from IPCC, they are doing the reviewing, and the editor is also from IPCC. How do we think that our paper and our views will be accepted hmm. by them? And it is taking longer today and lots of us. Wait, wait for Pamela's talk tomorrow. We know and we have that. You need to improve that system, the peer reviewing system, and the more representation. Yes, <coughs> Pamela has a very nice paper on that, and we discuss it tomorrow. Okay. Take over to Michael. But it's, you are right. But you are right. But yes, thank you very much. Um, my name is Michael Lindbergh from Germany. I'm somewhat late, so I missed uh, all of the full day speeches and very uh, interesting. Uh, facts you are showing the public, but I want to come back to your statement in the first one of this uh, little session, how to get our knowledge, our views to the public. Um, first of all, um, I'm a member of IKE, which is uh, in charge of doing justice in Germany for now nine years. And we always admired UK, how far they are progressed in convincing the public about the skeptical view. So I learn now that it's not that good or not that uh, sufficient <laughs> as uh, we thought from overseas, from, from the continent. But the other way around, um, of course, there is no, as we call it in German, King's Way or Königsweg to reach the public. Uh, we do it uh, since now nine years, and we operate the most huge skeptical website, inclusive all, inclusive all the greens and the other websites which uh, deal with energy and climate. But regardless of this, we are not uh, successful enough for what we want to aim. That's the bad news. The good news is um, that in UK, uh, at least I have 
learned uh, that you have a party named UKIP. Um, and they, of course, uh, are very skeptical about climate issues. And uh, in Germany, we have now a new party called, uh, called uh, AFD, Alternative for Germany. Deutschland, Germany. And um, since this party is just three years old now, but uh, it's taken by the other parties very, very seriously because they are competitors for the power in Rio. And uh, the chance was pretty high to enter this party and to convince the people there to follow our skeptical view. And this was the first and I can say uh, only successful way today to reach uh, public attention because in the program of this party we had been able to build in our viewpoint in terms of climate and energy. And this makes the media curious, of course negative, of course uh, uh, reluctant, of course what have you, but it was a very slow way, it was a very hard way, but it became a successful way so far. Um, of course, due to the fact that we have a big migration problem in Germany, the AFD becomes much more attention because they are against this uh, free entrance to Germany like than otherwise. I, I just finished. Than otherwise, but regardless of this, the climate and the energy issue is now maintained in the public mind that the party of the AFD, which will get 15% or so in the next election, is against it. And this was the only way so far to gain public attention. Not always positive, but regardless of this, it is gaining attention that I can ask Thank you to do the same. Thank you very much. And uh, up to this public attention, I mean, we are, I'm most interested in what's going on in science, but you are right. And um, England from Norway just had an economy, this enormous waste of money. I will give you another story also, which is about this threats and disaster. Real thing for humanity. Could I have the first? Hello. Anybody wait there? Lots of Next one. Okay. No, no, no. Back, 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 back. First one. Back again. Back again. Yeah, oh, and the first one. First. First. Okay. Uh, implementation of sustainable development. Here, it's from Gavanoia. Uh, it is you, you and me have from tackling poverty to tackling climate change. This is a very, very big change. And of course, we have from real problems in the world to something imaginary. And then it's time to take the sort of truth, I think. The next one. So if you have earthquakes, it's a terrible thing which is happening with earthquakes and all the people being killed. But of course there is no tendency there in, in here. Next one, we have a severe natural disaster with respect uh, to droughts. droughts. And um, now this is flooding, as a general <coughs> natural disaster. How many of the deaths are being listed? So this is real. And then there are things in cities, an enormous amount of people being killed there. And these are the years. This is real. And we have picture, horrible pictures like that. The Martian earthquake and tsunami. The famous in India this year. Look, this is real. And the uh, nuclear power of the proportion of 11, 10, 86, and has been and this is supposed in four years' time flooding from the gateway. Oh dear. So, next one. Of course, these are natural. These are natural. These are man made. But all this is imaginary. This is not true. This is never happened like that. So, we have to make a distinction.
distinction between natural, manly, imagined. That is something I wrote long ago, but I can, it's useful. So what I think here is they are here, we are faced to them, and it's ins instant to Earth itself not to recognize these fantastic forces which are operating. When you go to Yellowstone National Park and see those things operating, it's mm -hmm. remarkable. And then people say, oh, it's nothing compared to CO2. And putting uh -huh. all the money in CO2. I mean, Distraction. I, I get uh, upset. So there's another way of doing it. Uh, natural, man-made, imagine. All these here, they mm -hmm. are in this side. Those are a combination. Forgot about price, thing, uh, depends upon things. And uh, man-made, all these things we do. <coughs> and we imagine which are up here. No, this was while I was up there. Uh, uh, they are, of course, uh, CO2 driven disaster, sea level change. This doesn't sea level change. And ocean acidification, we heard Martin Hope show. This is just nothing. So, in view of this, I would, of course, like to use the sword of truth. Cut off uh, these things about here. So, these are the real thing in the real world that is something imagined uh, that, that we shouldn't put all the coins there as it was. And this is what they're doing. All the coins being thrown into the... And uh, this is also the issue because Josh yeah. have done this. Have done this. And this agreement and these things, this is a political game. But how could you... How can you have a game when things are like that? You cannot play with it. This is serious matter. And I think that is another thing which we should remember when we are, are discussing these things. I just thrown it out. Yes, we yeah. have. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you have stressed many times that we should treat each, we should treat each other and also the opponents with respect. Yeah. Is it respectful to use a sword to clean up in the IPCC mess? <laughs> <laughs> I would doubt that you would win the ears of the IPCC and their collaborators, I think you will only gain opposition. Yes. And that brings me to the point that if we go out to oppose everybody who thinks differently from what we are thinking, we only will increase the opposition, both in the media and with the politicians. And I thought that if you are going to win media and politicians, I think we have to have some kind of a breakthrough with the scientists defending the IPCC message. And to call that a mess is not very respectful. And I would also have thought that there would be scientists among the IPCC proponents that you maybe could include in the chick model. Maybe you could bring them in and see what, what do you think? We would like to have some, because there you have all elements, also the IPCC arguments. And could we find some, not, not <coughs> the scientists as a, as a whole, but there would be, I'm certain there would be some individuals who could be interested in cooperating in these cheat models, because if we have a head-on competition with governments, we will never come through because who will the government ask for advice? Their own civil servants who work with their scientists, who have the money, the purse to pay for the projects, and that will be, I think, a very difficult and uphill job. So I would once again emphasize your own notion of respect. Yeah. And you, if you are going to be your opponent, you have to respect them. Yeah. 
this was a wonderful uh, uh, comment on uh, please thank you very very much but i may must um, just uh, say something in the foundation of the independent committee on geoethics we said that we should try to to work for the geoethic principles mm. and that's what but when things are being fiddled with and we just see untruth and so then it's time but not until then it's time to take over that so sort of, of truth let them find out themselves yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm. but that's i think the, the background and the thing with the mess it was of course i shouldn't have used it but that was used when we founded uh, but the sword cutting off uh, the imagined word, because this is imagined. We shouldn't spend money on this. And that, have we talked about sea level? They'll never in four years do anything like that. But that is what causing the, the next report, uh, pulling out the money. So that part, I have full control. And it's respectful, because it's respectful for something which is um, higher up. It's this respect to this to truth. And this is not correct. No, and it cannot be. And it's against physics and against everything and observation of that. In four years it will not go up one or two meters. Uh, Hans, you have been waving for a long time. I mean, Hans had a, been yeah. waving. Okay. I was just going to say that uh, my wife, I just want to second with the gentleman, I missed his name. Uh, yeah. uh, two things she tells me. What, what resists persists. So that if I if I push against Peter here and he resists, it continues. Yes. It's only when he gets out of the way. Yeah, we want them to go get out. That's number one. I'm talking about disrespect. Yeah. Number two is is the listening. Until I listen to what my wife's telling me now. Until I listen to what Peter says, he will not be able to listen to me. So in your example, I almost have to listen to the imagined disaster of whoever it is is telling me about that before the person who's telling me about the imagined disaster is able to listen to me. There's two aspects of that. I just want to second what he was saying. Yeah. I took those things because, yes, you have been waving, but Hans have been waving before. Uh, I just took them in order to see the balance of threats. That's what I meant to, to bring into it. Oh. Yes, uh, people are asking for what can we do to get the message out. And um, I want to approach the scientific part first. I think that uh, the solution will come with works that are based on signal processing of different types that we have heard today. Radio, uh, Scafetta, and uh, about uh, your neural networks. And the, what, what will come out, which is my personal prediction, is that it will be possible to couple directly in different way planetary dynamics to a number of climatic factors and solar activity factors. That's a positive view that I see. I can't imagine that it will be more than five years from now until this will happen in a large way. Okay. Secondly, uh, about personal influence, I have indoctrinated my four daughters to buy <laughs> the biggest suits they can afford if they want without having a bad conscience. And about the third is that in Norway there is an organization uh, with uh, trying to get closer. And I would like uh, uh, to, to ask Jan Erik Solheim if he can uh, tell something about how it works. It works much better in Norway than I see. <coughs> oh, okay, I think it's a very good comment to this is from Piers, which have been moving his hand, but he has also started. <laughs> oh, oh, probably. Right. Uh, you always think I've been going to talk about the globe that you're asking to bring up. But it looks good, doesn't it? It looks very good. So let's see. Um, right. Uh, uh, my mind. You can come up on the podium. Please, come up. Oh, what is it? Oh, what is it? No, no, no. We want to see you.
climate change. It's the main way in which you can describe climate change. So, yeah, yeah. And the point about some of these very cold things in history are that they, the, there was generally very cold, yes, but a lot of these things like the Nile freezing over were probably just great surges of very cold air going south. It didn't mean that the whole of the northern hemisphere was super cold. Anyway, that is a picture of our jet model. <laughs> the thing is that in the picture which I showed of his work, it was uh, so that this is means if this operates, CO2 is a product of it. It's not yeah. CO2. Yes, and that is very, very essential. And now comes the thing. This Wait, service is just control the amount of CO2. But right. this man is doing this weather prediction. And without CO2, CO2 is out. The meteorologic office, which is sealed in, That's they make their predictions and they run out in five days. He makes it in 45 days. Isn't that a message? Isn't that, isn't that the message he didn't know? Why could he have success if he's doing everything wrong? It might be, is it more plausible that he's doing it right and the meteorological office is doing it wrong? Could and it's <coughs> only the way you see this product with the jet stream, if I should show you the diagram which was his, that step by step by step, and an effect of that is CO2. Yeah. And it's not CO2 which drives this one. Correct. So this one driving CO2, not CO2. And that's very, very important. And I think that that's what is good that you came and had this show because it's really tied to what we have been speaking of the whole morning. Okay. Thank Any you. more? Yes, two down there. Hello. Immediately you have to run. It can be the Olympics next time. <laughs> After all this exercise. So I, I think it's worth considering a little uh, <coughs> bit of reality into our discussion. The reality is that all governments around the world are completely agreed with the mainstream yeah. idea, yeah. with the mainstream yes, theory. Yes, yes, when you say reality, <coughs> A practical reality, it's no, not scientific reality. No, no, I'm, I'm talking about I was just political reality. I, I was just political. Political. So, in, there are two issues I think we have to be aware of. One is the scientific issue and the status of the scientific uh, debate, and one is the political issue. And, and um, there is some overlap. It needs to be separate. On the scientific issue, uh, my own reading of the situation is that essentially we have to look at the history of science and how science evolves over time. We are at a, the reason why the CO2 theory is dominant uh, globally is that for the last 50, 60 years, uh, temperatures have gone up and the majority of scientists are convinced the only valid explanation for this warming is CO2 because solar activity um, can change over time but has no significant impact on this warming trend over the last 50, 60. That's the conventional IPCC consensus. And um, I made the point before, unless this warming trend comes to a hold, as we have seen uh, in most of the 21st century, or uh, goes down, the, the dominant paradigm will not shift. It will not shift. So, the, from a purely scientific perspective, the only cracks in the edifice would happen, and ha happened actually when the pause um, lasted that long as it did. We saw for the first time a growing, um, uh, a growing nervousness uh, a 
among scientists trying to explain what that unexpected cause, what caused that. But unless we see a return to a pause or some cooling, unless we see that and the warming continues, well, even if it is minor, even if it is minimal as it has been, uh, the, the paradigm will um, prevail and no critic will be uh, listened to. Critics will only be listened to when there is something to explain, something unexpected, something that isn't predicted and it goes against the conventional wisdom. So, the point I would make is, unfortunately, this might take 10 to 20 years before we can see in which direction uh, temperatures are going to evolve. As I said, if after this big El Nino temperatures are not stabilizing, if they continue to rise, even if it's minimal, the paradigm will not shift. That's the science. And uh, we should be under no illusion. No one is going to listen to anyone unless the temperatures stop rising. The second... Hmm. Well, they, they didn't... I'm sorry, but I'm, I, I mean, I'm not an idiot. Uh, and no, and no, no, it's the public. Of course they have to stop rising. They have risen. Of course we know, or we think we know, primarily because we had a very strong El Nino, but they, the, the, the public and the mainstream scientists used the El Nino to claim that the pause is over and that the warming has started again. And so the point is, we have to see what happens in the next 18 to 24 months. If the warming, if the, if the pause continues, which is, it is, in my view, possible, we are back to square one, where we were uh, over the last 15, 16 years. But if the warming continues, the dominant paradigm will not be pushed out of the way. Let's be under no illusion. Secondly, politically, politically, and personally, I think it's perhaps even more likely that this thing will disintegrate politically. Most governments are already beginning to roll back some of the policies because they are very expensive, they're very unpopular, and in, in many ways they're not even achievable. If you think about this nonsense about uh, CCS, yeah. which is built into all climate policies that we eventually only have power plants with, with carbon capture and storage. The political and economic issue, we only, over the last 20 years, have, uh, the, the, the governments were quite happy with this whole agenda because there were low-hanging fruits. So you could shift a little bit away from coal, you could go for gas, you could do a lot of uh, efficiency gains and pretend that you've already begun to solve this. Now everything is becoming much, much more expensive, much more difficult. You see already here in, this, in Germany they've just uh, published their new climate plan where they took out almost all targets. They've all been removed so they can say, ah, oh, we're doing this and that, but there are no more big targets in there, no numbers. The same here, the government is beginning to realize that the targets that are legally binding are almost impossible to achieve. So there's this political angle. My view is the, the big debates unless we see something very serious on the, on, the, on the temperatures, will be more in the political arena than in the scientific arena, at least for the short term. Okay, thank you very much. It, it was a good thing. But of course, as you said, it's a political side, and it's, this is a scientific. Here today we have presented the scientific thing. We have had many steps forward. I mean, the El Nino, theory here. It's the first time we have a solid idea but with predictability and it seems to work very, very well. We have this greenhouse uh, in the planetary system by, by Ned and Bob. <coughs> very exciting uh, stuff. We have all the things in the planetary solar interaction which now with, from the theorists it seems very, very solid. If we have the idea or with um, Hobla that um, indeed the PhD is not a problem uh, in the oceans. And it's completely remarkable that the most 
favorable place for, for biota and corals is right in the middle of, of, of the pockmarks where methane um, uh, is uh, steaming up. These things we have to, and I agree, but we, we all, and most of us believe that in solar very bit, that we are going into a long new solar uh, minimum. If, we, if this is done, of course we have, we will win. But as I said in an interview, we, have, we now prepare everything for warming. And if it's going cooling, I mean, it's like uh, it's winter time and you throw off your coats. And there, when it gets cold, you stay absolutely naked. And so, so, you know, it has to do with the preparation. And our voice will never stop. But I agree completely with, with all the problems. Yes. But that's, that's okay. But that's the two things. Next one. No, well, that's just a big back on that is science, political science analysis. I don't hear it. It's to piggyback on Bene's political science analysis. Yeah. How about the non-signatories, the non-ratifiers of the Paris Agreement? That's India, that's Philippines, that's <laughs> the Visegrad group. <laughs> will they, will they ratify? <laughs> Tomorrow we will discuss the, the idea, the project which is going to have a, Roger will say something about Clexit. That means like Brexit, you have Clexit, the climate exit from this. Uh, that's another thing. Yes. I, I just wanted to mention something. I, I agree uh, with, with a colleague here that the uh, political situation depends a lot on uh, how nature behaves in the future. And I, I think we're headed towards cooling. It'll take a few decades before it shows up. But we have seen that they are trying to manipulate the data already. And to the point of the congressional investigation of some of the NOAA's action right now in the US that has been taken by, uh, on by one of the Republican uh, senators. So, uh, but as a scientist, I think this whole confusion uh, started basically with science. It was the science that started gave the fuel, so to speak, to the politicians. So if, if the science fire, so to speak, subsides, the politicians will be hanging in the air and you could not support us anymore. So I think it's equally important to understand, and we have to focus on that as well, that we now have an alternative uh, theory, a full-blown alternative theory about what is causing the climate change and it's all having a natural, uh, natural effect. So if this is getting more into the mainstream, uh, through the media, or especially through young scientists, you know, that are getting into the game, and uh, they don't have the baggage of the, you know, older folks, basically, and, and they're more open-minded by, by nature. Uh, if the, the science part slowly erodes of that, then the whole thing, the house of cards will, will collapse. So the science is very important. If the science is not, uh, we don't have an alternative explanation of what's going on, the answer for the mainstream will be also always, well, uh, what's the alternative theory? Well, we don't have, well, we have computer models. What, what do you have? You have nothing, right? And the, the conversation ends right there. Well, not anymore. We have an alternative now that is science-based, based on real observation. That's what the whole focus has to be, on real observation, not on theory coming out of, you know, of, of just thinking. This is a real data, a relationship based on observations, and that's actually it's a real strength. We have to not forget that. Well, that's sorry. very, very well said. Very well said. <laughs> we are now five minutes after closing time. Anything which have anything urgent, or should we close it off? I'd like to say one thing related to that. One of the key reasons for doing science yeah. is to help illuminate public policy. And we all believe we'd like our public leaders to take the best information available to solve the problems they have to solve. If it turns out that we spend $10 trillion on greenhouse gases and we don't solve the problem, that's going to be one of the biggest crises for science ever. Yes. Yes. And it was going to be created, it's created by science. So science is on the chopping block right now. And I think we 
we really got to begin to worry about what's going on there and what could happen. And one of the biggest problems that the IPCC did in building the census was to stop the bait. And it wasn't intentional, but it's what's happened. It was intentional. Thank you very much, first of all. It was very nice. I'd say was a, that was why, why we had the independent committee on geoethics, because it was a geoethical part in order to take care of science in, as it is. But it was intentional. It started by Bonin and our Prime Minister Palmer. And Palmer was a very clever guy. And he, and he uh, imposed on Brunland. Brun yeah, but it was organized before. And uh, then they said it shouldn't be a scientific debate. We have to come out above it. And that was the intergovernmental panel. So it really started all wrongly. And it started off in the 60s. <coughs> Eddie and I was in a room when they talked about um, global, um, uh, global change movements. And it should not be. We said, why don't we have the sun? And they said, it's a project for, for the atmosphere and the ocean. If anything is left over, the baby is Thank you for this day. Hope it has been good. Have a nice day. That is the end of today's coverage. I will be back tomorrow. So tell everyone that needs to know about this.